The Nine Lives of Ski Mask Life One Death Room Chapter One Ski Mask The loud crack of a shot glass slamming against the bar startles the bartender. He turns to see Grady Saunders, a heavily muscled man in his early thirties, glaring at him. Give me another one. The bartender picks up a bottle of Maker's Mark bourbon and pours Grady another shot. The bluish hue from the TV screen reflects off of Grady's bald head as he swallows down the shot and wipes the excess bourbon off his chin-strap beard. He slams the shot glass on the bar again. Another. The bartender gazes down at the empty shot glass and takes a moment to contemplate whether to pour another drink for the obviously inebriated man. Grady taps the shot glass on the bar, indicating that the bartender is taking too long to pour. Reluctantly, the bartender fills another shot, which Grady immediately wolfs down. He bangs the shot glass on the bar again. Another! The bartender takes notice of the serpent tattoo that winds from Grady's wrist to his bodybuilder bicep. He doesn't want to mess with this guy, but he needs to cut him off. If he thought one more shot would appease him, he'd oblige, but he knows Grady's type. This isn't going to end well. The bartender clears his throat before speaking. <clears> throat> uh, don't you think you've had enough, buddy? Grady stares at the bartender with sinister intent moves his face closer, and hisses. I'm going to pretend like I didn't hear that. Now pour me another. The bartender looks around the crowded bar for one of the bouncers. He makes eye contact with the doorman, a portly man in his 20s, and gives him a nod. The thick bouncer quickly makes his way through the throng of people to the bar. Grady looks him up and down. You want something, Slim? The bartender speaks up. I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to leave. Grady doesn't take his eyes off the bouncer as he speaks. And I'm afraid I'm going to have to take this bouncer's head off and shove it up his ass. By now, two other bouncers have noticed the confrontation and strategically flank Grady. He detects this and smirks. Three on one. I still like my odds. With three bouncers surrounding Grady, the bartender speaks more confidently. Listen, buddy. You either leave right now, or I'm just going to call the cops. Grady redirects his glare to the bartender, who swallows nervously, quickly dials a number on his cell phone, and puts it to his ear. Hello, police. This is the Tap Room Tavern. We might have a situation here. Grady smiles and then steps closer to the bartender. His tone is convincing. I'll see you again. Soon. Grady turns and makes a point to bump his shoulder into the nearest bouncer as he walks to the exit door and departs. He is greeted by a cool blast of air as the tavern door shuts behind him. He scans the quiet street and sees that the area is void of people at the moment, with the exception of a hooker in a blonde wig standing further down the block under a street light. He takes a pack of cigarettes out of his back pocket, flips a cigarette into his mouth, and attempts to light it, but another gust of wind makes the task difficult. Frustrated, he looks around for an area that may shield the wind and notices a small alleyway. He approaches the alley and peers down it. It's a short alley, about 50 feet, that empties into a brightly lit parking lot. It's relatively barren, save for two small dumpsters. Grady ducks into the alleyway for a blockade against the wind, successfully lights his cigarette, and looks up as he exhales. He's surprised to see a figure standing at the other end of the alley. The bright light behind the man makes details difficult to decipher. He squints, trying to gain a better perspective of the mystery silhouette, and takes another drag off his cigarette. The figure offers no movement. It stands silently. Could there be something behind him that may have the figure's attention? Grady looks back. Nothing. He focuses on the figure and addresses it. You got a problem? The figure doesn't respond. 
You're about to if you don't shove off. The figure doesn't budge. Okay, asshole. He flicks his cigarette to the ground. Shall we dance? Grady takes five aggressive steps toward the figure and then stops in his tracks. The figure has finally moved, but not in the way Grady was expecting. As Grady motored forward, so did the figure, completely mirroring Grady's movement. And now, as Grady stands still, so does the figure. Grady takes in a breath. For the first time tonight, he feels a sense of uneasiness. He takes two slow steps toward the figure. The figure continues to mirror him, taking two steps forward as well. I'll give you one last chance. Turn around and get the hell out of here or I'm going to stomp your ass into the ground. The figure responds by advancing towards Grady at a deliberate pace. The figure moves through a splash of moonlight, finally allowing Grady to catch a glimpse of his adversary. It's a tall, broad-shouldered man wearing dark pants, a long blue-gray shirt, and a black ski mask. It's the glint of the eyes that give Grady the most pause. There's a ferocity behind them that he's never seen before. For a fleeting second, Grady considers the option to turn and run, but pride gets the better of him and he decides to rush the ski-masked figure. He lets out a battle cry and swings forcefully once he reaches his foe. Ski Mask easily dodges the wild blow, reaches down, takes a firm hold of Grady's genitalia, and squeezes. Grady lets out a high-pitched howl that he didn't realize was within him. Ski Mask kicks the back of Grady's leg, dropping him to his knees while switching his grip to an arm bar. Ski Mask twists Grady's arm even more than necessary, causing Grady's pitch to reach a level that would make Pavarotti proud. I heard you were a tough guy. Ski Mask twists Grady's arm even more, transforming his scream into a helpless cry. Oh, please no. Please no? That doesn't sound like something a tough guy would say. Ski Mask twists more and the bones in Grady's arm teeter on the edge of cracking. Oh, oh no, please stop, please. What's your ex-wife's name? My ex-wife? Ski Mask twists Grady's arm to the absolute maximum he can without it breaking. Ah! If you answer one more of my questions with a question, I'll snap your arm. Now I'll ask you again. What's your ex-wife's name? <clears throat> Tina! Tina! Well, we have us a winner. That's right. Is it true that you like to beat up Tina? Don't lie to me. Grady answers quickly. Yes, 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 sometimes I do, yes. Grady sobs as Ski Mask talks. You're never going to hit her again. As a matter of fact, you're never going to see her again. I hear Mexico is nice this time of the year. You're going to move there. You're going to stay there. If Tina ever sees you again, she'll tell me. And I'll find you. Am I clear? Yes. Yes, Mexico. I I'll, I'll go to Mexico. I, I promise. I'll leave tonight. I, I, I swear. Ski Mask pulls a pair of pruners out of his pocket and places Grady's little finger between the razor-sharp blades. You're damn right you will. And this is just a little something to make sure you never forget who's waiting for you if you come back. Ski Mask squeezes the pruner handles. Grady's finger drops to the cold alley ground and rolls within his vision. Oh, my finger! Oh, God, no! Ski Mask lets go of Grady's arm and kicks him to the ground. It's just a pinky. If I weren't such a nice guy, it would have been your thumb. Hell, I think I deserve a thank you! The sobbing Grady doesn't hesitate. <laughs> thank you! Thank you! Grady lies on his stomach and blubbers like a baby. Ski Mask looks down at him in disgust and utters one parting word before exiting the alley. Pussy. Chapter 2 The Dog Ski Mask casually tosses his mask back and forth from hand to hand as he enters the large, time-worn brick building in the historic district of Paducah, Kentucky. A sharp ray of light emanates from a slightly ajar door at the end of the tiled hallway. 
Jones P.I. is stenciled plainly on the center of the door. Ski Mask pushes it open, exposing himself to the scent of hot, spiced beef. Tamale Jones, a mildly plump man in his fifties, with a pencil mustache and wearing a light gray fedora, looks up from his desk. He is holding a fork and appears to have just begun eating the steaming tamale sitting on the plate in front of him. This is a very common sight upon entering the office of Tamale Jones. Is it done? Ski Mask nods. Where's he shipping off to? Mexico. Tamale snickers as he sets his fork down, picks up a cordless phone from his desk, and dials a number. Mrs. Saunders? Yeah, your ex-husband's never gonna fuss with you again. As a matter of fact, you can bet the rent that you'll never see or hear from that sorry sap ever again. Yeah, you're mighty welcome. Enjoy your life. He hangs up the phone, reaches into his desk, and pulls out a manila envelope full of cash. He tosses it onto the edge of his desk. Ski Mask walks to the desk and picks it up. Rather than look inside, he just holds the empty envelope long enough to monitor the weight. Once deeming the weight acceptable, he turns and exits the room, closing the door behind him. Tamale eyes the closed door for a moment and faintly shakes his head. That is one creepy fella. Ski Mask steps out of the building back into the crisp air of the night. He begins to walk down the sidewalk, but something in the middle of the street catches his eye. A dog. A small, tan, short-haired dachshund. The dog is standing in the middle of the one-way street with his back to traffic. He watches the dog, expecting him to hurry off of the road, but instead the dog sits down and gets comfortable. Ski Mask's head spins in the direction of a revving engine and sees the bouncing headlights of a car moving way too fast for this road, heading straight for the little dog. Ski Mask looks back at the dachshund and whistles sharply. The little dog turns his head, looks at Ski Mask, and begins wagging his tail. Come here, boy! Ski Mask bends down, hoping a less intimidating stance will entice the dog to scurry his way. Instead, the dog simply wags his tail faster. Come on, boy, come here! The dog's thin tail beats faster against the blacktop, and he pants, making him seem even happier, completely oblivious to the metal death machine roaring his way. Ski Mask jets his head in the direction of the rapidly approaching car. He can smell its exhaust as he looks back at the poor, helpless dog that is now illuminated by the headlights of the vehicle. The headlights continue to brighten on the dog as the car thunders toward him. Get out of there, dog! Get! The dog's happy trance on Ski Mask is finally broken by the mechanical rumble of annihilation upon him. He turns his long, thin snout toward his appending doom and is frozen by fear as the car races forward. His worried eyes widen as the lights illuminate everything and the death machine finally reaches him. No! Ski Mask bolts into the road just as the car arrives, causing the dachshund to flee out of harm's way. The tires screech, but the car doesn't slow in time to keep Ski Mask from absorbing the full impact. He flies onto the hood, smashes the windshield, and then thuds onto the hard asphalt. Ski Mask can smell the lingering stench of burnt rubber in the air. He slowly opens his eyes to be greeted by the sniffing snout of the dachshund, who graduates from sniffing Ski Mask to licking him. Ski Mask can hear a car door shut and someone saying shit over and over again. The voice gets closer until he sees the long face of a man in his mid-fifties with wild hair. This has to be the asshole who hit me. Oh, how Ski Mask would love to gut this bastard like a fish. But he can't move and things are getting foggy, dark. He feels a sense of drifting away as his vision fades to black. Chapter Three, Death Room. Pitch black. Ski Mask doesn't know where he is, but he's somewhere. He looks to his left, nothing. He looks to his right. He can see a tiny square of light that is gradually increasing in size. 
As the square grows, the light brightens, and Ski Mask can finally make out his surroundings. He's in a room. A cold, desolate room with smooth, plain walls lined with metal rails. Cool air emanates from the stainless steel-looking floor. The ceiling is black, almost as if there is no ceiling at all, but rather never-ending darkness. As the light to his right increases, he can make out that he is lying on a gurney. He tries to sit up but is unable to. He feels strapped down, but can see no restraints. The development of the light square intensifies until the end of the hallway to his right has become the light itself. There's something soothing about the light. It seems as if it's beckoning to him. He becomes draped with the sense that all will be right when he submits to the light. Ski Mask is startled by a rumble beneath him. He looks down to see the floor slanting toward the light. He looks to his left to see the floor rising. It's as if he's in the middle of a giant teeter-totter. The wheels on the gurney begin to squeak as the floor tilts more and the gurney slowly rolls toward the light. Ski Mask fights the tempting urge of the light and reaches out, finally grabbing the rail on the wall, momentarily halting the gurney. But the tipping of the floor intensifies. Ski Mask's hand starts to slide and he grips tighter, holding himself in place as the floor continues to slope steeper. He reaches out with his other hand and locks onto the rail like a vice as the gurney slides out from under him and rapidly disappears into the light. The floor is now a giant metal slide. Ski Mask tries with all of his might to hang on, but his grasp loosens and he starts to slide down the rail. He clamps down firmer to slow his slide, but it is increasingly difficult to hold on. His hands are becoming numb and he can no longer determine how tight he is clinging to the rail. His grip is faltering and he has merely one or two seconds before his hands give out, causing him to drop and be engulfed by the light. Without warning, the floor levels out and all is silent. Ski Mask lets go of the rail and falls back onto the cold steel floor, exhausted. He gasps several times before his breathing finally normalizes. He feels beads of sweat dripping down his face. His instinct is to wipe them away, but he has no strength. Ski Mask takes slow, deep breaths and looks up into the darkness before his tired eyelids close, and he drifts off. Chapter 4 The Monster Ski Mask is a monster. Make no mistake about it. That is exactly what he is. A ravenous beast with a voracious appetite for killing. He is what nightmares are made of. Psychologists would be dumbfounded if they ever got Ski Mask onto their couch. A prolific slayer that doesn't fit the typical profile one would expect when dealing with a serial killer. There is a list of traits that many serial killers have in common. Psychological and or sexual abuse as children. Bedwetting past the age of 12. Family history of mental disorders. Solitary behavior. Cruelty to animals. Arson. Sexual deviance. Substance abuse, voyeurism. None of these apply to Ski Mask. Psychological and or sexual abuse as children. As children, many serial killers are humiliated, neglected, physically harmed, and emotionally scarred. This abuse often leads to an inability to be academically successful, form healthy relationships with others, or to function normally in society. Ski Mask's mother and father were good people. He was an only child that they raised with love and care. Not too strict, not too lenient, very fair. 
He was intelligently astute from a young age. He picked up everything fast, including problem-solving abilities, cognitive skills, creativity, and social and emotional growth. Toilet training as well, thus bedwetting was never an issue. All the basics would be checked off as exceptional at best and normal at worst. Academically, he excelled, finding all of his subjects to be relatively easy for him. He loved his parents and had the utmost respect for them. His father was a well-respected butcher. His mother was a speech therapist. Neither had any clue that their son was a serial killer, and he went to lengths to be sure they never knew. They were two of the very few people in his life he ever truly cared about, and he certainly did not want to disappoint them. They were taken from him in a car accident when Ski Mask was still a young man in his early 20s. Psychologists would pinpoint that incident in Ski Mask's life as the beginning of his murderous tendencies, had that been when his killing spree began. But alas, he was nearing a decade into his hobby by that point. Family History of Mental Disorders It's not uncommon for serial killers' families to have a history of mental illness and criminal behavior. None of Ski Mask's relatives had any such history. He comes from a lineage of hard-working and respected people. Growing up isolated. Many serial killers have no meaningful relationships as they grow up and often end up as loners with no close friends. Many were frequently bullied and labeled as outcasts as children. Growing up, Ski Mask functioned normally in society. During his school days, he had friends, girlfriends, played sports, and attended school-related social gatherings. All of the things one would expect out of a normal young man. It is true that as he grew older and became more experienced at his hobby, Ski Mask did become more of a loner, but not for the reasons that would be typical of a serial killer. For one thing, it became necessary to shut others out for legality reasons, Killing is illegal, after all, and part of the thrill for Ski Mask is getting away with it. The less people he interacts with, the less likely anyone would suspect him of wrongdoing. But more so, the need for others was no longer necessary. Killing became his friend. Back in school, having friends helped to break the monotony of the prison-like regime. Once he discovered his love for killing, he didn't need them anymore and gradually discarded them. As he aged and spent more of his time killing, he increasingly grew to dislike and even be disgusted by people in general, viewing most of them as sheep that blindly conform to what is expected of them. To Ski Mask, most are mere pawns within the game he plays. Cruelty to Animals Most serial killers have a cruelty to animals phase. Nothing could be farther from the truth regarding Ski Mask. Quite the contrary, as he cared deeply for all of the pets his family ever had. Arson Arson sometimes gives serial killers a satisfying sense of control. This is something that has never even crossed Ski Mask's mind. Sexual deviance and or sexual inadequacies. These are often primary motives for serial killing. This is a factor that has absolutely nothing to do with Ski Mask's interest. Before killing consumed his life, he had girlfriends and got laid. Like most adolescent boys, he was curious, experimented, but never viewed it as anything more than a little fun. Ski Mask sometimes uses a sexual angle with women to make them feel uncomfortable or to get a reaction out of them, but it has nothing to do with sexual desire. That's more about power and control. Substance Abuse Numerous serial killers have an extensive history of substance abuse. Many are under the influence when they commit their acts. Ski Mask has never taken any drugs or had a drop of alcohol in his entire life. Voyeurism some serial killers partake in voyeurism for a sense of control and a way of exerting power over unsuspecting victims. Ski Mask would consider that pitiful. 
Why obsess over someone else's life when you have control over your own? It simply doesn't compute. It's also a test of his patience. The best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. Adaption is a necessity. And there's an entire after-kill process. Schemask wasn't aware that the exposure to his father's profession would come so in handy for him later in life. And of course, there's the adrenaline rush that comes from the excitement, power, fulfillment, and discipline, all culminating into that final satisfaction of conquest. It's not just the thrill of the kill, it's the thrill of the hunt. Ski Mask is a monster. Chapter 5 Awakening Ski Mask's eyes open. The hallway seems brighter. He turns his head to the right to see the intense wall of light calling to him. He turns his head to the left and sees a change. Darkness has been replaced by two lit ovals. They're different than the all-encompassing wall of light, though. They're not as bright, and there appears to be something beyond them. Some kind of movement. These are windows. A man in a white doctor's jacket is moving around a room. It's a laboratory of some kind. Ski masks can make out steel gurneys, counters with test tubes, beakers, microscopes, multiple computers, and glass cabinets filled with various medical supplies. These are my eyes! The man finally stops moving and turns toward the eye windows. It's him! It's that son of a bitch who hit me with his car! Suddenly, Ski Mask feels like he is being swept up in a tidal wave and flies completely out of control toward the eye windows. Darkness. Ski Mask gently opens his eyes. He is inside the laboratory now. The long-faced man is standing in front of him, staring at him. He moves in closer and tilts his head slightly to the right and then to the left as he looks more intently at Ski Mask. The long-faced man takes an ophthalmoscope out of his jacket pocket and holds it up to Ski Mask's eyes. After looking at each eye for several seconds, he steps back and looks past Ski Mask. Okay, he's here. Not all the way back yet, but he's here. The long-faced man gives Ski Mask one long last look before walking to a nearby gurney. Sitting on the gurney is the dachshund. He is staring directly at Ski Mask and wagging his thin tail. He stands up on the table and gives a playful bark. Ski Mask can see another man enter his frame of vision. He's roughly the same height as the long-faced man, but much older, late 70s, maybe early 80s. He's thin, bald, and wears wire-framed spectacles. Run the process on Subject M again. The long-faced man fills a syringe from a medicine bottle and walks over to the dachshund. The friendly dog continues to stare at Ski Mask and wag his tail. He never even whimpers as the long-faced man injects him. Very quickly, the dog's tail slows down and stops. His eyes close and he slumps over. Ski Mask's temper begins to rise. He tries to leap forward, but he can't move. His breathing quickens, and he can now feel his chest rising as it fills with oxygen. The long-faced man holds a stethoscope to the dog's chest. He listens in multiple areas and then looks up at the old man. He's gone. Bring him back. The long-faced man takes a small device out of his pocket. It looks similar to a flash drive. He presses a button on the device which illuminates the tip in a red glow. The old man softly speaks into a slim digital recorder. This will be the fifth renewal of Subject M. The long-faced man holds the glowing tip to the base of the dog's skull. Within seconds, that thin, hard tail begins wagging, and the dog rises up. He immediately looks at Ski Mask and lets out a playful yip. Kill him again! Ski Mask can feel his skin burning with fury. 
A tingling begins in his fingertips, followed by a powerful shock shooting through his entire body. The long-faced man fills the syringe with fluid again and steps over to the dog. Schemas tries to spring forward. This time he can feel himself move slightly and then abruptly stop, accompanied by a loud metallic rattle. He looks at his wrist to see that he is being restrained by thick leather straps. He notices that he is fastened to a large metal table that has been rotated into an upright position. Whoever tied his straps didn't know what they were doing and left a lot of slack allowing Ski Mask to muster a good amount of force as he vigorously thrusts both of his hands forward in rapid repetition. A thunderous rattle of metal noticeably startles both men. Holy shit! Ski Mask can feel the restraint on his right wrist starting to give way. He consolidates all of his energy into one last powerful yank, which successfully breaks the restraint. Oh my god, he's loose! The men duck for cover as Ski Mask uses his free hand to swiftly undo the remaining restraint. The room begins to echo with the yipping of the dachshund who seems to be cheering Ski Mask on. Ski Mask turns toward the long-faced man who stumbles backwards in a panic, sending several test tubes crashing onto the floor. Before Ski Mask can take a step forward, he feels a crash against his head. He turns to see the wide-eyed old man holding a thin metal tray. Ski Mask stares coldly at the terrified old man whose breathing has become short and rapid. Clearly the old man thought the tray would do more damage, but it did accomplish one thing. Time for the long-faced man to pull out a gun. Freeze! Ski Mask turns to see the long-faced man pointing a revolver at him. Don't move or I'll shoot! Ski Mask glares at the long-faced man with a burning rage. Please, we, we don't want to kill you again. The old man shoots a glance at the long-faced man as if he shouldn't have said that. Ski Mask ponders the statement for a few seconds before speaking. Consider this your lucky day. Instead of decorating this room with your intestines, I'm just gonna leave. Ski Mask begins to turn and then stops. Oh, and I'm taking this dog with me. He picks up the dachshund and turns for the door. Uh, no! Uh, uh, freeze! Stop! Ski Mask turns around slowly and glares at the long-faced man. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm truly sorry, but we, we, we can't just let you go. If you want to shoot, go right ahead. But you better hit the mark or else I'm going to come over there and show you what pain really is. The old man steps forward. Let him go. The long-faced man looks perplexed. But we can't. I said let him go. Sweat drips down the long-faced man's brow as he takes in a deep, choppy breath and lowers the gun. Ski Mask gives them both one last scowl, turns, and exits the building. Chapter 6 In Aeternum What just happened? Ski Mask walks to the quiet road in front of him, and then turns to see exactly where he was. It's an old two-story brick house. The first floor windows are boarded up, but rays of light penetrate the imperfections in the wood. The second floor's windows appear to be intact, but reveal only blackness behind them. We don't want to kill you again. Is that what he said? Again? What the hell did that mean? He feels the whip tail of the dachshund slapping against his body. He looks down at the short-haired, weasel-bodied dog that he is holding and is greeted by cheerful eyes and an excited whimper. Hang on, I'm gonna get us out of here. He looks around the bleak area. There are a few similar old homes scattered on the road. Most have an appearance of disrepair. All look abandoned. Based on the surrounding chatter, crickets and other night insects are making the most of the structures. He walks closer to the street corner to look at the intersection's street signs. The good news is, he recognizes the street names. The bad news is, he's about 20 miles from where his truck is parked. Ski Mask makes a mental note of the location. The entire situation needs revisiting. But first, 
He has to get his bearings. He pulls out his cell phone and notices a missed call from Tamale Jones. It's probably nothing urgent. He's likely calling about some jobs. Tamale is a legitimate private detective who often calls Ski Mask when he needs some muscle. Tamale is also the private detective who other PIs call when they need something done off the books, meaning illegal. Some of these underground type jobs include intimidation, roughing someone up, or even making somebody disappear. These are Ski Mask's specialties, and he doesn't come cheap. Getting paid to do what you love, that's the life. He's about to call Tamale to come get him when he notices a woman standing under a street light on the corner. She's wearing a tight, short black skirt, over-the-knee boots, and a snug pink sweater. The street light highlights her shoulder-length platinum hair. When it becomes clear that Ski Mask has seen her, she gets into an old car and drives off. Was she watching him? Ski Mask's thoughts are interrupted when he notices a minor discomfort and itchiness coming from his upper right arm. He reaches under his shirt and feels a warm spot on his arm, like a burn. A burn? He stops in his tracks and holds out his hands. Not a scratch. He runs his hands over his face and head and notices nothing unusual. And most peculiar of all, he is not sore. If he remembers correctly, he was hit by a car earlier, and the only pain he feels is a slight ache coming from the burn on his upper arm region. What the hell is going on? Beams of headlights emerge from behind Ski Mask and his canine companion. A large Mercedes comes to a halt next to him, and the buzz of the passenger side window can be heard as it lowers. Ski Mask bends down to see a man in his fifties with salt and pepper flowing hair and dressed in a tuxedo. The man speaks with an Australian accent. Is that a dachshund you're holding? Ski Mask acknowledges the man's question with a nod. I love dachshunds. Where are you headed? Downtown. Hop in, I'll give you a ride. Ski Mask doesn't hesitate. The Mercedes begins peeling off as Ski Mask shuts the door. My name's Stuart. Stuart keeps looking over at the little dachshund as he drives, smiling and occasionally reaching over to rub on him a bit. Uh, he reminds me of a dog we used to have back in Australia, except my little guy had a white chest. His name was Tim Tam. Ah, oh, he was such a great dog. He was always so happy and playful. We had a pet door so he can go in and out as he pleased. Whenever he'd come back in, he'd hop around like a little kangaroo for three or four seconds. Every time. It was the craziest thing. Oh, then this one time I noticed he came back inside and didn't hop around like he always did. He just walked in real slow like, sat down and stared up at the ceiling. I noticed he was frothing at the mouth. I was concerned. I, I thought maybe he had gotten rabies or something, so I, I took him to the local veterinarian. You'll never guess what was wrong with him. He was intoxicated. See, in Australia we have these big fat things called cane toads, and they're poisonous. If a dog licks the toad, the poison can act as an hallucinogen. So when Tim Tam would find one, he'd lick it, just enough to get high. Sometimes if he'd lick them too much, he'd get sick, so over time, he figured out just how much to lick them to get intoxicated without falling ill. Crazy dog. He lived a nice long life, though. I miss that boy. What's your dog's name? Ski Mask thinks for a moment before answering. Subject M. Subject M? Well, kudos to you for the originality, but sorry to say, that's a shit name for a dog. Ski Mask nods in agreement. As they enter a more populated area, Stuart points to a mid-sized building. There is no name on the exterior, but it appears to be a business. The fluorescent lights of the lobby can be seen through the glass doors of the main entrance. I have to run in here and talk to someone, mate. Shouldn't be but a few minutes. Stuart pulls over, quickly exits the vehicle, and disappears into the building. While he waits, Ski Mask turns his attention back to the dachshund. This will be the fifth renewal for Subject M. Renewal? What were they doing to you? 
Ski Mask inspects the dachshund's head and neck area for any noticeable wounds, but he looks unscathed. He's right. Subject M is a shit name. What should we call you? Ski Mask thinks for a moment. How about we call you... Max. The wiry dog wags his tail more vigorously as if approving of the upgraded name. He whimpers slightly and begins to pant. I bet you're thirsty, aren't you? I know I am. Ski Mask eyes the building Stewart entered. Come on. Ski Mask enters the lobby of the building with Max under his arm. The lobby is vanilla, both in color and feeling. There is a small unisex bathroom door near the entrance that he steps toward, but then stops when he notices something very out of place in this plain lobby. A mammoth, rustic, wooden door. Something one might expect to see at the entrance of a castle. The words, In Eternum, are handwritten on the wall next to the door. Ski Mask takes in the unusual sight for a moment and then heads into the bathroom. This room, as expected, is small, modern, and plain. He turns on the sink, bends down, and takes a couple large gulps for himself. He then cups his hands and fills them with sink water for Max, who quickly laps it up. As he enters the bathroom, he sees a woman outside looking in through the glass doors. It's the same platinum-haired, tight-skirted gal with the pink top who was watching him earlier. When she spots Ski Mask, she swiftly walks away. Ski Mask bolts toward the door to catch her and find out who she is, but stops when he hears a deep voice behind him. May I help you? Ski Mask turns to see a black-cloaked figure standing in front of the wooden door. He can barely make out the pale face veiled within the hood. I'm waiting for Stuart. The cloaked figure stares at him for a moment, turns, opens the wooden door just enough to enter, and shuts it behind him. Ski Mask notices that the door didn't properly latch behind the cloaked man and is slightly ajar. His curiosity gets the better of him, and he walks forward to inspect further. It's open only a few inches, just enough for Ski Mask to see a stone wall. He reaches out and slowly opens the door, revealing a long stone corridor. Amber light dances off the stone from lit torches lining the wall. The cobblestone floor disappears as it winds around a bend and he can hear the reverbing sound of voices coming from beyond his sight. He decides to investigate as to where the mysterious corridor leads, but before he can take a step, Stuart rounds the bend with a short, stout, silver-haired woman by his side. Oh, there you are! Stuart smiles as he and his female companion make their way up the corridor toward him. The woman holds an emotionless expression, but does seem to be taking interest in Ski Mask as they approach. I do apologize for taking longer than I meant to. This is Mona. Mona stares at Ski Mask for a few seconds before reaching out and touching his free hand. She immediately recoils and speaks in a shocked whisper. The Reaper. Her eyes widen and she covers her mouth with her hand. Stuart's smile disappears and he takes in a deep breath. He looks back and forth between Ski Mask and Mona a few times before quickly collecting himself and breaking the odd moment. He smiles, puts his hand on Ski Mask's shoulder, and gently turns him back toward the door. Come on, mate. Let's get you to your vehicle. Chapter 7 The Whore The street lights grow in abundance and the interior of the vehicle illuminates as Stuart and Ski Mask get closer to the downtown region. Stuart smiles and looks at Ski Mask. I'm sorry, I never even asked you what your name is, did I? No, you didn't. Stuart waits a few seconds expecting to hear a name, but respects Ski Mask's choice and continues on. Well, we're almost there, mate. I hope you and Subject M have a beauty of a night. Max. I'm sorry? I took your advice and renamed him. His new name is Max. Stuart nods and lets out a little laugh. 
Max. That's one hell of an improvement over Subject M. Congratulations. Stuart pulls over behind Ski Mask's pickup truck. Here ya. As the vehicle stops, Ski Mask gets out and crosses over to his vehicle. Stuart follows. Listen, mate, I suppose you're wondering what all that was back there? Sure, but it's none of my business, so no explanation necessary. Thanks for the lift. It was my pleasure, and I think we might just meet again one day. He smiles at Ski Mask and looks down at Max and gives him a gentle pat on the head. Good on you, mate. Ski Mask sits down in his pickup truck and sets Max in the passenger seat. He pulls out his cell phone and scrolls through a few contacts on his list. He stops on the name Claire. Before selecting her to be dialed, he glances into his side view mirror and sees the platinum haired woman again. She's standing outside the entrance to a bar, watching him. Ski Mask immediately gets out of the truck, causing the startled platinum haired girl to hurry into the bar. Ski Mask is about to fly after her when he hears Max let out a whiny bark. He looks at Max through the window. I'll be right back. Max jumps into the driver's seat and stares at Ski Mask with sad eyes and begins to cry. Shit. Ski Mask opens the door, tucks Max under his arm, and then hurries into the bar. Ski Mask takes a quick scan around the small packed pub, but doesn't see the platinum-haired woman. The bartender spots Ski Mask with Max. Hey, no dogs allowed in here! Ski Mask gives the bartender a stare that makes the bartender regret saying anything. Did you say something? The bartender shakes his head and places his view elsewhere. Ski Mask walks briskly through the bar, scanning as he goes, but doesn't catch sight of her. He reaches a small hallway with men's and women's bathrooms on either side. He tries the women's room, but it's locked. He kicks it open. It's a tiny bathroom with one toilet, which is being used. Hey! It's not her. He turns and opens the men's room door, only to be greeted by a man taking a piss. Uh, it's crowded in here, buddy. Ski Mask peers down the hall and sees a shabby door with an exit sign above it. He hurries out the door and steps into a well-lit, clean brick alley. He looks both ways, but it's vacant. He lets out a disappointed breath and is about to turn to go back through the bar when he notices a black boot barely peeking out from a small nook leading into the back entrance of a neighboring establishment. He wastes no time in bolting to the nook and pulling out the platinum-haired girl. He forcefully shoves her against the alley wall. Max's whip tail beats against his side as Ski Mask wraps his free hand around the woman's throat. Who are you? He loosens his grasp enough so that she can speak. Hey, I'm just looking for a date. A date? So you're just some slut? I'm not a slut. I'm a working girl. Slut, whore, what's the difference? Sluts give it away for free. You gotta pay to play with me. Ski Mask looks at her with repulsion. I bet a lot of guys have been inside you tonight, haven't they? Enough to pay the rent. Why don't you let me go, honey, and move along? You're bad for business. Ski Mask looks at her closely and takes in a deep sniff. You don't smell like a whore. And just what does a whore smell like? Sweat and scum sloppily concealed with cheap perfume. You're no whore. He squeezes a little tighter. Now tell me who you are. You can call me... Platinum. That's your name? Platinum? That's what you can call me. Ski Mask smirks and lightens his grip. Who do you work for? Platinum doesn't speak, but Ski Mask can see the wheels in her mind turning, as if trying to find the words to explain to him. He decides to hurry things along. You work for them, don't you? Them? The old man and the long-faced, wild-haired guy. Platinum smiles. You should talk to them. You might be interested in what they have to say. Ski Mask studies her for a moment. Max lets out a short, playful bark that makes Ski Mask break his gaze from the whore and look down at him. The sight of the happy dog causes Ski Mask to relax a bit. He lets out a breath, releases his grip on platinum, and walks away. As Ski Mask drives, he takes out his cell phone, scrolls down to the name Claire, and dials. Hi, it's me. I know, you wouldn't believe the night I've had. How's Madeline doing? Did she take her medicine? Good, good. 
Oh, yeah. I think we may have a new addition to the family. You'll see. I'll be home before long. I just have one more stop to make. With Max under his arm, Ski Mask walks deliberately up to the tattered old building that he was captive in earlier and walks through the door. The long-faced man's jaw drops when he sees Ski Mask. He quickly fumbles around for the gun which is sitting on a nearby gurney. Don't bother. If I wanted to kill you, you'd be dead already. The old man smiles. I told you he'd be back. The long-faced man gulps and sets down the gun. The old man looks at Ski Mask and speaks calmly. Please have a seat. Make yourself comfortable. We have some explaining to do. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Alfred Grimm. He motions to the long-faced man. This is my son, Franklin. Franklin gives Ski Mask a grin and piques Ski Mask's curiosity when he speaks. Welcome to your second life. The End The Nine Lives of Ski Mask continues with Life 2, Ski Mask's Lair. The Nine Lives of Ski Mask, Life 2, Ski Mask's Lair. Chapter 1. Wrong Place, Wrong Time. Ski Mask turns on an isolated, gloomy gravel road and looks down at his dachshund companion. Max's twig-like tail beats against the cold vinyl of the seat as he cheerfully fixates on Ski Mask. That wasn't an average night, was it? Max yelps playfully and Ski Mask gives him a supportive pat on the head. They continue onward, seeing no signs of civilization. The towering trees lining the roadway create a twisted canopy above them, shielding any moonlight. Darkness rules this road. The thoughts of his unusual night swirl through Ski Mask's head as he drives for several miles before finally slowing. The road continues forward, but to the right is a dirt road. Ski Mask turns onto it. It's another mile or so before the first no trespassing sign can be seen hanging from a tree. Shortly after is a private property sign, and then a keep out sign. No more signs follow. Ski Mask figures if anyone continues on after three warnings, they'll be more than deserving of their fate. On the right side of a road, a gravel drive can be seen leading to a small cottage with the porch light on. Not much farther up the road, on the left, is a desolate, empty shack made up of a mishmash of worn and rotting wood pieced together haphazardly. This may have been a livable dwelling some years ago, but now it sits lonely, weathered away by time. A tall, decrepit fence stretching from one tree line to the next eliminates any possibility of viewing beyond the shack. The visible yard is overrun by varying weeds, lofty clumps of crab grass, and a medley of trees, some thriving, some long rotten and barely standing. There is no driveway or even a remnant of one. Ski Mask continues shortly past the shack to where the dirt road abruptly ends at a wall of thick, wild shrubbery. Normally the road is vacant up to the shrubbery. Tonight, however, there is a car parked there. Ski Mask stops a short distance from the parked vehicle, kills the engine, and turns off the headlights. He grabs a flashlight from the center console and looks at Max. I'll be right back. He exits, stealthily approaches the driver's side of the unknown vehicle, peers into the window, and views a couple engaged in a rather heavy makeout session. Apparently, they were so into it that they never even noticed the headlights behind them. They both startle when Ski Mask taps on the driver's side window with the butt of his flashlight. The driver of the vehicle rolls down the window. She is clad in a gothic-style outfit and dons studded bracelets, black fingernails, and a nose ring. Her short, spiked hair has been dyed purple. 
The girl in the passenger seat has more of an average look with long flowing black hair. She is just in a bra and quickly conceals herself with a loose t-shirt. Both girls appear to be in their late teens. Ski Mask was expecting them to be frightened, but instead they simply look annoyed. The nerve of him to interrupt their frolic. I suppose you didn't see the no trespassing sign, or the private property sign, or the keep out sign. Look man, we're not bothering anybody. Why don't you just leave us alone? Ski Mask smirks. <laughs> Lesbians. That's right. You got a problem with that? Not at all. I like lesbos. Both girls seem offended by his terminology. Lesbos? Yes. You are aware the term lesbian originates from the Greek Isle of Lesbos, no? Only the ignorant would find anything offensive about me utilizing the origin term. The young women seem confused. I have respect for your kind and your refusal of men. The human male is such a vile creature. Primitive. Hormonally driven. Pent-up sexual aggression constantly running through their veins, pumping up their shaft. Always on the lookout for a new adventure, a new conquest. Their main drive in life is to conquer sexually. To seize and drive their flag into that soft, moist land. <laughs> they dance around and peacock their feathers to draw on easy, insecure women. And then move on to more challenging game. Heterosexual women are too caught up in the facade of being chosen over others to realize that they are nothing more than a number. A notch on a belt. A scratch on a bedpost. I guess theoretically nothing would be more challenging for a man than the conquest of a lesbian. Perhaps that's why so many men are aroused by the lesbo. But more likely it's simplistic. The one-dimensional mentality of the male to be able to relate to a lesbian's desires. So anyhow, yeah, I like lesbos. Both young women stare at Ski Mask with jaws dropped, not sure how to respond to his rant. Finally, Purple Hair speaks up. Piss off, creepo! She barely gets the last word out of her mouth before Ski Mask glides the blade of the knife across her throat. But I hate rude people. The girl in the passenger seat doesn't even have time to register what just occurred before Ski Mask hurls the knife at her, hitting her directly in the eye. She slumps over dead, never knowing exactly what happened. Ski Mask pulls a small square device out of his pocket and presses the large button on the front. A mechanical hum begins to emanate from behind the wall of shrubs. The greenery suddenly rises up in the air, revealing a gigantic Quonset-shaped garage behind it. Large overhead lights flicker on as the hum silences and the false shrubbery door stops. The garage is very clean and well-maintained. The size of the structure would be staggering to most as it is large enough to easily fit 20 vehicles within. Ski Mask pushes Purple Hair over onto her companion in the passenger seat, gets into the car, and drives into the garage building. He parks it and then quickly blankets the vehicle with a large car cover. With a casual stride, he walks back to his truck and opens the door. Max welcomes him with a friendly yelp as Ski Mask gets in and parks his truck within the garage building behind the covered car. He hits the button on the device and the false shrubbery door closes behind him. He looks down at Max, who is growing more excited by the moment. Are you ready? Max replies with a joyful bark as Ski Mask picks him up and walks toward a door on the side wall of the garage building. Welcome home. Chapter 2 The Grimms Franklin Grimm, holding a small plastic dog carrier, enters the laboratory in a rush. He looks at his father Alfred, who is sitting in front of a computer. His attention is turned to a news report on a widescreen television mounted high up in the corner of the room. Franklin looks up at the television, which has a news reporter centered on the screen. Local citizen Zach Bridges shot and killed an attacker who was attempting to murder a young woman named Dakota Blackburn. 
Bridges is being heralded as a hero. Alfred clicks off the television, looks down at the computer screen in front of him, and speaks with a monotone voice. You're late. Franklin takes in a deep breath and studies himself as he shuts the door behind him. He looks at his father, who is studying a graph. Sorry, I couldn't get away. You practically live there. I need your commitment, Franklin. Well, you have it. But I'm needed there too. I am the boss, after all. I've grown old, Franklin. I need your help. Y yes, I know. And you remind me daily. It's a decrepit psychiatric institution filled with drooling maniacs. It doesn't deserve the time you're dedicating to it. Well, I'm here now. Can we stop bickering and get to work? Alfred studies Franklin for a moment and takes a long gander at the pet carrier. What's that? It's a stray dog. He's been sniffing around the dumpsters behind the hospital the past week. I thought he might be useful to us here. Franklin removes the dog from the crate. He's one of those wiener dogs. Ah, a dachshund. Fit him with a tracker. We'll use him to test the process. Franklin sets the dachshund on a gurney and walks deeper into the laboratory. The lab is a very modernistic contrast to the time-worn house it dwells within. Floor-to-ceiling glass cabinets line the walls containing an array of various scientific paraphernalia. Several gurneys are readily available along with multiple exam tables, all with large procedure lights overhead. In the back of the room is an oversized stainless steel sink next to numerous tables sporting gas spouts. Multiple computers are strategically placed throughout the lab. Overall, the space is immaculate and well-organized. Uh, what was the last subject? Alfred hits a key on the keyboard that pulls up a chart on the monitor. Subject L. Franklin removes a digital recorder from his lab coat pocket and speaks into it. We'll be experimenting with Subject M. A dog. A dachshund. Be specific. Franklin looks at Alfred and gives a subtle eye roll as he speaks into the recorder. A dachshund. Also known as a dog. He shoots his father a smart-ass look as he picks up the jet injector and places it on the dachshund's shoulder. He presses the trigger and the impact causes the dog to let out a faint whimper. Did you bring a list of potential subjects from the hospital? Franklin reluctantly answers. Uh, yes, I did, but I don't think this is a wise idea. We need human subjects. Some of those people won't be missed. It's dangerous. If someone becomes wise to missing patients, whose head do you think they'll want on a spike? I'll give you a hint. Mine. Alfred dismisses his concerns. Where's the list? It's in the car. Please bring it to me before you begin the procedure. Franklin lets out a breath of frustration as he crosses to the door. Fine. The very second Franklin cracks the door open, the dachshund leaps from the gurney and bolts outside. Shit! He looks out the door and watches Subject M disappear into the night and quickly flies off the handle. Damn it! He turns and looks at his father with aggravation. Well, are you happy now? He got away. Did he? What the hell do you mean by that? Yes, he ran off. He's gone. Keep your frustration in check and use your brain. This is merely an opportunity for you to test the tracking device outside of a controlled environment. Franklin nods. Right. Franklin hurries outside to get into his car. He pulls a device out of his pocket that is roughly the size of a smartphone. He hits a button on the side, and a sophisticated grid of the surrounding area fills the screen. Franklin hones in on the small, pulsating green light moving down the monitor. There you are, my canine pal. Franklin hits the gas and recklessly navigates the quiet streets as he references the tracking device. Although not yet having made visual contact, Franklin has caught up with the dachshund. Inconveniently, the dog is not sticking to the streets, but rather seems to be moving through various vacant lots and residential yards. Franklin slows down to keep pace with the dog, who is somewhere nearby on the right side of the road. As a consequence of Franklin's reduced speed, a vehicle pulls up closely behind him. Franklin gives the car a long stare through his rearview mirror and talks quietly to himself. You can pass me. The car begins to flick its lights. Oh, for God's sake! 
He rolls down his window, sticks his hand out, and begins motioning the car to pass. Instead of taking his cue, they begin to honk the horn enthusiastically. You have got to be kidding me. Franklin abruptly stops the car, gets out, and waves his arms in the air as he approaches the car behind him, yelling the entire time. There's no one else on the street! You can just pass me! Did you not see me waving you by? He reaches the car and sees a thin, elderly woman behind the wheel. She says nothing and casually flips him off before peeling away past him. There! Yes! That's what I wanted you to do in the first place! It wasn't so hard, was it? Huffing, he gets back into his car and looks at the tracker. The dachshund has made remarkable progress gaining substantial distance from Franklin, causing him to panic a bit. Oh shit. He steps on the gas and flies down the street as he looks down at the tracker. He's gaining ground quickly and is pleased to see that the dog has now crossed onto the street just up ahead. Theoretically, he should be able to just pull right up and pick up the dog. My God! A tall, broad-shouldered man with dark brown hair and a goatee is standing in front of the vehicle. Franklin hits him with full impact just as he pounds on the brakes. The man rolls up on the car hood, smashing the windshield. The screeching halt causes the man to roll onto the asphalt street. Shit. Franklin frantically darts out of the car. Shit, 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 shit. He stands over the man who is staring up at him. Franklin is momentarily alarmed by the nefarious glare of the man, but quickly the man's eyes fog over and become lifeless. Shit. It's only now that Franklin notices the dachshund sitting next to the man, licking his face. He immediately picks up the dog and tosses him into the passenger seat. He shuts the door and looks around. Fortunately, it's a quiet night, no onlookers visible, and nobody rushing to their aid. Yet. Shit. Franklin makes a decision, grabs the man's arms, and pulls him around to the rear back door of his car. He quickly scans the area one more time, and upon seeing no witnesses, manages to push the dead man into his back seat. What seems like an endless task is over in under a minute. He speeds away and heads back to the lab. Franklin rockets inside the laboratory. His balding dark hair is standing on end. He is covered in sweat and distressed. What happened to you? Where is the dog? Uh, he, he's in the car, but we have a, a situation. What situation? Franklin and Alfred stand staring at the man in the back seat of the car. How long has he been dead? Uh, uh, five minutes, ten minutes, hell, maybe twenty minutes, I've lost track of time. Alfred looks at the dead man, and then at Franklin, and smiles. Chapter 3 Home Sweet Home Ski Mask walks through the garage door and shuts it behind him. Home sweet home. The garage door has exited onto a cobblestone walkway that leads to a sweeping courtyard. An elaborate fountain topped with heavily scaled fish spitting water rests in the center of the courtyard bordered by four concrete benches that are walled by closely cropped shrubberies. An array of multicolored accent lighting bounces off the cascading water and fills the courtyard allowing for a well-lit pathway while still conveying a serious sense of coziness. Ski Mask sets Max onto the courtyard ground. He sniffs around slightly and follows Ski Mask to the fountain. Ski Mask takes in the soothing sight of the tumbling water as Max leans in for a healthy drink. After a moment, Ski Mask follows the walkway to the other side of the courtyard that ends at a bamboo shoot double door positioned next to a large bay window. He opens the door and steps into his house, followed by Max, who immediately begins to sniff around, wagging his skinny tail out of control. The main room of the house is enormous and enchanting. A massive mountain stone fireplace takes up the majority of the back wall. A deep maroon plush U-shaped sofa sits at the center of the sunken room and is accompanied by an oversized round fabric ottoman coffee table. 
The cathedral ceilings are reinforced with wood beams and the room is outfitted with various primitive wall hangings. The showpiece of the room is the true-to-life-size chainsaw wood carving of a grizzly bear which is featured prominently against the center wall. Another wall displays a set of full-color security screens displaying the grounds and most of the rooms within the structure. At each corner of the room are corridors. Above each corridor entrance is a wood-carved sign indicating the wing of the house it leads to, north, south, east, or west. The entire house conveys a rustic elegance. Ski Mask begins moving further into the room, but abruptly stops when he hears a low, rumbling growl emanating from the north wing corridor. Ski Mask turns to see two colossal eyes come into view. The gargantuan St. Bernard bolts out of the corridor and crashes into Ski Mask before he can brace himself. He falls backward. The St. Bernard takes a dominating position atop him and begins aggressively licking Ski Mask's face. Ski Mask chuckles as Max playfully barks at the sight. <laughs> Madeline, get off me! The St. Bernard gives Ski Mask two more face-peeling licks before lurching down and giving Max a few sniffs. Ski Mask stands as a herd of critters barrel down the corridor to the main room. At the head of the pack is a greyhound named Slick. He's followed by Trip, short for Triple, a medium-sized scruffy mutt who is missing one of her back legs, but still runs with the best of them. After her is a fat basset hound named Floppy, whose ears drag the ground. Next is Dempsey, an undersized dark brindle boxer missing one of his bottom canine teeth. And then Snowman, the white chihuahua. Snowman is always wearing a sweater. The entire happy bunch encircles Ski Mask and welcome him home by jumping on him, yelping, and scurrying around in happy dances. He greets them and gives them all long rubs and hugs. One by one, they sniff Max and graciously welcome him to their pack. Ski Mask bends down to pet the cat that is purring loudly and rubbing energetically against his legs. The solid gray cat is old and quite small. She only has half of a tail and sports a large scar on the top of her head that runs down to the tip of her nose. Hence her name, Scarface. The other cat in the household is a long-haired black cat named Darkness. He meanders into the room to scope out the source of the excitement, and then once satisfied, nonchalantly strolls out of the room. The dogs begin to simmer down, and Ski Mask turns his head as he hears the squeaky voice of Claire. The alarm went off earlier. Looks like a car park near the Quonset. Claire, a woman in her late twenties, is the definition of petite. A smidge under 4'11 and 95 pounds after a large meal. She wears black jeans, a long sleeve blue t-shirt, and white sneakers. Her raven black hair is straight as a wire and just past her shoulders when it is down, but tonight she has it tied back with a scrunchie. Her liquid blue eyes are accompanied by black horn-rimmed glasses, and her fair complexion makes her lips appear deeper red than they actually are. Late night? Late night, shitty night. Claire scolds him. Your language! Sorry, crappy night. You wouldn't believe it. A hopeful smile covers her face. Try me. Not now. He crosses through the main room to the west wing and walks down the corridor, which ends at a glass door. The dogs follow him, but all stop and sit as he pushes the glass door open and shuts it behind him. Two yards in front of him is a cage door. Beyond it is an immense bird aviary with a vaulted ceiling. The interior is decorated with lush plants and trees. Branches of various sizes wind their way throughout the aviary, and several thick ropes act like bridges from one section to another. The center of the aviary contains a fountain that the birds can drink from and bathe in. Ski Mask opens the gate, steps in, and is greeted by his six parrots. Sisko and Pancho, a pair of blue and yellow macaws, are the first to welcome him with a series of Hi there, and hello. Ski Mask speaks back to them. Pretty bird, pretty bird. Greystoke, the African Grey, answers Ski Mask back, 
by chirping pretty boy several times. Scarlet, the Scarlet Macaw, sits in a corner of the atrium next to her closest friend, Steel, a metallic blue indigo macaw. Lovebug, a white sulfur-crusted cockatoo, flies to Ski Mask and sits on his shoulder. He displays his bright yellow head crest as he nibbles on Ski Mask's hair. Ski Mask removes a plastic cover from a wide, lavish chair and sits down. He watches his birds fly and dance about with joy at his arrival. He takes in a deep breath, closes his eyes, and unwinds while he listens to the chirps, squawks, wing flapping, and kissing sounds surrounding him. This is exactly what Ski Mask needs. Nothing helps him to relax more than spending some time with his birds. After several moments, he opens his eyes. If it's warm enough tomorrow, we'll open that up for you guys. He's referring to a large metal roll-up door that is currently down. When open, it empties out into the exterior portion of the aviary. Ski Mask gets up and walks to the cage door. He speaks to his flock as he exits. See you tomorrow, my friends. Ski Mask closes the cage door behind him and opens the glass door to find Madeline and Max lying side by side. The others obviously grew tired of waiting. He gives them both a pat and exits back into the main room to see Claire in the final stage of slipping on a red windbreaker. I'm going home now, if that's all right. Sure. She starts toward the door, stops, and turns to Ski Mask. Her expression conveys concern. Madeline, it's getting worse. Ski Mask looks down at the droopy-eyed St. Bernard standing next to him. The once black patches around her eyes are now speckled gray, showing her age. She looks at him and whimpers slightly to encourage him to pet her. He does so. I'll see you tomorrow. Ski Mask simply nods. He can hear Claire saying bye to the rest of the dogs as he enters the north wing corridor with Madeline and Max by his side. The first room he passes is the main bathroom which consists of a jacuzzi tub and a walk-in shower with seven different shower heads. The next room in the corridor is Claire's bedroom for the time she stays the entire night. She decorated the room herself. Both the walls and the majority of the decor are various shades of pink in color. She must have been in there when he arrived as the bedspread is slightly mussed and her TV is on. Ski Mask enters the room. A newswoman on TV chatters away as he straightens out the bedspread. We are still gathering details, but what we know at this point is that local citizen Zach Bridges saved a woman from a vicious attack. The woman's name is Dakota Blackburn. Sources have revealed that the attacker was in the process of strangling Miss Blackburn when Zach Bridges intervened and apparently saved her life. Ski Mask clicks off the TV and steps back into the corridor. At the end of the hall is Ski Mask's master suite. A flight of stairs against the first wall leads to a loft that holds his king-sized waterbed. But upon entering, the first thing to be seen is the colossal 300-gallon aquarium with an oversized sunken pirate ship as the cornerstone of the ornamentation, fenced by an arrangement of plastic sea plants. A discreet door aside the tank permits one into the back area which houses the guts of the setup and all the essentials. It's also where one goes to feed the fish. A brown, round sectional sofa sits in the front of the tank. Ski Mask plops down in the middle of the buttery, soft sofa and watches his fish swim carefree. He hits a button that activates a recliner to put his legs up on. Madeline gingerly climbs up on the sofa and rests her big head on his lap. Max follows and nestles against Madeline's body as if he's her puppy. Snowman opts to use Max as a pillow, as Trip, Dempsey, and Floppy sprawl out on the rest of the sofa. Slick lies at the bedroom entrance, keeping guard. Ski Mask pulls out his phone and dials a number. Tamale, I want you to find out everything you can for me on a man named Alfred Grimm and his son Franklin. They're local. And Tamale, this is a rush job. He hangs up the phone rubs the burn on his upper arm, and gazes at the stunning aquarium until his heavy eyelids fall shut.
Chapter 4 Claire It's still early the next morning when Claire returns to the house. As usual, Slick, the greyhound watchdog, greets her at the door and whines slightly with excitement as Claire vigorously rubs his shoulders and quietly baby-talks him. Floppy the Basset and Dempsey the Boxer both rush into the room upon recognizing that Claire has returned. Unable to contain his excitement, Dempsey lets out a loud bark. Shh! You wake up your dad! Dempsey and Floppy dance around, give Claire several welcoming kisses, and then settle down as she pets them. Dempsey and Floppy always stick with Claire when she's around, just like Madeline does with Ski Mask when he's home. From the way he acted last night, it appears the newcomer, Max, might be sticking close to Ski Mask as well. Snowman, the Chihuahua, tends to split his time between Ski Mask and Claire when they're both home, while Trip is a drifter. She can be anywhere at any time, whereas Slick goes wherever the watch takes him. With Dempsey and Floppy at her side, Claire walks down the south wing corridor with a low, cove-vaulted brick ceiling. A large, butcher's block-covered island sits at the epicenter of the kitchen. The walnut hardwood floor and rural sage cabinetry deliver coziness while naturally enclosing the kitchen for an intimate feel. There are two round trough-like water dishes on the floor. The size is such where Claire can only handle one at a time. She pulls over a sturdy apple crate and stands on it. This is necessary for Claire to be able to comfortably reach the sink so she can rinse the dishes out and fill them with fresh water for the day. She sets them next to a line of seven food dishes, all lined according to size. The two cat bowls rest atop a cat climbing tree which is near the dog dishes. With her two faithful companions by her side, she makes her way to the west wing, also known as the parrot wing. Dempsey and Floppy wait outside the glass door as she enters the parrot atrium. Scarlet and Steel immediately fly to Claire and perch themselves on each of her shoulders. They're as affectionate toward Claire as Lovebug is to Ski Mask. Hello, my pretty babies, and how are you today? Sisko and Pancho give Claire a unison squawk of welcome, while Greystoke speaks more specifically to her, chirping out, Pretty girl! multiple times until Claire answers back, Pretty bird! Pretty bird! Lovebug is also happy to see Claire, but keeps checking the glass door to see if Ski Mask is entering behind her. It's a warm morning. You know what that means. Claire presses a button attached to her belt, and the rolling metal door opens, giving the birds the option to exit into the exterior portion of the atrium, which they gleefully do. She removes the cover from the chair in the enclosure and sits. This is the life. Claire is what some may refer to as a brainiac, an accelerated student who graduated high school at 15 and immediately began college studies in the area of animal science, zoology, and wildlife biology, an opportunity to be an assistant zookeeper at the Nashville Zoo in Tennessee required her to leave home shortly after turning 18. It was when she took a higher paying job as an assistant for a veterinarian who specialized in domesticated and exotic animals that she met Ski Mask approximately seven years ago. The vet was on retainer for Ski Mask and Claire assisted regularly. Eventually she handled all of the house calls on her own which were becoming more frequent as Ski Mask gained trust in her. Ultimately, he offered her up a dream job, getting paid handsomely for something she loves. She has her own room within this luxurious house, but was also furnished with a home of her own, a small cottage just across the street. It was made clear to her early on that it was a don't ask, don't tell situation. This was fine with her. She was certainly never a busybody type. Quite frankly, the only downside for Claire in the animal care profession was when she had to have human interaction. In her current situation, taking care of animals that she loves and only having to deal with one person, who is even more antisocial than she is, is nothing short of ideal. Or at least it was. As one who values her own privacy, she could appreciate the clandestine nature of Ski Mask's life. There is even something fascinating and exciting about it. Ski Mask doesn't speak of his days, 
But over the years, she has deducted that Ski Mask's life likely revolves around something nefarious. Spy, secret agent, black ops, assassin, something along those lines. When she was younger, she didn't care at all. But recently, as Ski Mask and his animals have inadvertently become her family, her curiosity grows. She asks him about his days, his life, and his feelings more and more. She even finds herself occasionally worrying about him when he's gone for long periods. Lately, Claire has been wondering what she can do to learn more about her mysterious employer. Claire exits the parrot room and walks back into the main room of the house. She stops for a moment and eyes the east wing. She looks over at the north wing entrance and listens intently for any sign of ski mask being up and about. She decides that it is quiet enough for her to walk down the east wing corridor. This corridor is darker than the others. No overhead lights. No adjoining rooms or closets of any kind. And ending at a single steel door that resembles a bank vault. There is a card key lock on the door similar to that of a hotel room with a red light above indicating it is locked. She turns the handle, but the door doesn't open. It never does. This isn't her first trip down the East Wing Corridor, although Ski Mask has made it clear that she is never to nose around there. Lately, she has been disregarding this rule and wandering down it, looking at the door, turning the handle, imagining what could lie beyond that door. What the hell are you doing? Claire is startled and turns to see Ski Mask's silhouette at the East Wing Corridor entrance. Uh, I'd recommend using the word heck. I don't care what you recommend. Answer me! I'm not doing anything, really. I'm just looking at the big door. She quickly moves toward him to exit the corridor. As she reaches him, he moves over enough for her to walk into the main room. The East Wing is off limits. You know this! This is the kind of shit we should never have to discuss! Please don't curse. Ski Mask rolls his eyes and Claire quickly changes the subject. What happened last night? You seem discombobulated. That's unusual for you. You never used to ask questions. What's with the growing curiosity from you? She shrugs. As I get older, I get more curious. I don't like it. You can tell me, you know. I'm not someone you have to keep secrets from. We've been over all this. Right. Seven years ago. Are you unhappy? Claire answers quickly and definitively. No, of course not. Then don't push it. Ski Mask's phone rings. He takes it out and glances at the incoming caller notification. It's Tamale. Yeah. Okay, I'll meet you there. He walks toward the door and grabs a dark jacket from a coat rack. I gotta go. He bends down and gives Max a pat on the head and gently rubs both sides of Madeline's face as he looks into her sad eyes. He looks at Claire with concern. Keep a close eye on her. Claire nods and Ski Mask exits. Ski Mask enters the garage and uncovers the lesbian's car. He removes both bodies and carries them to a large metal industrial door at the back of the garage. The door has a padlock on it, which he unlocks, and then slides the door open, revealing a long metal chute that descends into darkness. He positions the first girl's body on the chute and lets her go. She slides quickly into the dark, and after a distant thump, all is silent. As he positions the second body on the chute, his cell phone slips out of his front shirt pocket and drops quietly into a fold in the victim's shirt. He lets the girl go. Unbeknownst to Ski Mask, the phone slides down the chute with the body. He glides the door shut, locks it, and departs. Chapter 5. The Failsafe Tamale Jones stands in the lobby of the Madisonville Psychiatric Hospital. He looks sharp in his two-toned shoes and double-breasted herringbone tweed waistcoat and fedora. He could step out onto a street in the 1920s and no one would give him a second glance. He is finishing up a brief conversation with Dr. Franklin Grimm's secretary Gloria, a tall woman in her 40s with thick wavy dark brown hair. 
He had strategically timed his entrance to coincide with her arrival for the purpose of getting the last bit of information needed to conclude his rush job for Ski Mask. Thanks for the info, toots. He hands her his business card and winks. Tall women are the bee's knees. Give me a ring sometime. Gloria smiles as she watches him stroll confidently out of the hospital. On his way to his vehicle, he makes a call. Ski Mask, consider your rush job complete. Come on by the office and I'll give you the straight scoop. As Claire opens up a book and settles in, she is joined on the couch in the main room by all of the dogs except for Max, who is whimpering as he looks out the window, wondering where Ski Mask went. He'll be back. Max looks at her and then back at the window and cries. You're going to have to get used to hanging with me when he's gone. Just like Madeline here. Isn't that right, old girl? She pets the big friendly dog on the head and then gently pats the couch, encouraging Max to join them. Come on. Max looks at her and yelps while his tail begins wagging. She urges him by patting the couch with more conviction. Come on, Max, you can do it. He yelps again, darts to the couch, and begins licking Claire's hand as she pets him. That a boy. That wasn't so bad, was it? We'll be spending lots of time together. I'm not so bad. He licks Claire a few more times, and his tail begins to wag with more vigor when he notices Madeline lying next to Claire. He hurdles Claire's lap and nestles himself up against the big St. Bernard's body and immediately relaxes. Claire's smile at the precious sight is interrupted by a loud alarm blast. She quickly rises up and immediately turns to the security screen. None of the screens look out of the ordinary. Slick. The watchdog has already begun making the rounds through the house, making sure all is secure. He is accompanied by Trip. The others make a security wall around Claire, including Max, who is fitting right in. When Slick and Trip return to the room relaxed, she knows nothing has been compromised. She looks again at the security console and notices something unusual at the bottom of one of the screens. In flashing red letters, it reads, East Wing Failsafe. She has no idea what that means and instantly calls Ski Mask. As the phone rings in her ear, she can faintly hear his unique disco-ish ringtone coming from somewhere within the house. It's distant, but she can hear it. She walks toward the sound of the ring, which leads her to the east wing. She walks down the corridor to the door. The ring is clearly coming from behind the door, albeit quite a distance away. She looks down at the handle. The light above the lock is green. Ski Mask stands in Tamale's office and listens to him rattle off the info as he digs a fork into a hot tamale. This bird Alfred Grimm. He was head honcho over there at the Nut House forever. Upstanding citizen, well respected. Retired about ten years ago to dedicate his time to some personal project. His kid, Franklin Grimm, took over the reins at the Looney Bin, even though the old man recommended someone else for the gig. Franklin has been a high pillow ever since. I gammed with his secretary for a bit. Boy, that was one ripe tomato. The gams on those lanky broads cook my goose every time. Anyhow, she let on that this guy is dedicated. Loves the job more than he loves the babe, so to say. She implied that there may be some sort of contention between him and his old man, which strikes me as a bit funny. Wouldn't the old timer want his kid to do well out there? Tamale tosses a manila file onto the desk. Addresses, phone numbers, car registrations, all that jazz is in there if you want it. Any questions? Ski Mask picks up the file from Tamale's desk. Nah, thanks Tamale. Any time, pal. A TV in the corner of Tamale's office is on, but muted. The news report catches Ski Mask's interest. Turn it up. Tamale does so. A live, on-location news report is on the screen, and several reporters have their microphones in the face of Zach Bridges, who has been dubbed the hero by the press for rescuing a young woman from an attacker. They are in front of a medical hospital where a fairly large-sized crowd has gathered. Zach is a thin young man in his early 20s with short curly hair and wire-frame glasses. He appears shy and unsettled by the attention and doesn't seem to be prepared for the onslaught of questions coming his way. Have you spoken to Dakota Blackburn, the woman you saved? No, I was coming to visit her today. I, I, I had no idea there'd be so many people. Why did you do it? Why did you feel so compelled to save her? Uh, you know, I, I saw someone in trouble. She needed help. I just helped her. 
Had you ever shot anyone before? Zack seems to be disturbed, still dealing with the events that happened. No. Never. Behind the subject is where Ski Mask's attention lies. A young woman in her early twenties with flowing golden locks, highlighted by hints of red, is being pushed in a wheelchair. This is Dakota Blackburn, the woman who was saved by Zack. What caught Ski Mask's eye is the man who is pushing her wheelchair. It's Stuart, the Aussie who gave him a ride last night. The moment the reporters see Dakota Blackburn, they scatter from Zack and descend on her like vultures while bombarding her with questions. Stuart attempts to take control of the situation as he pushes her through the growing mass of people. No comment, sorry, no comments at this time. Dakota holds up her hand, indicating for Stuart to stop pushing her. She is staring at something. The media looks to see what she is staring at, and a hush follows. She is staring at Zack. She rises and begins to walk. The mass of observers part as she makes her way to him. Zack greets her. Hi. I was coming to visit you. I wanted to make sure you were okay. I, I didn't realize you were being released already. My name is Zack. Dakota stares at him with a depressed expression and slaps him fully across the face. There are several oohs and ahs from the onlookers. She turns and walks away sullenly. An older woman in her fifties named Norma, who has frizzy bronzed hair, steps into Dakota's place and looks at Zack with disgust. You son of a bitch! Stuart quickly moves to Norma and ushers her away along with Dakota as Zack stands stiff, in complete shock. Tamale scoffs at the news report. <laughs> How's that for gratitude, just like a dame? Ski Mask turns his attention away from the news report, and Tamale mutes the TV again. Okay, I'm done here. Oh, and tell your chop shop people I have another car for them. Will do. Tamale scribbles a note to himself and then looks back up at Ski Mask. So what you up to today? Ski Mask thinks for a moment and then grins. I think I'll blow off a little steam. Chapter 6 The East Wing Claire stares at the unlocked East Wing door, torn. She's curious as hell, but knows that this could forever ruin this cushy setup for her. She loves her life. It's definitely not worth risking. Sure, she has tried to turn the door handle countless times, but the door lock is always red, so deep down she knew there was no chance of it opening, and even if it did open, she was confident that the most she would do is look at whatever was within her immediate view. She would never dare step foot beyond the door. Never. But this situation is different. An alarm is going off. Ski Mask isn't home. She tried to call him and his phone ring is coming from beyond the door. He drove off, didn't he? He couldn't be down there. Or could he? And if he was, why isn't he answering his phone? Could he be in trouble? Goodness me, what do I do? She ponders several more seconds and then slowly turns the handle. Not knowing quite what to expect, she pulls the door open. A stone stairwell. The stairs are neat and precisely cut. The walls are lined with dark gray and amber fieldstone. A modern metal handrail winds down the wall. It all disappears into absolute darkness. Ski mask? There is no reply. Claire takes a cautious step down onto the first stair. She tilts her head slightly, hoping to see through the blackness at the bottom of the stairs. Jeez Louise, it is dark down there. She is just about to turn back up to get a flashlight when a motion detector catches her movement and illuminates the bottom of the stairs with a light blue hue. The stairs go down further than she initially thought and disappear underneath an archway. She can't see beyond that without descending deeper. Claire thinks for a moment. Oh boy, I guess I'm going to do this. She looks back at the corridor of dogs that are all sitting and watching her curiously. Stay. She's an actress. Ski Mask sits in the truck parked outside the stage door. 
He knows her routine by now, and if today is like the others, she should be exiting through the stage door right about now. She comes out, short blonde hair, very slender, late twenties, casually dressed, looking down at her phone as she walks, oblivious to all other things to the point where she walks into somebody. Yep, that's her all right. The day Ski Mask encountered this lovely woman was when she crossed over the center line into his lane, causing him to swerve onto the shoulder of the road to avoid a head-on-head -head collision. He immediately turned and followed her. He got close enough to observe her, and not surprisingly, she was clearly texting and driving. His original intent was to run her off the road and end her life quickly, but then he got to thinking about how that would be too humane for such a reckless scum. No, this one deserves to know why she is being killed, and her death should be a slow and agonizing one. He watches her as she gets into her car. Her routine is always the same. From here, she'll drive to her yoga class. For some reason, she likes to park at the back of the parking lot where it ends at a forest. A spot far from other vehicles and bystanders, presumably to burn off a few extra calories. Big mistake. This is where he'll take her. She pulls out of her parking space and drives. Ski Mask follows. Claire reaches the stone archway toward the bottom of the stairs. It is sealed off by an accordion folding steel gate. It's not locked, so she slides it open. As she passes through the archway, she is startled by three fast beeps. She looks around to see if she can see a sign of what that was about, but all appears calm. So she continues down the stairs as they widen out before emptying into a spacious corridor-like area. The floor and walls are all stone, similar to the stairwell giving it a dungeon-esque feel, but there is nothing dark or dreary about it. There is a row of bright contemporary dome lights lining the ceiling that illuminate every nook and cranny of the... whatever this place is. Claire projects her voice to the point where any drama teacher would be pleased. Ski mask! No answer. Claire dials Ski Mask's phone number again, setting off the ring. It still sounds distant. She begins walking down the corridor toward the sound, passing a variety of rooms and passages along the way. Most of the doors she passes are wooden double doors that appear to slide open from the center. The various passages all twist before she can view down them deeply. Goosebumps rise on her arms as she passes a large, jail cell-like area equipped with wall shackles. She whispers to herself, What on earth? She continues forward a little further and then stops at a large metal door that is slightly open. The ringtone is coming from this room. She reaches out, takes hold of the door to open it wider, and instinctively pulls her hand back, surprised at the frigid temperature stemming from the crack of the door. A freezer. She collects her composure and it's greeted by a blast of icy air as she opens the door and screams. The bodies of the two lesbian gals are lying on the frosty floor. Dear me. One is positioned in a crumpled manner at the bottom of a metal chute that enters the room through thick plastic, with several slits making flaps. The second body is nearby, but pressed up against a metal lever. This is apparently some kind of fail-safe that allows someone an easy exit in the event that they lock themselves in the freezer. For some reason, it tripped the lock on the main door as well. Claire nervously steps in and eyes the dead girls for a moment. She looks at the surroundings within the freezer. There are various meat hooks and an array of butchering equipment. She picks up Ski Mask's phone. It's flashing red, attempting to alert him of the situation. She backs out of the freezer, fastens the door, and quickly starts walking back down the corridor towards the stairs. As she rounds the final towering archway before reaching the steps to take her back up to the east wing corridor, a large iron barred door slams shut in front of her, preventing her from advancing further. Panicking, she starts looking around for another exit. She dashes down the first passage to her right. The passage rounds a bend and she can see a door in the distance. Her pace quickens and suddenly she feels herself go airborne and slam against the stone wall. 
She tries to move, but realizes that something is pressing her against the stone. Claire tries to get her wits about her enough to assess what exactly has happened. She looks down, and it dawns upon her. Booby trap. An iron half-pillory cage device was sprung from the wall and is now pinning her tightly in place against the cold stone. It is pressing tightly and denting her skin. She can barely move and doesn't bother trying. She looks down and can see that her feet are dangling a yard off the floor. She is suspended against the wall by the torturing snugness of the rounded cage. Claire closes her eyes and takes shallow breaths as she attempts to calm herself. Ski Mask keeps a respectable distance behind the texter as they flow down the two-lane highway. Whatever happened to the good old days when it was only drunkards that one had to worry about crossing over the center line? The percentages were low, especially during the week at daytime. Nowadays, any place, any time, anyone can randomly cross the center line and cause a head-on-head -head collision as they text away on their phone with messages that apparently can't wait and must be seen now at all costs. Ski Mask's plan is to bring her back to his lair, chain her up in one of his cells, and have some fun. He'll likely begin by giving her the impression that she's going to be raped. After she's good and freaked out, he'll lop off her texting digits and toss her phone next to her to see if she can still type. Or he'll simply go where his mood takes him. Death is behind you and approaching fast. He continues to tail her as she begins to drift over the center line into the oncoming lane and continues to swerve further onto the shoulder of the road and slams head on into a tree. You're kidding. Ski Mask screeches to a halt, exits the vehicle, and walks to the driver's side of the actress's car. Apparently her head hit the windshield, and when the whiplash yanked her back, half of her head remained embedded in the windshield. He notices the brain matter dripping down her face when he hears a ding. Ski Mask looks down to see her cell phone in her hand. A new message from whomever she was texting brightens the screen. Ski Mask smiles at the irony. Oh well. He casually strolls back to his truck and drives away. Tracks of tears run down Claire's smooth face. The cold steel pressing against her frame is making it difficult for her to breathe. While the majority of her body is immobilized by the constricting iron, there is a small space at the upper section of the cage that would allow her to move her head if she wanted, but she hasn't. Her eyes are closed and she is taking in long, deep breaths as she tries to keep herself from going into a frenzied panic. When she hears the familiar voice give a specific instruction, she instinctively turns her head in that direction not even realizing until it is too late that she inadvertently defied the order. Don't move! The movement of her head sets off a motion-activated version of a feather spear trap. An imposing steel blade affixed to a metal arm springs out of the wall and speeds toward Claire. The very second he notices Claire's head moving, Ski Mask springs into action, throwing himself in between Claire and the blade. The enormous blade hits him directly in the heart with a splatting thud, and the force of the trap plasters Ski Mask against the wall next to Claire. With their faces approximately 24 inches away from each other, Ski Mask has no option but to stare at Claire. He tries to recall whether the current short distance that separates them is the closest their faces have ever been to each other. He thinks so, since he can never remember seeing her eyes this clearly. Bright blue, like ice, an unlikely pairing with hair so black. He never realized until now how pretty her eyes are. Quite beautiful, in fact. Claire screams, No! Ski Mask notices his phone in Claire's hand. He reaches down, does a quick swipe, and enters a few numbers. The cage enclosing Claire immediately springs back into the cover of the wall and drops Claire to the floor. He stares at Claire for his last few seconds before his eyes roll back into his head and his body goes limp. The End Thank you. 
The Nine Lives of Ski Mask continues with Life 3 in Eternum. The Nine Lives of Ski Mask, Life 3 in Eternum. Chapter 1 An Uninvited Visitor. Dr. Franklin Grimm sits at a counter in the lab and stares sadly at a picture of his mother. In the photo she is young, elegant, and happy. He picks up the picture frame and holds it closer to his face. He takes it in for a few seconds, lets out a deep breath, and sets it back down. It is common for Dr. Franklin Grimm to stay behind in the lab for an hour or so after his father leaves. It gives him the opportunity to clear his mind as he tidies up the lab for the next day. He stands, wrings out a plaid rag, and begins wiping down the counters. As he cleans, he thinks back to the previous night when the strange, frightening man unexpectedly entered their lives. The scowl that man gave them before he left was terrifying. Franklin reflects on the conversation he had with his father afterward. Holy shit, who the hell was that guy? He's scary as hell. Why did you let him go? We lost him and Subject M. Alfred shakes his head disappointedly. Have you not learned anything from tonight? A light goes off in Franklin's head. The tracker. If need be. He might just go to the cops. Do you really think a man like that would go to the police? Besides, I suspect he'll return. Wh what Why the hell would he come back here? I noticed a curiosity behind those eyes. <laughs> you did? All I noticed was evil. Franklin thinks for a moment, and a concerned look crosses over his face. What are we going to do if he does come back? We'll be honest with him. <laughs> are you serious? We can't tell him the truth. Perhaps not the whole truth, but as much as we need to. Alfred grins. Enough to intrigue him. Think about the advancements we will make with a cooperative human subject. <laughs> if he doesn't decide to kill us first. Yes, not killing us is a prerequisite. That's why I'll do the talking. Franklin's recollection of the previous evening is interrupted when he hears a loud beeping sound that startles him. He sets the plaid rag down on the counter and hurries to a tablet device from where the sound is coming. He swipes a screen and displays a nervous expression. Oh shit. He rushes to his car and peels away. Tears stream down Claire's face as she looks up at Ski Mask, impaled on the wall, likely dead. All because of her. She has already spent a considerable amount of time trying to pull him down. At first she was simply too short to reach him properly. After finding a step stool, she discovered that she was not strong enough to get him down on her own. There has to be something I can do. An alarm blares, followed by a security panel dropping down from the east wing ceiling. A startled Claire focuses on the monitor with red flashing borders, showing the road outside of the fortress facade. A car pulls up, stops, and a man gets out. Realizing there's nothing she can do to help Ski Mask by herself, Claire races through the east wing to the staircase and dashes up the stairs to the corridor where all seven dogs sit waiting for her. She sprints to the main security panel and watches the man outside scurry about trying to figure out how to get to the fake house. She presses an intercom button. Who are you? She can see him startle. Um, uh, uh, hello, I'm, I'm, I'm Franklin Grimm. What do you want? Uh, is there a man here who calls himself Ski Mask? Knowing he can be seen, but unsure where the cameras are, he holds up his tablet device and turns from side to side. Judging from the signals I'm receiving, he's in trouble. I can help him. I can save him. A sense of hope rushes through Claire. On the ground to your right is a bulkhead door. Do you see it? 
Franklin looks around and sees the sloping door. It's wooden and not easy to spot as it is painted green and brown. I see it. Open it. He opens the wood door and is surprised to see another door underneath it. This one is steel with a large handle and number pad next to it. When you hear the buzz, pull it open and get in here. Hurry! Upon hearing the buzz, he opens the heavy door and hurries down the concrete staircase below. It leads him to an 8x8 foot concrete tunnel with a string of overhead lights above. It ends at another concrete staircase that leads to another bulkhead door. He pushes the bulkhead door open and see that it enters into a lovely courtyard. He has no time to take in the view as he is greeted by a frantic, petite woman who grabs him by the arm. She rushes him through the courtyard, into the house, down a corridor, and into a dungeon-like area. Franklin feels in a bit of a daze as she pulls him down a winding passageway to where Ski Mask hangs limp, with a large spike through his chest. Holy shit! Help me get him down! Together, they are able to pull the spring-loaded trap back far enough to remove the blade spike from Ski Mask's chest, causing him to fall to the ground in a heap. I think he's dead. Yes, but help me. Franklin pushes Ski Mask up into a sitting position. Hold him up. Claire puts all of her weight against Ski Mask's back, propping him up as Franklin pulls a small flash drive-like device out of his pocket. He presses a button on the device, illuminating the tip with a red glow. He holds the glowing tip to the base of Ski Mask's skull. A few seconds elapse, and Ski Mask lets out a series of loud coughs and then starts feeling his chest where a gaping wound had once been, but now is completely healed. Ski Mask stands and takes in a breath. It worked. Again. Relief flushes over Franklin's face until he begins to realize that he's standing in what appears to be some kind of dungeon. What is this place? He looks at Ski Mask. Who the hell are you? Claire stares at Ski Mask in astonishment and then looks to Franklin. He's alive. She looks at Ski Mask. You're alive. She rushes to Ski Mask and embraces him. He steps back out of the hug. He is not happy and gives her a glare as he speaks. You're never supposed to come down here. But... He turns his attention to Franklin. And you. How the hell did you find me? The rage behind Ski Mask's eyes forced Franklin to speak quickly and truthfully. A tracking device? We, we planted a tracking device in your upper arm. Take it out. Uh, but, but without the tracking device, I would have never been able to find you. Ski Mask wraps his hand around Franklin's throat and pushes him against the cool stone wall as he speaks in slow, deliberate fashion. Take. It. Out. Yeah, of course. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll take it out right away. Chapter 2. The Hero. Dakota Blackburn exits an upscale tap room. She is decked out in a navy blue evening gown and is followed by the Aussie Stuart, who is sharply dressed in a tuxedo. They speak cordially. Stuart smiles and shakes her hand. They have a few more kind words. All the while, Stuart is still holding onto her hand. He smiles again and gives her a large hug before she waves and walks away. The evening is quiet and still. The loud click of her high heels against the pavement echo in the night. She turns and disappears down a shadowy alleyway, walking deep into the darkness. She is visibly alarmed as she hears the thumping footsteps of someone quickly approaching behind her. She spins around and exhibits a look of fright as a burly, bushy-haired man plows into her, wraps his hands around her throat, and pushes her down onto the damp asphalt. The man growls and snarls as he squeezes her throat tighter. He pants, heavily exposing the stench of his putrid breath. The smell is as if he'd just finished eating rotten meat. Dakota winces and struggles without success and can feel her life beginning to seep away. 
Her hands paw away uselessly at the drooling, maniacal man's chest as he continues to squeeze, turning Dakota's face deep red while her eyes begin to bulge. Her flailing arms go numb and fall to the ground. As the crazed man puts the finishing touch on Dakota, the silence of the night is erupted by a loud shot, and the man's chest explodes. A spurt of blood shoots forward as another gun shot reverberates through the alley, accompanied by another explosion of blood, which splats over Dakota's face. The life leaves the crazy man's eyes, and he falls forward. Dakota uses all of her strength to lift her head up and sees a young man holding a smoking gun, slowly lowering it from the firing position. Stuart and several other well-dressed men and women flow into the alley. Zack Bridges, the young hero, watches as Stuart rolls the lifeless body of the crazy man to the side, exposing a wheezing and coughing Dakota. A frizzy-haired woman stands next to Zack as they hear Stuart yell out, She's okay! Jane, the frizzy-haired woman, turns and stares at Zack with concern. My God, what have you done? Jane and several others rush forward toward Dakota as Zack watches on, confused. It's as if they were angry. Yeah, I saw that nutty skirt Saki and the kisser on the boob tube. Tamale sits in his office chair and unwraps a freshly heated tamale. You want one? They're the best on this side of the state. No, thanks. Listen, kid, you saved the dame's life. You tried to thank her and she wasn't having any of it. That's kind of rude, but it's not a crime. You want my advice? Drop it. Move on. You're probably right, but I, I don't know. I just want to talk to her. Oh, it's your dime. Zack drops his head as he speaks. He's having a difficult time dealing with everything. I'm no hero. I'm just a regular Joe Schmo. I never shot anybody before. I just saw somebody in trouble and I tried to help. I, I killed that man. The news reported that he had a history of violence. He was suspected of having killed women in the past and then robbing them, but they were never able to prove it. So yeah, he was a bad person, but still, it was me who killed him. You did the world a favor, kid. Yeah, that's what everybody says. You would think that would make it easier to deal with, but the woman I saved, she doesn't seem grateful. Not that I expect that, but... She's not happy. Her friends aren't happy. It's all so odd. I want to move on. I do. I, but, but I feel like I can't. Not until I talk to her. If you could just find out where she lives or works. I'll do you one better than that. After you called me this morning, I did a little sniffing around. This Aussie fella, Stuart, he seems to have some sort of relationship with the Dakota dame. He hangs out at some secretive joint not too far from here. What do you say we take a skip down the road, see what we can find out? Tamale parks a block down the road from the mysterious establishment. As he and Zack approach the building, Zack's eyes light up. That's her! Outside the building, Dakota is speaking animately with Stuart. Tamale and Zack can hear everything that is being said. I understand what you're going through. No, you don't. Well, I can imagine. No, you can't. With that, she hurries away to a nearby car. Stuart watches her drive off and dejectedly enters the building. Come on, let's check this joint out. Zack follows Tamale into the building lobby. There is a horde of well-dressed people milling about. A light buzz of conversation fills the room. At the far end of the lobby is an ancient-looking wooden door with the words In Eternum scribbled on the wall next to it. Two robed men stand on either side of the door. The hoods on their robes are up and their faces darkened. Once Tamale and Zack enter the building, one of the well-dressed men in the lobby recognizes Zack and shouts, It's him! A hush falls over the mass of people, and they all turn to face Zack and Tamale. After an uncomfortable few seconds, Jane steps forward and scowls as she lectures Zack. How dare you show your face here? What gives you the right? What gives you the right to... Stuart steps in and places a hand on Jane's shoulder. She looks up at Stuart, 
stops talking, and collects herself. Stuart smiles and approaches the duo. Your name's Zack, right? Yes. Stuart looks at Tamale. And who might you be, mate? I'm his mother. Stuart smiles and fixes his attention back on Zack. May I ask what you're doing here, mate? I, I saw Dakota outside. And you'd like to speak with her? Yes. Why, if you don't mind me asking? What happened back at the hospital was so strange. I just... I don't know, I just... You think it might be therapeutic? Something like that, yeah. You and Dakota have both been through something traumatic. I can understand why you think talking to her may be beneficial to you, but... No matter how positive your intentions, you are a reminder to her of what transpired. Right now, I think she'd prefer to distance herself from that unfortunate happening. I hope you can respect that. Well, well, sure. I mean, I didn't mean to cause any negative. Zack is distracted by the large wooden door opening at the far end of the room. Whoever emerged is shielded by the crowd of onlookers. Yes, of course. You meant no arm. We all understand that. And we all know you'll understand her position and respect her privacy. Okay. Sorry. Zack turns to exit and stops when he hears the gentle voice of an elderly woman. The hero... Zack turns to see a short, pear-shaped elderly woman with fluffy silver hair. She gazes deeply at Zack. There's something calming about her beady green eyes. You seek comfort. Yes, I do. She steps closer to him, takes his hand, and stares into his puppy dog eyes. A saddened expression comes over her face. You poor soul. Zack appears confused. Finally, Mona forces a friendly smile. I may be able to help you. Please come inside. You will be my special guest. Mona ushers him near the assembly of people and two men take him by the arms as they guide him toward the wooden door. Zack looks back at Tamale with a helpless expression. Hey, where are you taking him? Tamale starts to move forward, but his path is obstructed by one of the larger men in the group who stands firmly in front of him. Tamale attempts to sidestep him and another large man emerges. This one puts his catcher's mitt of a hand on Tamale's chest to stop him from moving forward. Tamale pushes the man's arm aside. Get your paws off me, Paluka! Tamale looks past the goon and sees Zack being led into the corridor behind the wooden door, followed by the two robed men. Hey! Once again, Tamale tries to move forward toward the door, but this time the goons shove him backwards. Tamale immediately reaches for the gun concealed under his peanut brown checked tweed suit jacket. At least a dozen of the well-dressed men respond by reaching under their jackets. Tamale recognizes that he'd lose this gunfight and slowly takes his empty hand out from under his jacket. I'll tell you big shots right now. If something happens to that kid, you'll be sorry. Mona moves forward past the large man and stands in front of Tamale. The tender tone she used with Zack has been replaced by sharp harshness. This is a private club. You're not welcome here. Get out. Tamale stares at the stone-cold face of the old woman for a few seconds before turning around and exiting the building. He immediately peers through the window and watches as Mona enters the corridor behind the wooden door. The others all fall in line behind her. After the large door shuts behind them, he can hear the faint chant of Mona, Mona, Mona. Tamale takes out his phone. Ski mask, I need your help. Meet me at my office. Chapter 3 Lifeline. Franklin finishes the stitches in Ski Mask's upper arm. After removing the tracking device, he notices the cold stare he is receiving. It's not unlike the stare Ski Mask fixed on him when they returned the previous night, just like his father had predicted. That conversation was shorter than Franklin or his father Alfred had expected. Alfred actually suggested that Ski Mask pull up a chair but Ski Mask refused. He simply stood and listened. Franklin never realized someone could look so menacing while holding a tail-wagging dachshund. 
Alfred was very articulate in explaining the renewal experiment they were working on. His life's work is how Franklin's father always described it. He went on to explain that to date, their experiments were restricted to animals only, but they had reached a point where human subjects were necessary. They never intended to experiment on Ski Mask, but he fell into their laps. They couldn't pass up the opportunity, and since it appeared to be working, it was a win-win for everybody. Ski Mask sat and contemplated for what was probably only 30 seconds, but to Franklin seemed like hours. He didn't bombard them with questions as both he and his father expected. Instead, he casually left, telling them both he'd see them soon. When Alfred called out after him asking him for his name, Franklin shuddered at the response. Call me Ski Mask. Franklin tightens down the final stitch and gives Ski Mask a smile. All done. Ski Mask stares at him for another long moment before speaking. You never thought to tell me you fitted me with a tracking device? You left rather abruptly, and honestly, we thought it might not go over well with you. Listen, as far as we know, we only have a few hours to administer the renewal procedure, or we can't bring you back. Without a tracking device, how would we know if you got yourself killed? How would we find you? I I'm not sure why you're so opposed to it. I like my privacy. What else didn't you tell me? Claire interrupts. Wait a minute. So he was really... dead? Franklin looks at Ski Mask for permission to proceed. Ski Mask doesn't speak, but does nothing to indicate objection, so Franklin looks at Claire and continues. Uh, yes, he was dead and I brought him back. You brought him back to life? Yes, there's a short window after death where we can renew a subject. He just had a gigantic hole in his chest. What happened to that? The renewal process heals wounds, regenerates tissues. It's the most remarkable invention in history. Claire looks at Ski Mask. How long have you been doing this? Since yesterday, when he killed me. It was an accident! Franklin looks to Claire. He, he ran out in the middle of the road. My father and I never had the opportunity to experiment on humans before, and he was dead anyway. You've been dead twice in the past day? He killed me yesterday. You killed me today. Maybe you two should team up. He looks at Franklin with a sinister gaze. Is there anything else you're withholding from me? No, nothing that pertains to you. Oh wait, Subject M. He has a tracking device too. His name is Max. Ski Mask whistles and pats the couch. Max jumps up next to him. Take it out. Uh, right away. Franklin immediately begins the simple procedure of removing the tracking device from Max. He looks around and sees that he is encircled by six other dogs. Oh, lots of dogs. He has a hard time reading their demeanors. I hope they're all friendly. As long as I don't tell them otherwise. Franklin smiles nervously and goes back to work on Max, but jumps when he feels a furry body rub against his back. What the... He turns to see the cats, Darkness and Scarface, both rubbing vigorously against him. The cats seem to have taken a liking to you. Uh, I'm, I'm not very fond of cats. Ski Mask snaps at Franklin. Stop right there. I had better never hear you say one cross word about my cats. No, no, never. And be nice to them. Yes, yes. Franklin turns and spends a moment awkwardly patting the cats on their heads. Uh, good kitty? Good kitty? Franklin turns back and continues his work on Max as he speaks. I'm, I'm sorry that we didn't tell you about the tracking device. I, I hope you can understand why. I heard your explanation. It was deceitful. You should have been straightforward with me. I'll expect you to be so from now on. Of course. Is there a limit to how many times the renewal will work on him? If the results from every other animal we've tested is any indication, eight. The life you were born with, and eight renewals. Nine lives. Ski Mask pets Max slowly, which relaxes him as Franklin removes the tracking device and begins stitching him up. Since we can no longer track you and we'll have no way of knowing if you die or not, I'd like to implant you with an auto-renewal chip that we've been experimenting with. 
We've only tested it a handful of times, but it does appear to function as we had hoped. Elaborate. You won't need me to administer the procedure. The, the chip will take care of the renewal on its own. No tracking device? None. No add-ons of any kind. We haven't gotten that far yet. It auto-renewals. That's all. Okay. There is one caveat. For some reason that we haven't figured out yet, the auto-renewal chip only works five times. Since you're already on your third life, it will get you to life eight. But it won't work after that. You'll need me to do the procedure manually for that last lifeline. Franklin's face lights up. Lifeline? I like that. I, I think that might be what we wind up calling this thing. He shifts his attention back to Ski Mask. Anyway, hopefully you can stay alive a little longer than you have recently. Ski Mask doesn't respond and continues to stare at Franklin, who carefully goes on. I'm sure you'll understand if I tell you that my father and I have a lot of questions for you and your experiences thus far. You are our first human subject, after all. Yes, I understand. And I'll get in touch with you soon. Thank you. Franklin stands and Ski Mask turns to Claire. Show him out. As Claire walks away with Franklin, Ski Mask's phone rings. He sees the caller is Tamale Jones and answers. Yeah. I'll be right there. Ski Mask hangs up and looks back at the corridor to the east wing. The freezer failsafe was only supposed to open the freezer door in the event that he got locked in. Some wires obviously got crossed. With a little troubleshooting, it should be an easy fix. While he's at it, he'll move the failsafe lever further from the chute. Design error. You live and you learn. As Ski Mask makes his way toward the main door, Claire returns. I'm leaving. He walks past her. I'm sorry. He stops, turns, and shoots her a glare. We'll talk later. Claire's nerves start to twitch as she watches him leave. She lets out an uneasy deep breath. Jeepers. Chapter 4 The Meeting There is a knock on the door. Dakota Blackburn sits on her couch, staring at the floor, depressed. She ignores the knock initially, but then there's another knock, and another. The persistent knocker causes her to rise. She listlessly walks to the door and opens it. She is a little shocked and dismayed to see Zack. Will you please leave me alone? She begins shutting the door. Zack speaks quickly to get his words out before the door closes. I met Mona! Dakota opens the door wider and looks at Zack with intrigue. Okay. Would you like something to drink? Zack seems nervous as he sits down in a chair in Dakota's living room. He runs his hand through his short hair several times as she fills his glass from a pitcher of lemon water. You seem anxious. Oh, a little bit, I guess. He picks up the glass and takes a sip as he and Dakota study each other, trying to figure out what to say. Zack begins. I'm not sure where to start. Dakota interrupts. It's all quite overwhelming. Zack nods. Dakota's stone expression finally breaks and she lets out a faint smile that seems genuine. Why don't we start at the beginning? Where are you from? Uh, I was born in Nashville, but my parents moved around a lot, so I've lived all over the Midwest. How long have you been in this area? Uh, about two years. Do you like it here? I do. Uh, how about you? Where are you from? Dakota doesn't hesitate. I've lived here my whole life. Really? Dakota nods. I was born here. I was raised here. I went to... Dakota can't finish her sentence before Zack punches her, square in the jaw, knocking her to the floor. She is disoriented as Zack pounces on top of her and roughly wraps his hands around her throat. He starts squeezing with all of his might. Dakota instinctively reaches up, defensively grabbing at his shirt and sliding her hands around his face. Zack easily moves his head away and squeezes harder, weakening her defenses as her face turns red and her eyes begin to bulge. 
Zack looks maniacal as he continues to squeeze. Dakota's arms fall limp to her side as the life slowly seeps from her face. Zack continues to choke her even after it's clear that she's dead. He wants to be sure. There can be no mistake about this. Finally, he stops and looks at her closely. He slaps her face lightly on both sides. Can you hear me? He slaps her lightly again. Can you hear me? Dakota is dead, but Zack wraps his hands around her throat and uses all of his remaining strength to squeeze once again. Her expression does not change. Zack lets out a yell while he squeezes her already crushed windpipe with more force. After a moment, he stops and looks at her. He grabs her wrist to feel for a pulse. He lays his head on her chest, listening for a heartbeat. He looks into her dead eyes and then collapses backward. Zack takes in several deep breaths and then smiles. Chapter 5 The Laughing Place Tamali was waiting for Ski Mask outside of his office and briefed him during the drive to the Inaternum building. After pulling up, they both get out. As Tamali takes his gun out from under his jacket and checks to make sure it's loaded, Ski Mask turns and speaks to him. I'll handle this. You can't go in there alone, there's too many of them. Go back to your office. And I want you to look through your files. Find me the most dangerous, high-paying job you can find. The type that no rational person would do for any amount of money. Tamale nods. Okay, Ski Mask. Tamale has known Ski Mask long enough not to argue with him. He suppresses his reluctance, gets back into his car, and drives away. Ski Mask opens the door and steps into the lobby. Two mysterious cloaked figures stand on each side of the wooden door. Ski Mask ignores them, walks briskly to the wooden door, and begins to open it. One of the robed men makes the mistake of putting his hand on Ski Mask's shoulder to stop him. Ski Mask drives the heel of his hand into the man's nose, shattering it instantly, and dropping him to the ground like a sack of potatoes. The second cloaked man advances on Ski Mask and is greeted with a kick to the crotch that doubles him over, giving Ski Mask easy access to his neck, which he hastily snaps like a twig. Ski Mask walks rapidly down the stone corridor, passing all of the lit torches on the wall. He follows the corridor as it bends to the left. After another hundred feet, it ends at a loft overlooking a medieval-like sanctuary. Stone pillars stand in each corner. Several large scythes, exactly what one would expect the Grim Reaper to hold, decorate the walls. The room is modestly lit with an assembly of torches. A congregation of at least 50 cloaked people stand on both sides of an aisle as a single robed man walks toward the old woman, Mona. She is flanked by two cloaked men. She too is cloaked, but her hood is down. When the robed man reaches her, he kneels. She places both of her hands on his shoulders, looks up, and begins speaking in Latin. Ski Mask notices a nearby metal spiral staircase that leads down to the sanctuary. He quietly descends the stairs and stands at the top of the aisle. Mona speaks. In Eternum. She lowers the hood from the robed man, revealing his identity. Ski Mask recognizes that the man is the hero. He calls out, Zack! Upon hearing his voice, the room of cloaked figures all quickly turn towards Ski Mask. Mona recognizes him. Dos mis, it's the Reaper. Her statement causes a stir among the cloaked congregation. They begin looking back and forth between Mona, themselves, and Ski Mask, while several can be heard whispering, the Reaper. Zack rises and slowly walks to Ski Mask. Ski Mask motions to Zack. Come with me if you want to live. But I don't. Mona speaks loudly, her voice echoing throughout the sanctuary. What possible gift can we bestow upon the Reaper? 
In an unexpected, quick motion that catches Ski Mask off guard, Zack removes a short sickle from under his robe and buries it into Ski Mask's throat. Before he can react, the cloaked congregation moves forward, all removing similar sickles from under their robes. They encircle Ski Mask and begin chopping into him until he is a lifeless, bloody mess. The congregation parts as Mona walks down the aisle and looks down at Ski Mask. It is an honor to bestow upon you the very gift that you have bestowed upon so many. Et nos gratias ago tibi. We thank you. Ski Mask's eyes open, causing the majority of the congregation to gasp. He rises and sidekicks the nearest cloaked figure out of the way, clearing his path to the largest scythe on the wall, which he removes. He turns and swings, immediately lopping off the heads of three of the nearest cloaked people. He continues wielding the scythe in a graceful motion of murderous beauty, mowing through the congregation like a field of rye. Heads, arms, legs, and torsos pile up as Ski Mask rips through them using the scythe in a graphic, artful rhythm. As he plows through the mysterious people, he notices that the majority of them are not fighting back. More so, they are not resisting. Most have dropped their sickles to the ground and patiently wait their turn to succumb to his wrath, of which Ski Mask obliges again and again and again. When there no longer appears to be anything to swing at, Ski Mask stops. With the exception of his heavy breathing, the room is silent. He scans the area for any life. Only three figures remain standing. Mona, Stuart, and Zack all stand at the end of the aisle. Ski Mask marches up to them. He stops in front of Zack, who doesn't dare challenge Ski Mask to a duel but rather raises his head proudly, even pushing his throat out slightly, obviously resigned to his fate. One swing of the scythe sends Zack's head flinging across the room. Ski Mask moves closer to Mona and Stuart. Mona's beady green eyes sparkle as she smiles at Ski Mask. The Reaper deserves an explanation, if he so desires. Ski Mask shrugs. I'm curious. Mona sits down on a small stone stairwell near the aisle. I grew up in the northern suburbs of Chicago. The winters were so cold, frigid. When I was 12 years old, I was playing on the ice, alone. My mother always warned me not to do that, but I was young and ignorant, you see, so I disregarded her warnings. One day, the ice broke and no one was around to help me. I was trapped under the ice. I drowned. I died that day. They told me I was clinically dead for over 45 minutes before they brought me back. Everyone expected me to be happy to be alive. They couldn't understand the long bout of depression I went through after that. But how could they? None of them had ever been dead like I was. None of them ever experienced where I was at. I called it my laughing place. I came out of my depression when I realized I had been blessed with a gift. The ability to show other people a quick glimpse of their laughing place. To teach them that death is not something to fear, but rather something to embrace after you've lived a full life as you are supposed to. Mona motions to Zack's head lying on the floor. When Zack saved Dakota, he changed her destiny. He spun her life cycle off into another direction. None of us knew how long her new path would be. We just knew she must live it. Whatever happens to her must be out of her control. She was expecting to be in her laughing place that night. Zack was a good boy. He thought he was helping her. He didn't realize what he had done. When I took his hands and let him glimpse his laughing place, he understood. He killed her today. Such a brave boy. He told no one until the deed was done. 
He took her destiny into his own hands and righted the unintended wrong, sending her back onto the path she was meant to be on. She looks back at Ski Mask. I can also see how long one will live, unless their destiny is changed. Poor Zack. Had you not changed his original path, he would have lived to be 103 years old. Life is short, but for a young man who just glimpsed his laughing place, it would have felt like an eternity. You saved him. She gazes around at the massacred congregation. You saved all of them. You are a true angel. An angel of death. Mona rises and walks to Ski Mask. She takes his hands into hers and looks deep into his blue eyes. Her eyes twinkle as she speaks. I've never seen one like you. The option of so many lives. You don't fear much, but you fear the light. She smiles. There's nothing to fear. You have sensed the peace within the light. It's real. It's everything it appears to be, and more. So much more. She squeezes his hands as she continues to speak. There are many lives ahead of you for me to see through. Your destiny is foggy, but you have more work to do. So many more to send to their laughing place. Ski Mask is too close to Mona to swing the scythe, so he simply shoves the tip of the scythe into her carotid artery. At first a look of shock overcomes her face, but her expression quickly changes to joy once she realizes what happened, and she smiles. As blood rockets from her neck, she rests her hand on Ski Mask's hand. Her final words sound as if she's gargling, but Ski Mask understands them. Thank you. She falls to the floor and Ski Mask turns his attention to Stuart, who is gently crying tears of joy as he looks down at Mona and then around at the mangled congregation. So beautiful, mate. He looks to Ski Mask. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anything I can do to express my gratitude? Chapter 6 The Angel of Death Alfred and Franklin Grimm are surprised when they hear a knock on their door. This is their secret lab, after all. No one is supposed to know about it. Franklin looks up at the security monitor that reveals the identity of the mysterious knocker. It's him. Franklin hurries to the door and opens it. Ski Mask steps in, followed by a jolly fellow wearing a tuxedo. This is Stuart. Stuart holds up his hand in a wave and smiles gleefully. Good day, mates. You said all the animals you tested on before always had a total of nine lives. You assume it's the same with humans, but you don't have the evidence to be sure. Stuart here is going to help us find out. Stuart lies on the gurney. His tuxedo jacket is off. His shirt is unbuttoned. Several electrodes are placed on his chest with wires running to an ECG machine that is beeping in rhythm with his heartbeat. The sleeve on his right arm is rolled up. He looks at Franklin Grimm, who is holding a syringe. Will there be pain? Franklin shakes his head. No. Good. Not a big fan of pain. As Ski Mask talks to Stuart, Alfred and Franklin listen as he answers some of the questions they have wondered about. They are fascinated. You'll find yourself in a dark room. One side of the room will be a wall of beautiful light. You'll be tempted to enter the light. You need to hold off on that temptation for this experiment to work. Understand? Stuart nods. I won't fail you, mate. Eventually, on the other side of the room, two ovals will appear, and you'll be able to see us through them. Once the doc hits you with the renew er, uh, the lifeline, you'll be thrust toward the ovals and back here with us, okay? Alfred seems confused. Lifeline? Franklin nods. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about that later. 
Ski Mask looks seriously at Stuart. Ready? Stuart nods. Franklin injects Stuart. Stuart's eyelids grow heavy and close, followed by the flat line and steady tone from the ECG machine. Franklin pulls out the renewal device and Ski Mask holds up a hand. Give him a second to adjust to his surroundings. It's his first time there. Franklin looks at Alfred, who shrugs and then waits patiently for Ski Mask's approval, which comes in the way of a nod. Franklin places the device at the base of Stuart's skull, and within seconds, Stuart's eyes blast open, and he takes in a loud gulp of air. It takes him a moment to catch his breath. Holy dooly! Franklin smiles. Welcome to your second life. Oh, I've never seen black like that before. He looks at Ski Mask and grabs his hand. And that wall of light! Pure splendor! You ready for more? Please! Franklin injects him again and then revives him. Welcome to your third life. My god, the light! I can't explain the beauty. It's so bright, but it doesn't hurt my eyes. It soothes them. It soothes me. Okay, put me back. The process is administered again. Welcome to your fourth life. Alfred steps forward. How are you feeling? Good, fine, but I want to go back. Why is that? I want to see the light. When I look into it, all my worries disappear. I'm stripped down to pure joy. Nothing against you blokes, but I'm starting to get depressed when you bring me back. This is even knowing I won't be here long. Do you mean to tell me that you'd rather be dead than alive? Stuart leans in toward Alfred. You don't understand, mate. It's there that I'm alive. Alfred steps back and scratches his chin. He ponders as Franklin starts the process again. Proceeding, Franklin injects him once again and then revives him. Welcome to your fifth life. Thank you, mate. Your welcomes are appreciated. Franklin injects him again and then revives him. Welcome to your sixth life. How are you? Oh, physically, I'm fine. Mentally, I'm getting excited. About what? what? Not having to come back here? Franklin injects him again and then revives him. Welcome to your seventh life. Alfred speaks to Stuart with a curious expression. The light. You don't know what lies beyond it. Why aren't you afraid? Stuart smiles. Fear is an emotion I no longer have when I look into the light. He looks at Ski Mask. Is it that way for you too, mate? Ski Mask thinks a moment. I'm getting there. Franklin alerts Stuart. Okay, here we go again. Franklin injects him and then revives him. Welcome to your eighth life. Alfred moves closer to Stuart and speaks seriously. He's having a difficult time grasping Stuart's attitude. To clarify, given the choice of coming back here or going into the light, Stuart interrupts him. It's not even close, mate. It's not even close. One day you'll understand what I mean. Stuart looks back at Franklin. Keep it coming, mate. Franklin injects him again and then revives him. And finally, welcome to your ninth life. How are you feeling? Absolutely bonza. Franklin looks at Alfred and Ski Mask for some clarification as to what that means, but they both shrug. Stuart recognizes the confusion. Oh, sorry, mate. That's Australian for quite great. Franklin nods and speaks. Ah, well, if our calculations are correct, this is your ninth life. Your final life. After this, you won't be coming back. I like you blokes, I do. So don't take offense when I say, oh, I'm ready to enter the light. Okay. Ski Mask steps closer to Stuart. This is all in theory. If you can come back, come back. If you can't come back, be free to go into the light. I understand, mate. And since this will likely be it for me, I'd like the angel of death to do the honors. Franklin shrugs and hands the syringe to Ski Mask. I've never killed somebody like this before. Stuart smiles. So glad to have met you, mate. Stuart lies back on the gurney closes his eyes and smiles. My laughing place awaits. In Eternum. Ski Mask injects Stuart. The smile remains on his face as the ECG flatlines. 
Franklin administers the lifeline device, but there is no successful renewal this time. Stuart remains dead. Alfred lets out a breath. Nine lives it is, regardless of the life form. Ski Mask moves from the gurney and stands towering over the sitting Grimms. There's gonna be some new rules around here. Franklin and Alfred look at each other with confusion. Uh, new rules? What precisely do you mean? You won't be doing any further animal testing. Am I clear? Franklin scoffs. <laughs> no animal testing? Are you kidding? Ridiculous! <laughs> he lets out a laugh of absurdity. Ski Mask shouts at him. What the hell are you laughing about? Franklin jumps and is visibly shaken from the sudden rage coming from Ski Mask. I'm, I'm sorry. Don't you ever laugh at me in that condescending way again. Franklin nods quickly. Alfred, keeping cool, calm, and collected as usual, leans over and rubs his son on the shoulder to relax him. Alfred speaks calmly to Ski Mask. You've made yourself perfectly clear. Good! If I may ask, how do you expect us to continue conducting our experiments? I'm your answer to everything, Alfred. Ski Mask looks to Franklin and begins speaking to him sternly. You had no idea how lucky you were when you killed me. You reckless driving son of a bitch! Ski Mask starts pacing back and forth and slaps a nearby tray of medical tools scattering them across the floor. Franklin holds up his hands as he pleads with Ski Mask. I'm sorry. I am so sorry. Please shut up. Or do you want to patronize me again? I I'm sorry. I it, it won't happen again. As Ski Mask continues to pace, Alfred presents himself as the soothing voice of reason. Ski Mask, you'll have to forgive Franklin. We're all still getting to know each other. There will undoubtedly be occasional growing pains such as what we have experienced today. May I suggest that we all relax? We are a team, and we've had quite a breakthrough today. It's a day for celebration, not confrontation. This makes sense to Ski Mask. His pacing slows until he screeches a nearby chair closer to them and swings it around backwards. He sits down and rests his forearms on the back of the chair. Franklin speaks genuinely. I'm truly sorry. Ski Mask acknowledges him with a nod and then looks back at Alfred. I have a plan. Ski Mask's phone rings. He looks at the caller and sees that it's Tamale Jones. Ski Mask holds a finger up to the Grimms and answers the call. Tamale, the situation's been handled. It's all good. You do? Now? Okay, I'll be right there. He hangs up and addresses the Grimms as he stands. I have something to take care of, but I'll be in touch soon. Ski Mask exits the laboratory, and Franklin lets out a sigh of relief, as does his father. In the future, it would be wise not to make him angry. Chapter 7 Blood sucker. Ski Mask enters Tamale's office. Tamale is throwing an empty, greasy paper plate into a wastebasket. He is wiping his face with a napkin when he notices Ski Mask. Ah, there he is. Tamale brushes any remaining microscopic Tamale bits off his hands as he speaks. You said you were looking for a payload and didn't mind if the job wasn't exactly duck soup. He motions toward his client sitting in the chair across from his desk. This little daisy here is Leanna. Ski Mask looks at the client. She is thin-framed. He gauges her to be approximately five foot one in height. Her eyes are black like polished coal and stand out against her fair skin. Her corn silk blonde hair is tied up in a messy bun. Her attire is casual. A tan, loose chiffon, long sleeve blouse, a pair of army green chinos rolled halfway up her calves, and fluorescent yellow tennis shoes. The most unusual thing about this client? She is clearly no more than ten years old. Leanna rises from her chair and walks with confidence to Ski Mask. She fixes her eyes on him, almost as though she's staring straight through him. You have an aura about you. She pauses, closes her eyes, and takes in a breath. 
When she reopens her eyes, her expression holds a hint of uncertainty. Her thin lips pucker slightly as she concentrates. There's something about you that I can't quite place. It's not... ordinary. She studies him closely for another moment and then speaks assuredly. He'll do. Ski Mask watches as the dainty child ambles back to the front of Tamale's desk and delicately places herself into the chair. Ski Mask looks back and forth between the child and Tamale, confused. He shrugs slightly. So what's the job? Tamale moves in closer to Ski Mask and takes a moment before asking him the question. Do you believe in vampires? The End The Nine Lives of Ski Mask continues with Life for Vampires. The Nine Lives of Ski Mask, Life for Vampires. Chapter 1 Deep Cuts. I don't know how many times I've told you never to go into the East Wing. Ski Mask is furious. Never. Do you know what the concept of never is? Never means never. Pulsating veins can be seen throughout his reddened face. His eyes rage with anger as he continues shouting. It doesn't mean occasionally. It doesn't mean under certain circumstances. It means never. He begins pacing as he yells. Are you stupid? Are you? His fury-filled holler echoes throughout the main room. Clara winces with every word. Dempsey and Floppy have taken up refuge behind Claire's legs. Madeline and Max watch on, both whining slightly as Ski Mask's outburst continues. The rest of the dogs have cowered away into other rooms. What the hell am I going to do with you now? How can I trust you? He takes an aggressive step toward Claire, who starts backing up. Upon his movement toward Claire, Madeline's whine grows louder and then quickly transforms into a bellowing roar of a bark. Ski Mask stops in his tracks and looks back at Madeline. They lock eyes for a few seconds before Madeline backs down and whimpers loudly, which causes Ski Mask to relax. Now that the tension has decreased, Max feels comfortable letting out several yippy barks as a late backup gesture to Madeline. I'm sorry. Ski Mask turns and looks at Claire. She is shaking with fear as tears stream down her face. Her words are choppy as she speaks. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I was worried. I thought you might be in trouble. I'm so sorry. She bursts out crying, turns, and runs down the south wing corridor to the kitchen, followed by Dempsey and Floppy. Ski Mask lets out a breath and looks back at Madeline, who continues to whine softly. He approaches her and gives her a gentle pat on her big head. It's okay. Good girl. Her heavy tail begins to wag, knowing all is well between them now. He walks down the north wing toward his bedroom. He can see the silhouette of Slick in the doorway. Slick quickly runs deeper into the bedroom, out of sight, as Ski Mask approaches. When he enters the room, Ski Mask sees no dogs. Obviously, they're still frightened. He speaks in a gentle voice, but loud enough for them to hear him, wherever they are. Everything's fine, come on out. Slick, Trip, and Snowman all pop out from under his bed in the loft and race down the stairs. Ski Mask bends down and begins loving on all of them. Madeline and Max join in. It's okay. I'm not mad at any of you. I didn't mean to scare you. They dance around excitedly and begin to playfully wrestle with one another. Even Madeline joins in, but quickly yelps and limps away from the group after Slick puts too much of his weight on her. Careful with her. She's old. Ski Mask walks to Madeline and rubs her back hip. She shows her appreciation by giving him a face lick that nearly gives him whiplash. A rare sense of guilt comes over Ski Mask. He didn't like making Madeline upset or scaring the other dogs. And then there was Claire. He'd seen her cry before, but never in the fearful state she was in. Fearful of him. He rises and heads toward the south wing. Upon entering the kitchen, he is greeted by Dempsey and Floppy. He bends down and assures them that all is fine. He looks up at Claire, who is standing on an apple cart in front of the sink with her back to him. Listen, I'm sorry. 
I went overboard back there. Claire turns and faces him. Her face is beaming. She is clearly relieved, but it's something else that Ski Mask notices. Claire is holding a large knife. Her sleeve is rolled up and her arm is covered in blood. What the hell? Ski Mask hurries toward her. What did you do? Claire is confused at first, but then looks down at where his eyes have traveled and realizes what he is referring to. Oh no! No, it's not what you think. I'm not trying to commit suicide. What happened? I just cut myself. Ski Mask grabs her arm and inspects the large slice across the top of her forearm. He then notices several similar old scars in the same region. Intentionally. What? When I get really, really worked up about something, I cut my arm. It relaxes me. It relaxes you? She shrugs. Some people do yoga. I cut my arm. That's weird. She shrugs again. Ski Mask studies her for a moment and seems intrigued. Does it really help? For me, it does. I don't do it often. It's rare that my emotions ever get to the point where I feel the need to. But today was one of those days. Sorry. Claire looks up at him, and Ski Mask begins to lose himself in those bright, gentle eyes of hers. And for the briefest of moments, he gets the urge to wipe the drying tears from her face. His hand even begins to drift upwards before he quickly snaps himself out of it and steps back. He looks away from her, clears his throat, takes a deep breath, and moves on to a new subject. I'm going away for a little while on a job. Not sure how long it'll be. Claire smiles and nods. I'll take care of everything. Ski Mask turns and begins to exit the kitchen, but then stops and looks back at her. I know you will. He exits and heads back to his bedroom where he pulls a large travel bag out of a closet and begins placing a few items in it. The bag is already partially packed. Ski Mask travels often for various jobs and always has a bag mostly packed and ready to go in case something urgent comes up. After adding a few more items, he zips the bag up and takes a seat on his sofa in front of the aquarium. He relaxes watching the school of graceful elephant nose fish swim peacefully in their safe haven. Ski Mask looks down at Madeline, who has climbed up onto the sofa next to him. She lays her giant head on his lap. He rubs the back of her neck while he thinks back upon his unusual encounter earlier in the night. His encounter with a vampire. Chapter 2 Leanna A pure-line vampire known as Catherine has recently obtained a historic mansion. The location of the mansion is under tight wraps. I need you to acquire the location for me and then run interference while I unknowingly take possession of an item within the mansion. Ski Mask stares at the little girl with bewilderment. You're saying that you're a vampire? Leanna rolls her eyes as Tamale steps forward. I figured her for a screwball too until she- Before Tamale can finish his sentence, he is pinned against the wall by an invisible force, catapulted up to the ceiling, and suspended in midair. Oh, until she proved me otherwise. Ski Mask looks at Leanna, who is staring through him with her black eyes. Impressive for a little girl. Leanna scowls at Ski Mask. You have some nerve. Her black eyes glow as tension fills the room for a few seconds before she relaxes. But that might come in handy. Leanna looks up at Tamale and he is gently lowered back down to his seat. He lets out a nervous breath and adjusts his hat. Thanks. Leanna keeps her eyes fixed on Ski Mask. Are you satisfied? Sure. Are you up for the task? Sounds like a simple job. It's a suicide mission. Normally I would recommend a team of at least six people for such a mission in hopes that one member will live long enough to complete the assignment. Personally, I don't see how you can survive this undertaking alone, but Mr. Jones insists that you are... special. This Catherine, you say she's a pure line vampire? Born of two other vampires. Are you a pure line vampire as well? I am. You look young. 
A pureline vampire ages one year for every ten human years. So that makes you about 100? She smiles. Almost. Did you and Tamale talk compensation? We did. So while this job ain't exactly a breeze, we're talking a lot of Mazuma. Enough clams to make you pretty damn filthy rich. But like she mentioned, uh, odds are better than not that when it's all said and done, you'll be taking the big sleep. Tamale rises, walks to Ski Mask, and hands him a slip of paper. Ski Mask's eyes widen as he sees the figure scrawled across it. Do we have an agreement? Ski Mask nods. Leanna floats up from her chair and never touches the floor as she glides towards Ski Mask, maintaining eye level with him the entire way. Once she reaches him, she sustains her floating position and shakes his hand. What kind of object are you after in this mansion? That's my business. Focus on your business. Ski Mask shakes his head in frustration. Fine. You're an ornery sort, aren't you? I wouldn't consider myself ornery. That doesn't necessarily mean that's not the case. Tamale chimes in. Uh, you're a bit ornery. Ski Mask shoots Tamale a disapproving look. I'm sorry, but it's true. I agree with the vampire. Leanna glares at Tamale and hisses at him harshly. The vampire? Correct me if I misunderstood you, Mr. Jones, but did you just refer to me as the vampire? Tamale stammers nervously. I, 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 uh, I, I have a name. Tamale gulps. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Leanna's scowl transforms into a grin as she giggles. You should have seen your face. She points at Tamale and lets out a playful cackle. It's clear that neither Tamale nor Ski Mask find her joke amusing. She rolls her eyes a bit and shakes her head. So serious. Okay, back to business. She scribbles something down on a small piece of paper, folds it, and hands it to Ski Mask. That's an address. I'm going to set up an appointment for you tomorrow with a man named Mason. He and his albino sidekick make a handsome living from tracking the whereabouts and inner workings of the Pure Line vampire community. They'll have the information you seek. Contact me when your meeting concludes. She floats to the door and turns back to the two men before exiting. Good night, gentlemen. Chapter 3 Mason and the Albino the front door to the black, glassed building is flanked by two Mr. Universe bodybuilder types in tight black t-shirts. A stringy man in a suit stands before them and greets Ski Mask in a professional manner. We've been expecting you. He looks down at the small duffel bag that Ski Mask is carrying and nods to one of the muscle men who does a quick scan of the bag with a metal detecting wand. When the wand doesn't detect anything, the stringy man motions Ski Mask through the door. Right this way. The stringy man guides Ski Mask to an attractive woman in her late fifties wearing a dark dress suit. Belinda, this is the gentleman who has a scheduled meeting with Mr. Mason. Ski Mask follows Belinda up a wide staircase covered with red stair carpet. The staircase winds partially just before ending at the second floor landing. She leads him to a large golden double door which she opens. She motions for Ski Mask to enter the room and then casually shuts the door behind him. The room is dark with the only light emanating from a lamp on a desk about 30 feet in front of him. Behind the desk sits Mason, a man in his 40s wearing a black fedora with light gray trim. His mustache and sideburns are manicured in a gunslinger style that clashes with his Hawaiian shirt. Have a seat. The albino female standing menacingly behind Mason comes into view. Her straight white hair ends just before her shoulders. Her pants, boots, and fingerless gloves are solid black. The outfit is topped off with a long leather jacket. Her arms are folded and her pale bluish pink eyes stay fixed on Ski Mask as he sits down in one of the two chairs positioned in front of Mason's desk. Ski Mask glares back at the albino, 
Their eyes lock in a standoff for several seconds. Ski Mask reluctantly breaks his stare from the looming albino and gives his attention to Mason. There's a vampire named Catherine. Pure line vampire. They don't like to be referred to as just vampires. Fine, there's a pure line vampire named Catherine, and you want the location of her new mansion. Ski Mask reaches under his coat, causing the albino to move her hands under her jacket with blinding speed. She stops at that point, but is clearly ready to spring into action if Ski Mask makes any suspicious moves. Ski Mask smirks. Relax, albino. He slows his movement and removes a thick wad of cash tightly encased in clear plastic and tosses it on Mason's desk. And then another. And then another. Mason stares at the three large packs of money on the table, grins, and then moves his eyes to Ski Mask. You're working for Leanna, aren't you? Ski Mask doesn't respond. The question is rhetorical. Obviously, Mason knows. I'm afraid I can't help you. Ski Mask reaches into the bag, extracts another wrapped batch of cash, and tosses it onto the desk with the others. We've been paid handsomely not to divulge this information to anyone until after tomorrow, midnight. Come back then and we'll talk. I need the info now. Of course you do. Ski Mask takes one more bundle out of the duffel bag and slams it down onto the desk while staring at Mason. This merely amuses Mason. We're getting paid double whatever anyone else offers, so by all means, offer some more. Ski Mask stands and directs his gaze from Mason to the albino, who still stands in the ready position. His urge is to obtain the information with strong-arm tactics. He'd love to see what this albino brings to the dance. But Leanna was very clear that if they refused, he should just leave it at that and contact her. He continues to stare back at the albino for several long seconds before he speaks. I do have one question. The albino cocks her head slightly, knowing the question will be directed at her. Does the carpet match the drapes? The albino's pale eyes fill with rage, and she's clearly on the verge of making a move towards Ski Mask when Mason holds up his hand and she quickly regains her composure. Ski Mask snares before he turns and exits. Chapter 4, House of Albinos Per her instructions, Ski Mask meets Leanna at the top of a cliff overlooking a sweeping field. She stands at the edge of the cliff looking down. See those lights? Ski Mask takes a position next to her and notices what appear to be a row of hanging lights from poles. The poles line a walkway which leads to a door carved into the starting slope of a hill. The House of Albinos. It's an abandoned military base that the Albinos took possession of years ago and made a home out of it. The lack of pigmentation makes the Albino more difficult for us to sense, thus they're well suited for tracking. Albino animals may have a challenging time surviving in the wild, but this brood does just fine. Actually, as long as there are sufficient places to hide, carnivores seem to catch albino and common colored animals at approximately the same rate. Without appropriate hiding places, the albino may be more susceptible to attack, but sometimes predators will give them a pass, probably thinking they're too weird looking to eat. Leanna looks at Ski Mask. She seems impressed. Well, look at that big brain of yours. She looks back at the house of albinos. There are 12 of them. All albino siblings. Eleven males and one female. I believe you met her. Leanna reaches out. May I have your hand, please? Ski Mask takes a breath of annoyance and obliges her by holding out his hand. She takes it into hers, closes her eyes, and appears to mentally drift away for a moment. You two didn't quite hit it off, did you? She smiles. As expected. Leanna is about to release his hand and then gets a curious expression over her face. She squeezes his hand tighter and then opens her eyes and looks at him inquisitively while smiling brightly. Who is Claire? Ski Mask jerks his hand away and switches the dialogue back to the main topic. You knew damn well they weren't going to take that money. Why the hell did you bother sending me in there? 
You like to antagonize people, even when it's not in your best interest. Your charming personality has the albino prime for attack once she notices you on the premises. That will leave Mason alone and more vulnerable. Leanna fixes her gaze back on the entrance of the House of Albinos as she speaks. I have it on good authority that Mason and his sidekick are in the House of Albinos tonight. He has the location of Catherine's mansion on a tablet that he has on his person. I intend to gain possession of the tablet. You're a vampire. Kill him. Kill his bunny-eyed friend. Take the tablet. What do you need me for? Leanna is quick to correct him. Pure line vampire. I believe I mentioned to you that they make a living from their knowledge of the pure line vampire community. Who do you think their primary customers are? We are. If the albino is by Mason's side, I'll likely have to kill her to get to him, and I would hate to snuff out a worthwhile resource if it's not necessary. And that's where I come in. Leanna smiles. I'll do my part. She's formidable. She once killed a pure line vampire. A stupid, bumbling pure line vampire, but still, not an easy accomplishment. What about the other albinos? Her brothers are very protective and would come to her aid if alerted. It would be a serious issue if they were here. Leanna grins. Five are out of the country on legitimate cases. The other six I hired anonymously for a local job. It's a ploy, of course, and they should figure that out in approximately... She looks down at her Gucci wristwatch. Fifteen minutes? Let's move. Leanna and Ski Mask position themselves closer to the entrance. How do we get in? We don't. I do. And I'll be going right through the front door. I'll be tripping a slew of motion detectors along the way, but I'll be well inside the house before they go off. You just hustle down there and make sure you're close enough for the albino to see you. How the hell are you going to get in there before the motion detectors go off? Leanna looks at him with a sly grin. I'm fast. And just like that, she vanishes from in front of him. He can make out a slight blur racing down the pathway, followed by the door to the house of the albinos opening and closing. A few seconds later, sirens blare and multiple floodlights blast on. Ski Mask takes off toward the entrance. He reaches the pathway as the front doors open, and the albino female he met earlier steps out. She is scowling, and her pale eyes are filled with ferocity. Ski Mask's first instinct is to make a smart-ass comment about her genetic condition. The more angry he can make her, the more reckless she will be in the upcoming battle. But before he can do anything, both of her hands dive under her coat and withdraw two knives. She hurls the first one at him. Ski Mask barely raises his right hand up in time to stop the knife from slamming into his head and scrambling his brains. The knife penetrates through the back of his hand with the point of the blade stopping just inches from his eye. The second knife is already on its way. Ski Mask dodges to his left and can feel the air gust and the blade tip nicking his hair as it whizzes by his head. The albino steps forward and kicks over one of the path light poles. She picks it up, shakes the light off the top of it, and begins whirling the metal pole above her head with both hands as she sidesteps closer to Ski Mask. In a flash, she transitions to spinning the pole in front of her, making a pinwheel of blurs before sliding the pole into her right hand and freezing in a demonstrative stance. With her free hand, she motions for him to come forward and challenge her. This elaborate display of skills would be enough to intimidate most opponents, but Ski Mask rarely encounters a formidable opponent and welcomes the competition. He smiles at her while he slowly pulls the knife from out of his right hand. A blast of gunfire from within the house causes the albino to look back over her shoulder, but she realizes she must focus on her adversary who is now brandishing the knife in his left hand and moving toward her. Leanna is through the front door of the house of albinos in the blink of an eye. She takes position against a wall and leans her head in to take a peek into the next room. The room is an armory with a breathtaking variety of guns mounted to the wall. Leanna knows that some of the albinos, including the female, prefer blades and would imagine there is at least one room somewhere within this dwelling with a similar assortment of edged arsenal decorating the walls. Mason and the albino are standing in the center of the armory, but they are not preparing or discussing weaponry as one may expect in such a room. 
Leanna raises her eyebrows slightly when she sees Mason staring into the albino's blanched eyes. His hand is caressing her cheek. Leanna smiles, having had no idea that this duo had a romantic connection. When the alarms go off, they both turn their heads to a security camera and see Ski Mask running toward the house. The albino whispers to herself, Bastard. She takes off like a bolt toward the front door. Mason tries to stop her. Wait! Mason has a hunch that this is likely some kind of setup, but the albino is out of the room before he can get another word out. He begins moving forward, but stops in his track when he hears the voice. Hello, Mason. The voice comes from behind him. Without hesitation, Mason lunges toward the wall, removes a mini Uzi submachine gun, turns, and begins firing. Ski Mask moves swiftly forward and strikes with the knife, but the albino parries the attempt with the pole. He aggressively surges, slashing violently multiple times, but the albino rather easily deflects every blow. She is doing a masterful job at keeping her distance and using the length of the pole to her advantage. He continues his attempts to get inside, but to no avail. She continues to circle him and block every effort he puts forth. His frustration begins to show in his voice. Come on, you milky bitch! He rushes forward with a knife in a stabbing position. The albino counters by spinning the pole and slapping his wrist with the end, which sends the knife flying into the night. She immediately follows up with a hard strike to the side of Ski Mask's face, knocking him sideways and then strikes the other side which sends him reeling. She quickly jabs the end of the pole into his stomach multiple times, doubling him over, and then finishes the barrage with a swift strike to the back of the head that sends him crashing to the ground face first. Not letting up, she swings the pole sideways, hoping to land the finishing blow on his skull, but anticipating the deadly move, Ski Mask rises rapidly and jumps over the pole as it arrives. It is at this very moment when another wave of machine gun fire distracts the albino, causing her head to turn toward the front door. Taking her eyes off of him was just the mistake that Ski Mask needed, and he capitalizes by bull rushing her. She attempts to swing the pole, but he's gotten too far inside of her defenses for the blow to be effective. He wraps his arms around her and with all of his weight on top of her, slams her into the ground. Mason spins as he sprays bullets throughout the room aimlessly. He can't see Leanna, just an occasional blur as she attempts to outmaneuver the onslaught of bullets. He tries his damnedest to be unpredictable as he jerks his body in a range of directions and hopes to catch her off guard. It's his only chance. Leanna is slightly surprised by Mason's aggressive move. She expected to have a brief negotiation with him before he tried anything. This is exactly why he made the move he did. Unforeseen and wise. Dodging the bullets is no problem for Leanna. She whizzes around the room like a beam of light, always making sure she is behind Mason. He's doing an admirable job of pointing the gun around in an unexpected manner. Very smart, a good tactic but not good enough. Leanna makes a motion with her hand, and Mason is suddenly plastered face first against the wall. A few seconds later, against his will, his fingers uncurl from around the gun and it falls harmlessly to the ground. Leanna can see the tablet in the inside pocket of his jacket. She nods and it sails across the room into her hand. Now that she has what she came for, she releases Mason and he crumples to the floor. Thank you. Ski Mask is in a dominant position on top of the albino, but she is swift and able to contour her body enough to muscle into a standing position. But he still has the advantage. He wraps his hand around her throat and drives her back against the body of a gargantuan tree trunk. She grabs onto his forearm with both of her hands and tries to knee him in the groin, but she's losing energy fast, and he's too close to her for the blows to have enough momentum to sway him. Her pale face begins to redden as his hand constricts. Ski Mask can feel her beginning to go limp when he hears a loud crack behind him and a sharp pain in his right shoulder that causes him to wheel around. The albino falls to the ground, coughing, as Ski Mask sees Mason pointing a gun at him. Behind Mason, a black van pulls up and several albino males emerge and run toward him. They are irrelevant, though, because Mason has him lined up perfectly, and at any second, he expects the lights to go out. A massive gust of wind hits Ski Mask, and suddenly he's looking down at Mason and rising quickly. Mason looks up at him, readjusts his aim, and fires, 
But by this time, Ski Mask's distance is too far for Mason's shot to be successful. Ski Mask watches on as the brother albinos converge on their sister. She is now sitting up as they begin to assist her. He can see Mason lower his aim in defeat and turn his attention to his albino companion. Ski Mask continues to watch them all until they become ants underneath him. Within seconds, he is too far away to make out any of them at all. After a few moments, he begins to slowly descend, and he can now see that he is being cradled by Leanna. They reach the ground, and he observes that they are standing next to a lake. He can see subtle shimmering of ripples under the moonlight, and hear the passive sound of night insects as he slowly begins to get his bearings. What the hell just happened? I saved you. She holds up the tablet and smiles. Nice job. We make a good team. Ski Mask gazes out over the lake. In the distance, the loud splash of a fish breaking the surface can be heard. The meeting of the lake's edge rippling against the shoreline relaxes him. It's quite the peaceful scene. Ski Mask raises his gaze to the star-soaked sky. His drifting thought does not go unnoticed by Leanna. What are you thinking about? At first, Ski Mask doesn't respond. He continues to soak in the serene surroundings a moment longer before turning to Leanna. What's it like to live forever? I wouldn't know. You know better than I do. If you age one year for every ten human years, you may live to be 800, 900 years old. Possibly. That's forever to me. It's all perspective. Do you know how long a crane fly lives? About two weeks in total, no more than a few days as an adult. Leanna grinned, surprised and impressed with his knowledge of crane flies. Your lifespan is forever to a crane fly. Fair enough, but if you could extend your life, choose to have a second life and a third life, would you? And prolong what's next? Never. Ski Mask looks at her seriously. What is next? Leanna smiles, displaying her perfect white teeth. Something wonderful. Leanna studies Ski Mask as he looks back over the water and up into the sky. She notices his blood-soaked shirt around his right shoulder and motions to his arm. How is it? He attempts to lift his right arm, but can't. It's dead. Hmm. How about the left arm? He raises it. It's fine. She nods. Good enough. Now comes the hard part. Chapter 5. Suicide Mission The mansion is enormous. It's a breathtaking sight with meticulous features blending Romanesque and Italian influences. A prominent turret highlights the center of the structure, and the porch is lined with imposing columns. The surrounding nightlife is drowned out by the relaxing cascade of a nearby bronze fountain. The grounds are vast and well kept. The wide pathway is decorated with two rows of animal manicured shrubs, giving Ski Mask the feeling that he is being watched as he approaches the entrance. Upon arriving at the mansion, Ski Mask recalls Leanna being impressed by its age. Catherine is 350 years old, she said. Likely the same age as this mansion. Right off the bat, he knew that estimate was incorrect, but who is he to argue with a vampire? With closer inspection of the structure, Ski Mask would make the assessment that Catherine had at least 100 years on this particular structure. Leanna said that there would be no guard station anywhere on the grounds, and so far she is absolutely correct. They're expecting us, but that's not allowed. Whatever that means. He stops, takes his Ski Mask out from his back pocket, and pulls it down over his face before approaching the main entrance. The lock on the door is nothing elaborate, and he picks it easily. He opens the door wide, wanting to get a good look at the interior before entering. A gust of wind rushes in from behind, and he thinks he notices a blur move past him, but he can't be certain. Ski Mask strolls forward into the house. He isn't sure what to expect, but he's ready for something. 
he can hear the occasional drop of blood dripping off of his hand onto the floor. He had torn off a piece of his shirt and wrapped it around his knife wound, but by now it's completely blood-soaked and losing its purpose. The foyer is wide and composed of early 20th century decor. The deep red walls give the entrance a warm feel. Medleys of antique decorations are well placed throughout the foyer, giving the place a museum atmosphere. In the distance, his eyes lock onto a tapestry featuring a reproduction of a rather graphic oil painting by Jericho called Head of a Guillotine Man. At least my blood won't clash with the theme. Due to a combination of the hall being sparsely lit and being distracted by the impressive tapestry, Schemas doesn't notice the figure of the man at the bottom of the stairwell and is startled by the consecutive pops of three gunshots. None of the shots hit its target, and Schemas cones in on the thin old man who has to be well into his 80s as he steps into the light and fires off three more rounds, the final one hitting Schemas in his useless arm. The old man begins reloading his gun. Ski Mask realizes that the odds of him surviving another six shots is remote. He grabs a brass candlestick from a nearby table and hurls it at the old man. It hits him in the hand area, slowing him up just enough for Ski Mask to rush him and make impact just before the old man can snap the revolver's cylinder back in place. The old man falls backward. His head thuds against the hardwood floor, momentarily knocking him senseless. Before Ski Mask can turn, another man bursts onto the scene and slams the blade of a six-inch hunting knife into Ski Mask's right upper arm. The man withdraws the knife and quickly swipes at Ski Mask, missing his throat by mere centimeters. Ski Mask steps back to gauge his opponent. An average-sized man, who while no spring chicken, is at least 30 years younger than the old man. His eyes are dark and focused. Sensing that the man is about to lunge, Ski Mask readies himself, and when the man enters his range, Ski Mask kicks him squarely in the balls. He follows this up by kicking the knife out of his hands and then knocking him backwards with a kick to the chest. Ski Mask bends down and picks up the man's knife. His arm hurts like hell from the stab, but he can use it well enough to carve this guy up. Before Ski Mask can step forward, he feels a vice-like grip around his throat. He is thrust backward against the wall and then lifted several feet into the air. He looks down at his assailant. A thin woman with short blonde hair wearing a Japanese house jacket is holding him in the air and penetrating him with her deep blue eyes. The old man rises up with the help of his companion and they watch on as the woman, who remains emotionless, holds ski mask with one hand and removes his ski mask with the other. She studies his face closely and speaks. You have nice eyes. Ski Mask has to strain to respond. You have nice tits. The younger of the two men lunges forward in anger, but is held back by the old man. How many times do I have to tell you about remaining cool, calm, and collected? Nobody speaks to Catherine like that. And she'll take care of it. The younger man still has to be held back until Catherine addresses them. Leave us. The younger man stops and the old man ushers him away, leaving Catherine alone with their foe. Although her expression remains emotionless, she can't mask the rage filling her eyes. These two men mean something to her and she will exact revenge. There is clearly nothing Ski Mask can do about that. Ski Mask stares back at her. The intensity in his eyes can't match hers, but it's not for a lack of trying. She continues to study his face and then closes her eyes and breathes in deep. You're not the complete monster everyone thinks you are. You have a genuine care for your animals. Ski Mask begins to struggle. He is bothered by her insight into his feelings. And you care for someone else. A young lady. Ski Mask kicks fruitlessly and cuts her off before she can go any further. So you're 350 years old, huh? Bet you've sucked a lot of cock in those years. Her grip tightens, successfully eliminating his ability to speak further. Don't worry. I won't tell Claire about your feelings. But unfortunately, neither will you. Schemas was hoping she'd stop talking about him and his feelings. 
He was also hoping for some kind of emotional response from his crass remark. But Catherine doesn't give him the satisfaction, maintaining her stone expression as she plunges her right hand into his stomach and then thrusts upward. Ski Mask tries to grin at her, but the pain has reached such an excruciating level it comes across as a wince. He can feel her hand moving around inside of him, making some kind of soup out of his organs. If her goal is to make this as painful on him as possible, she's succeeding. Fortunately for Ski Mask, the torture only lasts a few seconds before his life expires. Catherine lets Ski Mask go, and his body plummets to the floor. After 350 years of life, not much surprises Catherine, but she is shocked when Ski Mask rises and beats a hasty retreat toward the front door. Ski Mask is inches from the front door when he feels his legs give out and finds himself face first against the floor. He attempts to stand, but an invisible force is pulling him back deeper into the house. Back to Catherine. Shit, it looks like I'm going to lose all of my lives in one night. Catherine holds her hand outward as she summons Ski Mask back into her grip. Once again, she holds him by the throat and holds him high into the air. She says nothing, but Ski Mask can tell by her expression that she is confused. Nonetheless, she pulls her hand, which is still dripping with his entrails, into a ready position and is about to impale him again when she hears Leanna's voice. Stop! Catherine holds her death blow, but continues to hold Ski Mask in place as she looks back over her shoulder at Leanna, who stands at the top of a staircase holding up a three-foot golden scepter sparkling with rubies and diamonds. She smiles. It's over. Catherine loosens her grip and drops Ski Mask to the floor. Chapter 6 Monster Bash The sight is nothing short of spectacular, something most people couldn't even imagine, let alone see. The extensive ballroom is elegantly fashioned with the most elaborate blown glass chandeliers he's ever seen. They line the ceiling, each giving the appearance of a bursting ball of fire frozen in mid-explosion. There are rows of decorative columns on each side of the room. Young women are strapped to each column. They are alive, but extremely groggy, as if sedated. As enormous as it is, the room can barely fit the majority of guests who occupy it. Ski Mask assumes the majority of them are pure line vampires, since so many are frequenting the tied-up girls and drinking directly from their bodies. As he gazes across the extensive ballroom, he notices that vampires come in a variety of shapes and sizes. The assortment of attire is something that piques Ski Mask's interest. With one quick glance across the room, he can identify a sari, a hanfu, multiple kaminos, a seraphan, lederhosen, several kilts, what he's pretty sure is a Scandinavian gaki, a few dashikis, and even one vampire wearing a traha de lusis, which most would only expect to see on a matador. Ski Mask's gaze stops when he sees the younger of the two men he fought earlier. He has cleaned up since the skirmish. His hair is slicked back and he is wearing a nice black button-up shirt, but is still seething. He stares daggers at Ski Mask from across the room. Ski Mask locks eyes with him for a few moments until he is distracted by a voice next to him. Ten years ago, I would have hit the bullseye with all six of those shots. I'm getting old. The old man is dressed for the occasion as well, wearing a suit and jacket. He holds out his hand. I'm Lee. Ski Mask nods and shakes his hand. Lee motions toward his companion. You'll have to forgive my apprentice, Jack. He can hold a grudge. Insults hurled at Catherine aren't taken lightly by either of us, but he sure has a knack for holding on to negative emotions longer than one should. He's in his fifties, but he's still learning. He's a fantastic apprentice. I really couldn't ask for anyone better. It's nice to have someone you can count on. That statement makes Ski Mask stop and think of Claire. His thoughts linger on her longer than he thinks they should, so he changes the subject. So what the hell happened tonight? 
Leanna didn't explain? Ski Mask shakes his head. Oh, that's right. It would be against the rules. Rules? You took part in a ritual tonight. It's Leanna's 100th birthday. When a pure line vampire reaches triple digits, they are presented with a quest to find the 100 year scepter. They are only given the name of an elder pure line vampire who will possess the scepter. Catherine was drawn as the possessor for Leanna. Leanna had a small window to determine the location of the scepter and then 24 hours of her triple digit birthday to obtain it. Catherine was guarding the scepter. Caretakers are allowed to assist, so we were monitoring the rest of the mansion. Once you put us in harm's way, Catherine intervened, leaving the scepter unattended long enough for Leanna to retrieve it. He drops his head in shame. We failed Catherine tonight. We proved to be her weakness, and Leanna exploited that. It was clever. You came through for Leanna. I hope she paid you well. Ski Mask acknowledges his lofty payment with a nod and goes back to gazing about the room. Quite the scene, isn't it? I can honestly say I've never seen anything like it. These don't happen often. I'm 86 years old and I've never seen one of these before tonight. Well, you're obviously not one of these vampires. Lee corrects him. Pure line vampires. No, I'm not. I'm Catherine's caretaker. Jack there is my apprentice. What do you do? We assist Catherine in her day-to-day life. I imagine she can take care of herself just fine. Lee chuckles. <laughs> You'd be surprised. The life of a pure line vampire is complex, and while she is powerful, she can't be everywhere at once. It's nice to have assistance to help. Ski Mask's mind drifts to Claire and how much she does for him. Sometimes he begins to wonder what life would be like without her, but he always pushes that thought from his mind before it can properly manifest. It's not a thought he wants to have. Yes, it is. Lee nods and is about to walk away when Ski Mask asks him a question. How long have you been doing this? Since I was 13 years old. 13? Have you ever regretted making that decision? Lee doesn't hesitate when he answers. Never. Not for one second of my life. I love Catherine. I've always loved her. To spend your entire life with someone you love, isn't that what it's all about? Lee gives Ski Mask a pat on the back and walks deeper into the room. Ski Mask watches him as he mingles with a few others, but his mind stays on Lee's question. Is that what it's all about? His thought is interrupted by the squeal of a microphone. Someone on a stage at the back of the room begins to speak. Thank you, one and all, for attending the 100-year birthday bash for our guest of honor, Leanna. The speaker holds for the long round of applause to diminish. Not only has she reached triple digits, but she is one of only seven Pureline vampires in the last thousand years to successfully retrieve the 100-year scepter. The crowd erupts and looks up as Leanna floats effortlessly above them and quietly places herself at the center of the stage and speaks into the microphone. Thank you, Pure Lines. I'm honored to have you all here tonight to help me usher in my triple digits. It was a privilege to participate in the Scepter Quest, and I could not have achieved victory without my partner in crime who survived the night. I affectionately refer to him as Ski Mask. He's in the back of the room. Give him a hand. He's shy. The room erupts in ovation as the pure line vampires turn to look at Ski Mask. Lee moves close to Ski Mask and points at him so that all in the room know exactly who Ski Mask is. Ski Mask stands stationary, astonished by the reception. He looks around at the cheering crowd. Several of the pure line vampires near the stage float upward to get a better view of him. Everyone appears to be commending Ski Mask, with the exception of Jack, who continues to stare at him with pure hatred. Ski Mask begins to feel uncomfortable with the attention. He gives a quick courtesy wave to the mass in hopes that will bring the applause to an end. As hoped, it quickly diminishes to a smattering and the attendees go back to their mingling. Ski Mask turns when he hears the voice behind him. Why aren't you dead? 
Catherine's gaze is cold, and he can still see a touch of ire in her eyes. There is nothing pleasant about the energy she is putting forth. Before he can respond, Leanna appears next to him. He doesn't divulge his secrets. For example, he's not anxious to tell me about Claire. This perks Catherine's curiosity. You sensed her too. Leanna nods while Ski Mask shakes his head. You know what? You pure line vampires are meddlesome. I think I'm ready to go. Thank you, Ski Mask. Leanna floats up to meet him at eye level and gives him a tender kiss on the cheek. I'm proud of you. Ski Mask nods and chuckles to himself at the motherly feeling he just received from a girl with the appearance of a ten-year-old. As the pure line vampires watch him walk out of the ballroom into the night, Catherine speaks. You may want to consider him for a caretaker. Leanna shakes her head. His heart lies elsewhere. Chapter 7 Home Again The sun has risen by the time Ski Mask approaches the entrance to his home. The pure line vampires were insistent that he had feelings for Claire, but he never thought about her in that way. She's an employee, someone who works for him and takes care of things for him. She's nothing more than that. He kept telling himself that over and over, even though he couldn't help but wonder how she was doing while he was away, and that he was looking forward to seeing her more than usual. Ski Mask enters his home and is surprised to find himself smiling as he sees Claire rise from the couch and approach him. But she's not smiling. She's not happy. She seems sullen. Something is wrong. Ski Mask's smile disappears as he grows concerned. What's wrong? Claire clears her throat and lets out a deep breath. Tears are welling up in her eyes, and her voice is choppy when she speaks. It's Madeline. The End The Nine Lives of Ski Mask continues with Life 5, Medusa. The Nine Lives of Ski Mask Life 5 Medusa Chapter 1 Madeline Ski Mask runs down the north wing corridor to his bedroom. Madeline is sprawled out on the floor. Max is lying next to her, using one of her arms as a pillow. She tries to lift her head, but is unsuccessful. Instead, she just whimpers and manages to wag her thick tail. Ski Mask rushes to her side and lifts up her head. He looks into her foggy eyes and rubs her snout. My poor baby. She stares at him and whimpers again. I'm here. It's gonna be okay. He rubs her head and gives her a kiss on the nose, causing her tail wagging to increase. Do something for her! Do something for her! He looks back at Claire and sees a tear rolling down her cheek as she shakes her head. I'm sorry. I've done everything I can. He looks back at Madeline. The life in her eyes appears to be flickering on and off. No. No! This isn't happening. Not today. He wraps his arms around her mammoth body and looks up at Claire. Help me pick her up. A constant cloud of dust lingers behind Ski Mask's truck as he flies down the gravel road. He looks over his shoulder at Claire in the back seat, who is cradling Madeline and stroking her head. How's she doing? Claire is remaining strong, but can't conceal the concern from her expression. The same. Ski Mask presses the accelerator to the floor. Chapter 2 Jack Frost Ski Mask pulls up to the Madisonville Psychiatric Hospital and is surprised to see the buzz of activity. 
A cluster of news vehicles have clogged the entire front circular driveway. Swarms of media members congest the main entrance. Several police officers and security guards are attempting to maintain some kind of order, but are largely unsuccessful. What is going on? Schemas takes a scan of the area and then looks back at Claire. Wait here. Schemask bolts from the car. He quickly assesses that he has no chance to enter through the overrun main entrance and ducks around the building to a small side entrance. Several media members are trying to enter through there as well. Schemask shoves his way through the mass of people, hurling several of them to the ground and in no time reaches the security guard who is manning the door. Where's Dr. Grimm's office? I'm sorry, this is employee entry only. You have to go around to the main entrance. They'll help you there. Schemas smashes his forearm into the security guard's throat and pins him against the wall as he snaps open a knife and holds it inches from the guard's face. Where is Dr. Grimm's office? The security guard pants and speaks quickly. Uh, fourth floor, room 438. Schemask removes the walkie-talkie and the gun from the guard's belt. He slams the walkie to the ground, shattering it in pieces, and roughly pushes the guard aside before disappearing into a nearby stairwell. The stairwell is busy. Several different hospital personnel rush back and forth, including some security guards who rush past him, not even giving him a second glance. Either they are completely frazzled by the magnitude of the clearly unexpected chaos, or they are simply inept. Likely both. Obviously something major has happened, but Schemas doesn't care what it is as long as he can find Franklin Grimm. He reaches the fourth floor and is faced with a large, authorized personnel only sign. He tries the door, but it's locked. Luckily for him, some random person in a lab coat hustles through the door past him. Schemas catches the door before it closes and enters the fourth floor. He notices a security station next to the entrance, but it's unmanned. Schemas shakes his head at the incompetence he's witnessed in the few minutes he's been here. Schemas marches down the hectic corridor past a variety of people. He sees a thin red-headed man in scrubs calling out to Dr. Lewis as he runs down the hall. He stops at a woman in her forties with short brown hair wearing a doctor's jacket and holding a clipboard. Dr. Lewis, have you seen Dr. Grimm? She shakes her head. No, his office door is locked. I don't know where he is. The redhead panics. The hospital is about to be overrun by the press. He has to make some kind of statement. Things are out of control. Ski Mask hurries past them and is troubled by how many other people he overhears asking about Dr. Grimm's whereabouts. Time is of the essence. He needs to find Dr. Grimm. Schemas takes notice of the doctor walking toward him who stands out from the crowd. He's a burly man with white hair and a thick white mustache. While most everyone else is anxious, this man holds a smirk on his face and appears subtly cheerful. Schemas looks down at the doctor's name tag that reads Dr. Clark. He can overhear Dr. Clark speaking to a colleague. He speaks in a near gleeful tone. This could ruin him. Dr. Clark is not watching where he is going, and his shoulder bumps Ski Mask. He barks at Ski Mask in a testy manner. Watch where you are going. Dr. Clark looks at Ski Mask with disgust, as if he were some kind of lowly peon, before continuing on with his colleague. Ski Mask files the name in the back of his mind and continues to Dr. Grimm's office. The chatter he overheard is confirmed. Dr. Grimm's office is indeed locked. He can hear the phone continuously ringing behind the door. He bangs on the door, but there is no reply. He pounds on it again, but there is no response. Grimm, open this damn door right now! Schemas steps back and gives the door a kick, and another, and another. The door finally swings open. Dr. Grimm's secretary, Gloria, cowers behind her desk as Ski Mask bursts into the secretary's portion of Dr. Grimm's office. Where is he? Gloria, who is making no attempt to answer the phone that is ringing off the hook in front of her, takes in a breath and speaks calmly. He's not in. Ski Mask approaches the attached office door to the right of the room and turns the knob, which is locked. He's not in. If you leave your name, I'll have him contact you as soon as he's able. Schemas turns and glares at Gloria. He speaks slow and distinctly. Buzz. Me. In. 
The haunting look Gloria is receiving conveys the fact that if she doesn't do as requested, this could very well be the final day of her life. She can't hit the buzzer fast enough. Ski Mask enters Dr. Grimm's office and slams the door behind him. Dr. Grimm, who is sitting behind his desk, staring out the window at the growing mass of unwanted humanity, startles and spins around. Ski Mask! What the hell is going on around here? Why are you locked in your office? You haven't heard? Heard what? About the escape! The serial killer Jack Winters, better known as Jack Frost. He escaped today. I'm not surprised your security here is a joke. Dr. Grimm looks out the window at the onslaught of reporters. These vultures want my scalp. Forget about that. I need your help. It's Madeline. Madeline? My St. Bernard. She's dying. I want you to give her a lifeline. Dr. Grimm looks at Ski Mask as if this request is preposterous. Are you out of your mind? If you haven't noticed, this isn't the greatest time for me. Ski Mask walks in a deliberate fashion behind the desk. Dr. Grimm rolls his chair backwards away from Ski Mask until he halts at the wall. Ski Mask moves his face closer to Franklin. This is not a request. Dr. Grimm holds his hands up. Okay, okay, I'll help. I'll bring her up. Well, I don't have the equipment here. Everything's at the lab. I, I don't know when I'll be able to get out there again. Now. We are going there right now. Dr. Grimm stands and begins to pace back and forth as he rambles. No, I, I, I can't. They'll rip me apart. Don't you understand? A notorious serial killer escaped from my institution. I could lose my job. Franklin, I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. We are leaving now. Dr. Grimm's mind is elsewhere. This job means everything to me. Ski Mask grabs him by the jacket and presses him against the wall. You're not going to have a life, let alone a job, if you don't come with me right now. Okay, okay. Ski Mask lets him go. Dr. Grimm looks flustered. What am I going to do? How am I going to get out of here? His eyes begin darting around the room as he calculates his next move. Suddenly, he rockets toward the door. I'll meet you at the lab. Dr. Grimm sprints out of his office past his secretary who calls for him, but he doesn't slow down. Ski Mask moves to the secretary's door, peers down the corridor, and observes Dr. Grimm running past his subordinates. Many who are calling out to him are stating, there he is. Ski Mask watches as a panicked Dr. Grimm exits the floor via the stairwell. Ski Mask shakes his head. Fool. Chapter 3 Conflict Dr. Grimm helps Ski Mask and Claire set Madeline on a steel gurney inside the Grimm's lab. Her breathing has become extremely labored and her eyes have glassed over. Dr. Grimm listens to her heart with a stethoscope. Her heartbeat is extremely weak. He takes the stethoscope out of his ears and looks solemnly at Ski Mask. I'm afraid she won't last much longer. Ski Mask grabs Dr. Grimm by the coat. Do something! Claire attempts to pull him back. Calm down. Help her! She has to pass first. And then I'll bring her back. Ski Mask takes in a few breaths and releases his grip on Dr. Grimm. Claire rubs Ski Mask's back and consoles him as he looks mournfully at Madeline. Her eyes have closed now and her breathing is deep and slow. Ski Mask whispers to Madeline. It's gonna be okay, baby. We'll make you feel all better. Madeline lets out a slow, wheezing breath and doesn't take one back in. Madeline? She is no longer breathing. No. Dr. Grimm listens to her heart with the stethoscope, looks at Ski Mask, and shakes his head. Ski Mask drops his head down onto Madeline's body. My baby. My sweet baby. He looks up at Franklin. Fix her. Dr. Grimm takes out his revival device. He presses a button and the tip glows red. Ski Mask opens Madeline's eyes with his fingers and speaks to her. I'm right here, Madeline. Claire watches on with bated breath as Dr. Grimm places the tip of the device to the base of Madeline's skull. I'm right here. Claire grips onto Ski Mask's forearm as she watches. Madeline doesn't move. She shows no signs of life. Her lungs are still. Her mouth is open and her tongue lies lifelessly on the cold metal of the gurney. 
Ski Mask begins to panic, looking back and forth rapidly between Claire and Dr. Grimm. What's wrong? Why isn't anything happening? A cough stops Ski Mask in mid-sentence. At first, he thought it was Dr. Grimm, but Dr. Grimm is looking at Madeline and smiling. Another cough, and another, followed by Madeline quickly rolling from her side to her belly and lifting her big fat head up. She looks around the room and her eyes fill with enthusiasm when she sees Ski Mask. She jumps down off the gurney with the ease of a jaguar. She looks at Ski Mask and lets out several playful barks. Her tail is a blur from the speed of her wagging. She lowers the front of her body while keeping her haunches up in the air and lets out a playful growl before launching forward and running around the lab like a puppy. She grabs a box of latex gloves off the shelf and shakes them like a rag. She barks again and runs to Ski Mask who bends down and closes his eyes as he hugs her tight. She responds by nearly licking his face off and then prances to Claire who loves on her as well. Ski Mask, still kneeling, places his hands over his face. After a moment, he drops his hands and looks up at Dr. Grimm. He stares at him briefly and then propels forward toward him. Dr. Grimm backpedals but cannot escape the massive bear hug Ski Mask lays on him. Dr. Grimm is shocked and looks as such during the duration of the hug. Ski Mask then places his hands on each side of Dr. Grimm's face and plants a big smacking kiss on his cheek. He looks him directly in the eyes and speaks firmly. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you're, you're welcome. Now I want you to implant her with an auto-regenerating chip. What? These aren't Tic Tacs that you can just toss around willy-nilly. These are sophisticated pieces of hardware. I don't think you realize the amount of time it takes to complete one of these. He stops when he sees the seriousness of Ski Mask's expression. But this isn't a request, is it? Ski Mask shakes his head. Okay, but you owe me. Ski Mask nods and Dr. Grimm collapses into a chair. Now that this ordeal has been dealt with, his mind refloods with the escape. He drops his head into his hands and shakes his head as he speaks. I'm ruined. Ski Mask looks back at Madeline, who is getting her belly rubbed while being baby-talked from Claire. He pulls up a chair next to Franklin. What happened? Jack Winters escaped. Have you heard of him? I remember something about him. A Jack the Ripper type, right? Killed a bunch of whores? Uh, right. Ski Mask shakes his head with disgust. Pathetic. Mommy issues. <laughs> That's putting it mildly. How do you escape? Well, somehow, someone screwed up the paperwork and security let him out as part of a field trip group. Once off the grounds, it was easy pickings for him. Nobody dangerous was supposed to be with that group. They were supposed to spend the morning at a park. Security was light. He killed the guards, the doctor, the other patients, and waltzed away. Who made the escape public? Well, I did. I was hoping he could find him before he got far. And that was your first mistake. You should have called me. I could have tracked him down, subdued him, and brought him back. Nobody would have known a thing. You'd still catch some heat for your field trip group getting slaughtered, but it wouldn't be to the extent you're feeling right now. Hell, if I had enough time, I could have made it look like the group was killed in a crash. <laughs> what? what? Really? You think you could have done all that? Ski Mask grins. Piece of cake. Who's your head of security? Uh, well, his name is Stan Walters. He's a bungling twit. Just inherited a bunch of land and is always going on about wanting to start some kind of hiking company. His head is always in the clouds. I, I should have fired him years ago. Perfect. He'll be your scapegoat. Get rid of him. Deflect most of the responsibility onto him and weather the storm. It may be rough for you in the short run, but eventually this will blow over. Dr. Grimm's mind drips off. As the plan Ski Mask laid out for him begins to make sense, he starts to nod. Uh, yes, yes, I, I, I think you're right. I think I may be able to survive this, but who will I get as my new head of security? Ski Mask holds his arms out and winks. I owe you, right? A sense of relief washes over Franklin's face. Alfred quickly enters the lab. Franklin, I just heard about the escape. Are you okay? Franklin nods and smiles. Y yes, I'm, I'm going to be just fine. Is there anything I can do? Thank you, but I have it all under control. Alfred turns to Ski Mask. I'm glad you're here. Your requirement that we no longer use animals for experimentation has our development at a standstill. 
we must continue our work. In addition to that, I have many questions for you about your experience with the autoresponder chip so that we can continue to make progress. Alfred, I am the answer to all your problems. Come back to my place with us. I'll show you what I mean. Alfred seems encouraged and nods. All right, let me have a few words with Franklin. I'll be out your way shortly. Ski Mask looks to Franklin. Tell him how to get there. As Franklin takes Alfred's phone and enters the coordinates, Ski Mask opens the door to the lab. Come on, girl! Madeline friskily runs out the door, followed by Ski Mask and Claire. After the door shuts, Alfred turns to Franklin. You look better than I was expecting. Franklin points to the door Ski Mask just walked through. That guy is something else. He is quite the specimen indeed. Alfred studies Franklin for a moment. I must say, I was expecting you to be more unhinged than you are. <laughs> Disappointed? Alfred is offended. How dare you? Of course not. I'm pleasantly surprised at how well you seem to be holding up. Well, it's, it's an unfortunate situation, but I'll get through it and come out on the other side a wiser man. Alfred nods. That's quite the admirable attitude. He pats Franklin on the arm. I'm proud of you. Franklin rolls his eyes. But, but, you don't need to be working in that stressful environment. This project we are immersed in will change the world. It will change our lives as we know it. It will change everyone's lives. And quite frankly, it's a lot more important than overseeing the wasted lives at that madhouse you spend most of your existence at. I love what I do. Why, why can't you understand that? You only see what you want to see, but you never bother trying to see things from my perspective. I'm in charge there. I run the game. Everybody looks up to me. I'm respected. I'm revered. You want to be godlike? What could be more godlike than giving back life? And who will be more revered than those who created this possibility? When you ran that hospital and I was rising up the ranks, I was never given the respect I deserved. Even though I worked my ass off and earned everything I ever got there, it was always assumed that Daddy was giving me a leg up the entire time. When you retired and I took over, that all changed. Sure, most thought I got the job because of whose son I was, but what no one could deny is that I turned that place around on my own after you left. And that was me. It was all me. That hospital is me. Everything that is accomplished there is because of me, not you, and not because I'm your son. I'm tired of living in your shadow. Have you lost your mind, Franklin? Have you gone mad? Don't you realize this is the same situation? Yes, I may have invented this technology, but I don't have many years left. <laughs> don't have many years left? Are you serious? We both know that as soon as you study ski mass further and determine that it's absolutely safe to do so, you will implant yourself with the lifeline and I'll be living in your shadow for the rest of my life. No, Franklin. I'll make sure that we are equal partners and that we get equal credit. I'll even give you more credit. More than I deserve? That's not what I meant. <laughs> but it's true. This is your invention. I'm just some damn sidekick. I'm your Igor. Franklin. No, I'm through talking about this altogether. Alfred lets out a defeated breath. We'll revisit this discussion when you're in a more stable state of mind. He stares at his son for a moment, turns, and exits the lab. Chapter 4 Something New When they open the door to the house, Madeline bolts in and starts running around the main room in circles, burning off some of the energy that she hasn't experienced in years. When she finally slows down, the other dogs all encircle her and sniff at her. Slick and Trip are both beamed in the head multiple times by Madeline's hefty wagging tail. Max begins jumping joyously as he tries to lick Madeline's snout. During the excitement, Floppy and Dempsey begin wrestling with each other, and this continues as they run down the north wing toward the bedrooms. After thoroughly inspecting Madeline, Snowman lies down and rests while viewing the surrounding excitement. Ski Mask looks at Claire, who is smiling and occasionally laughing while she watches the dogs. She has no idea how close Ski Mask is to looking at her soft skin, her lips, 
her eyes. When she finally realizes he is looking at her and turns her head, Ski Mask quickly moves his eyes as if he were caught doing something he shouldn't have been. This makes Claire smile. I never got to ask you how your trip went. It was successful. Claire smirks as she sarcastically asks the next question. Did you die again? Yes. Claire's eyes widen. I was kidding. Did you really? Yep. What happened? Ski Mask is visibly apprehensive to divulge specifics, and Claire recognizes this. It's okay. You don't have to tell me. Claire grins and ponders a moment. You know, you're kind of like a superhero. That's bullshit. Your language. Sorry. Bull crud. I'm no hero. She gazes at Madeline, who is now cuddled on the floor with Max. You were today. Claire and Ski Mask look at each other, friendly casual at first, and then their eyes lock. Neither would admit that the look is anything other than innocent, but their eyes betray them, as does the length of their stare. The loud beep of an alarm breaks their focus and Ski Mask glances at the security monitors. It's Alfred. He looks to Claire. Buzz him in, will ya? Claire goes to the intercom panel and gives Alfred the instructions on how to enter. Ski Mask looks down the west wing and then back at Claire. After Alfred leaves, if you want to sit with me and the birds, I'll tell you what happened on my trip. If you'd like to know. Claire is overjoyed. I do. I'd really like that. Alfred knocks on the door. Slick immediately runs to Claire's side as she opens it. The other dogs look up attentively, waiting to see if Slick will need any assistance. Sorry for the delay. Scarface and Darkness trot to Alfred, sniff at his ankles, and then aggressively begin rubbing their heads and bodies against his calves. Oh, cats. I'm not a big fan of... Claire quickly shakes her head and motions back to Ski Mask. Alfred catches her drift. Hello there, kitties. He looks at Slick, who is sizing him up. Hello, puppy. Alfred pats Slick on the head and looks up at the main room of Ski Mask's dwelling. My god, Ski Mask, this place is incredible. I think you'll be even more impressed by the East Wing. Come on. Ski Mask motions Alfred to the East Wing and they walk down the corridor to the door. Before punching in the code to open the door, Ski Mask looks back at the empty corridor behind him. Wait here, I'll be right back. Ski Mask walks to the end of the corridor to the main room to find Claire staring at the corridor. He walks closer to her. Do you want to come with us? Claire's eyes widen and she doesn't hesitate to answer. Yes. Ski Mask waves her on. When they reach the end of the East Wing corridor, Ski Mask punches in the code to the door and they follow him down to the stone stairs. Ski Mask stops at the accordion folding gate. He flips a fake stone on the wall that reveals another keypad. Before entering the code, he addresses Alfred and Claire. You have to enter the code to open this gate. He looks directly at Claire. If for some unlikely reason this gate is unlocked, you still have to enter the code. If anyone passes beyond this gate without entering the code, booby traps are activated throughout the entire East Wing. Is that clear? Alfred and Claire both nod, and Ski Mask enters the code which automatically folds the gate to the side. Welcome to the East Wing. Ski Mask guides them through a myriad of twists and turns, leading them down one passage to another before finally stepping into a large room. Alfred is overwhelmed by the size of it. My God! The room is provided with a variety of counters, cabinets, and shelving units. There are four prong industrial electrical outlets every four feet. There are multiple sinks and affixed island tables. Fluorescent lights line the ceilings, but there are also several large dome exam crane lights that can be pulled down and adjusted to one's preference. Eight small jail cells make up one entire wall. Each cell is furnished with cots, toilets, and the walls are equipped with various restraints. Ski Mask leads them to a room off the back of the lab. He opens the door and flicks on the lights, revealing a cozy, furnished, one-bedroom apartment. Alfred walks through the apartment. He then wanders back out into the lab and starts turning around, taking it all in. It's perfect. Absolutely perfect. This is your new lab. Alfred turns to Ski Mask. His mouth is agape. I really don't know what to say. Thank you. Ski Mask nods. I'll be much more productive in this setting. He takes in a breath. 
Unfortunately, I'll be slowed by the increasing absence of my son. That damn hospital continues to soak up all of his time. Claire steps forward. First of all, watch your language in this place. Secondly, I can help. She may have spoken too soon and looks to Schemas to interpret his reaction. He appears neutral, which is probably a good sign. I mean, the animals keep me busy, but when Schemask is home, I have a lot of time on my hands and I'm curious to learn more about all of this. Alfred studies her for a moment and slowly nods. I think you can be of great assistance to me. Groovy! Schemask speaks as he walks toward the door. Claire follows him. We'll leave you to get a better feel for the place and let your wheels spin as to how to best utilize it. If you ever need me or Claire, there are intercoms by the main doors of every room. Alfred nods as he almost giddily wanders through his new lab. Schemask and Claire exit and walk a considerable distance down one of the passageways before either of them speak. I have to ask, the cells, the booby traps, the freezer, the bodies, this whole underground fortress? Don't ask questions you don't want to know the answers to. But I want the answers. They exit the passage into a large corridor that Ski Mask would refer to as the main corridor. Maybe I can assist you in other ways other than just helping to take care of the gang. Ski Mask shakes his head. You have no idea what you'd be getting into. Claire stops, and in turn, Ski Mask stops and faces her. I can handle it. Ski Mask studies her face. She is serious, but this is a big step. Something he's never even considered. An assistant? Before he can say anything, his phone rings. He holds up his finger to Claire as he answers it. Even though the phone is pressed against Ski Mask's ear, Claire can still make out the frantic voice of Dr. Franklin Grimm. Ski Mask, I need your help! What is it? There's been another escape! Two escapes in one day? You have to be kidding. No, I'm not! Something is wrong out there. You're goddamn right something is wrong, and I'll tell you exactly what it is. My head of security is a mental midget. He is the definition of ineptitude. Will you calm down? Who else knows about this? Nobody. Nobody. I did just like you said. I called as soon as I discovered the escape. Good boy. I'll get in touch with my people and we'll find your escapee. What's their name? Chapter 5 Medusa Ski Mask and Claire stand in Tamale Jones' office. She goes by the moniker of Medusa. One reason, because of this skirt's hairdo. It's one of those dreadlock get-ups. The way she fashions it makes it come across as a head of snakes. Two, because she has a fascination with, you guessed it, snakes. They say one of the scale's turn-ons is to get the old heave-ho while covered in poisonous snakes. Venomous. What's that? You said poisonous, you meant venomous. Ah, uh, there's a difference? Venom is injected directly, such as a snake bite. Poison is a toxin spread via ingesting or merely by touch. Think poison ivy. Okay, so she likes to be covered with venomous snakes when she's having a blanket party. Either way, this is one crazy Jane. Claire lets out a short sign of relief, causing both Ski Mask and Tamale to look at her obviously wondering why. She recognizes this and explains. I was relieved because I thought you were going to say the B word. You mean bitch? Claire winces at the word. She doesn't like cursing. Uh, my apologies, I'll try to keep that in mind. Well, kudos to you for using Crazy Jane as a creative alternative to swearing. Well done. Tamale looks at her curiously. Who are you? She's with me. Tamale thinks for a moment and then smiles mischievously. Ah, I get it. No, not like that. Tamale studies Claire for a moment and crinkles his brow. You look familiar. Have we met? Claire shakes her head and answers quickly. No. I know I've seen you somewhere before. Ski Mask steers the discussion back to the main topic. Tell me where I can find this Medusa. My sources tell me that she used to frequent a fetish establishment called Club Fun. They have something called the Snake Room, which would be right up her alley. She could be lambing it over there. Thanks, Tamale. Tamale gives Ski Mask and Claire a tip of his fedora, and they exit. Chapter 6 
Chapter 6 Club Fun The building appears to be an old abandoned school. The once vibrant colors on the outside of the building have been weathered away by time, exposing dirty concrete. The entrance to the building is plain, centered by two gray metal doors with vertical windows. One wouldn't think anything was happening beyond the doors if it weren't for the flashing strobe of light. His instinct is to tell her to wait for him in the car, but he knows she'll be eager to assist, and it's possible she may be helpful. Ski Mask reaches into the glove compartment, pulls out a black bandana, and hands it to Claire. Wear this over your face. This is a sex fetish club. Ordinary will stand out. Claire takes in a breath, ties the bandana around her neck, and raises it over her nose. Ski Mask nods and pulls his ski mask down over his head. Let's go. The exclusivity of the club appears to be nil as there is no one manning the door, giving the appearance that anyone can enter at will. Ski Mask and Claire walk down the entrance corridor to a vinyl curtain. They push it aside and enter another corridor. This one is painted with pastel blue, yellow, and pink stripes. Ahead of them they see a woman in a black dress and a beehive style wig, pulling a man in a purple shirt and leather pants past a corridor and around a corner. Ski Mask stops and peers down the corridor to their right. This one is colored light gray. The lighting in the hall casts a slight blue hue over everything. Halfway down the corridor is a short flight of five stairs. The corridor continues beyond that. Ski Mask waves for Claire to stay back as he spies on the events unfolding before him. A nerdy man with a comb-over, Buddy Holly-style glasses, and an oversized shirt runs in a panic towards Ski Mask as a muscular-built bald man wearing a sheer mesh t-shirt gives chase. The muscular man's hands are balled into fists and a serious expression covers his face. The nerd quickly ducks into a room just before reaching the corridor. The mesh t-shirt man follows him in and shuts the door behind him. Ski Mask looks back at Claire and nods and then steps forward into the corridor. The only person he currently sees occupying the space is a large man in an orange shirt with black pants. He's standing at the top of the short flight of stairs. As Ski Mask and Claire move down the corridor closer to the man, they see his face is painted white and his lips black. He is stroking his cheap black Halloween fright wig that flows down to his shoulders. Ski Mask steps up to the white-faced man and looks directly at him. Where's the snake room? The white-faced man stares off in a daze. My name is Ernest. Okay, Ernest, where is the snake room? My name is Ernest. Ski Mask and Claire look at each other. She shrugs and Ski Mask tries again. Tell me where the snake room is. My name is Ernest. Ski Mask can see that Ernest's eyes are glazed over. He's obviously on some kind of drug. His gaze isn't even focused on Ski Mask, but rather in the room behind him. Ski Mask turns to see what Ernest is so fixated on. Inside the room, a group of well-dressed men and women are masturbating enthusiastically as they watch a man in a skin-tight latex outfit with a zipper mouth hood. He is accompanied by a woman with a white shirt, bow tie, fishnet stockings, and a clear plastic face mask. They are both doing some strange form of interpretive dance next to a bound woman wearing a short black skirt and a Ouija board top. When Claire peeks in, she gasps and quickly turns away. Ski Mask looks back at Ernest and realizes he's more so talking to himself as he continues to say, I am Ernest, over and over. Ski Mask and Claire both turn their heads when they hear a door open back near the corridor entrance. The mesh t-shirted man steps out of the room he had chased the nerd into. He appears to be dejected as he hangs his head and walks toward them. When he notices them watching him, he stands erect and grimaces. What the hell are you looking at? Ski Mask gives Claire a hand signal to stay where she is as he approaches the mesh shirt man. He steps in front of him and they have a short stare down before the mesh shirt man speaks. What's your problem, asshole? The mesh shirt man reaches out to shove Ski Mask, but Ski Mask intercepts this move by grabbing the mesh shirt man's hand and spinning it, forcing the mesh shirt man to roll with the turn to keep his wrist from snapping. 
As he twists, the mesh shirt man exposes his back to Ski Mask, allowing Ski Mask to shove him forward and press his face against the cold, painted cinder block wall. Ski Mask bangs the mesh shirt man's head into the wall a couple of times while continuing to hold the wrist lock and then moves his mouth close to the mesh shirt man's ear and whispers sharply, Where's the snake room? The mesh shirt man, wincing in pain, points toward the entrance corridor with his free hand. Go around the corner. Keep following the hall. You'll, you'll know it when you see it. Ugh. Ski Mask pushes the mesh shirt man's head against the hard cinder block wall one more time before releasing him. Ski Mask takes a step back, waiting to see if Mr. Mesh Shirt wants to try anything else. Clearly, the defeated man wants no more. He stands looking down at the floor submissively. Ski Mask and Claire walk away in the direction of the snake room. Once Ski Mask is gone, the Mesh Shirt Man turns around, leans back against the cold wall, and lets out a breath. Oh, that was nice. Ski Mask and Claire turn down a dark corridor. Portions of the hall have splashes of fantastic blue lighting. Other portions are completely black. Ski Mask can feel Claire latch onto the back of his shirt to ensure that he doesn't get too far ahead of her. Figures can be seen periodically in the shadows of the corridor, but Ski Mask doesn't pay them any mind. He keeps motoring along until the corridor empties into a thinner, unusual hallway. The hall they now find themselves standing in is fashioned with at least a dozen toilets. To their left is the end of the hall. In order to continue on, they are required to pass every single toilet. There is no shortcut. Two people occupy toilets immediately in front of them and Ski Mask recognizes them as the first people he encountered in Club Fun. The beehive hairdo woman and the man in the purple shirt. The beehive woman is sitting on one of the toilets with her panties around her ankles. The purple shirt man is sitting next to her. He's fully clothed and holds a bottle of water in her mouth, forcing her to drink it while encouraging her to urinate. Yeah, come on. Piss for daddy. I want to hear that hot piss pounding against that porcelain. Claire gasps. Oh my word. The beehive woman's eyes latch onto Claire as a heavy stream of urine hitting the toilet water can be heard. She continues chugging water and appears to smile, undoubtedly enjoying the audience. The only other person they encounter in the hall of toilets is a man sitting on the last toilet reading a book. As they pass him, the smell indicates that he is indeed defecating as he reads. The bandana over her face is not enough to defend her from the offensive odor, so Claire covers her nose with one hand while holding up her other hand to shield her from having to view the defecating man. As they enter the twist of a new corridor, Ski Mask picks up the pace until he finally sees several doors, but they are all identical plain gray doors. Nothing to indicate what type of rooms they are. Ski Mask stops at one of the rooms and puts his ear to the door. He can hear someone moaning within, so he opens it. The room is glowing with dim yellow lighting. In the center of the room is a man wearing a skimpy women's fall leather bikini lingerie. He is holding his arms out to the side as a completely naked man and woman pour vegetable oil on his body and then rub him down with sponges. The naked man and woman are both gingers and their lack of clothing confirm that they are in fact true redheads. The man in the leather bikini has a full head of white hair and a thick white mustache. He looks familiar to Ski Mask and then it dawns on him. It's that asshole Dr. Clark who bumped into him earlier at the Madisonville Psychiatric Hospital. Dr. Clark's annoyance with the interruption is evident in his voice. Do you mind? I'm getting oiled. Ski Mask steps back out of the room and shuts the door. That fruit in the mesh shirt said we know it when we saw it, but these all look the same to me. Claire shrugs and notices a man walking toward them. He's wearing a blue shirt and sunglasses. His ball cap doesn't hide his out-of-style curly mullet. He looks kind of normal. Ask him. Ski Mask stops the man. Where's the snake room? Mullet Man stares at Ski Mask for a moment and then breaks into mime artistry. First, he acts as if he's trapped in an invisible box and then performs as though he's pulling an invisible rope. Ski Mask's patience boils over and he grabs Mullet Man by the throat. I hate mimes. Now where is the fu- He stops mid-word when he hears Claire clear her throat in objection. He gives Claire a sharp look and then continues with Mullet Man, absent the obscenities. Where is the snake room? 
Upon hearing a voice at his side, Ski Mask turns his head to see a man flanked by a woman. The couple is out of place in this environment, sporting business casual attire. The woman is wearing glasses and her hair is tied back in a ponytail. The man is wearing khakis with a short sleeve collared shirt. His beard is neatly trimmed. He has a folded backgammon set tucked under his arm. He speaks to Ski Mask. Are you looking for the snake room? Ski Mask shoves Mullet Man to the side and nods. These two look the most normal of all, which probably means they're the weirdest of the bunch. The backgammon woman smiles and then turns to a door at their side, points, and lets out a loud hiss. Ski Mask and Claire step closer to the singled out door. At first it looks like all the other rooms in the corridor, but as they get closer, they see the difference smeared in blood across the front of the door. Ten letter S's in a row, indicating the hiss of a snake. Chapter 7 Snake Woman Ski Mask puts his ear to the door and attempts to gauge what might be behind it, but the thudding cacophony of gothic music is too dominant. Ski Mask pulls Claire close to him. I don't know what's in there. When we get inside, stick close to the wall. Try to stay hidden in the shadows until I tell you to do something. Understand? Yes. Ski Mask nods. Here we go. Ski Mask opens the door and they quickly step inside of the room. The gothic music is deafening. The thudding beat reverberates through the room and vibrates their bodies. The room is darkened with the exception of the short flight of four stairs and the large pedestal it leads to which are lit by a purple spotlight. Atop the pedestal they see Medusa. She is naked, her skin covered in green body paint. Her dreadlock, snake-like hair has been dyed bright orange. She appears to be wearing novelty contacts that have made her eyes solid red. Medusa is on her hands and knees and is being penetrated roughly from behind by a brawny man who is naked save what appears to be a cobra mask. Ski Mask can make out the glistening movement of snakes slithering over Medusa's back. Medusa spots Ski Mask and hisses at him, sticking out her self-mutilated tongue which has been split in two to resemble that of a snake. She gives Snakehead Man a quick nod and he withdraws from her, stands, and approaches Ski Mask. As Snakehead draws near, Ski Mask notices that the man is not wearing a mask at all. His face has been tattooed with dark scales, and he appears to have had a body modification where some form of subdermal implant has given him a permanent cobra-like hood around his head. The still erect man bears his modified snake fangs and lunges at Ski Mask, who easily sidesteps the assault, turns and snaps the Snakehead Man's neck. He crumples to the floor like a broken accordion. Ski Mask looks up at Medusa, who now stands, hissing at him. She is holding a long snake over her head. Ski Mask gets a better look at the snakes and lets out a groan. He speaks loudly back to Claire so he can be heard over the thudding music. These are Black Mambas, one of the most venomous snakes in the world. I know. The good news is that they typically flee rather than strike, unless they feel threatened. But if angered, they can be very aggressive. I'll try to make this quick. Ski Mask's plan is to rush Medusa and attempt to knock her out quickly. If all goes as planned, she'll collapse, drop the snake, and it will simply slink away. The main challenge will be navigating the swarm of black mambas slithering around her feet. It's imperative that he not step on any of them, thus angering them. Most are close to her, so he thinks he can avoid them by using his reach. Ski Mask moves quickly to the stairs, but slows once he realizes her plan of action. Medusa holds the 14-foot black mamba out in front of her, harshly slaps the back of the snake's head multiple times, and then hurls the creature at Ski Mask. 
The throw of the serpent is spot on. She's done this before. Ski Mask attempts to simply brush the snake aside, but it becomes entangled around his arms. As he tries to let the angry snake loose, it strikes. Black Mambas are fast and can strike multiple times in the blink of an eye, as this one does. Successful bites on Ski Mask's neck and his lip are achieved before he can toss the creature aside. Ski Mask continues to move forward, but Medusa has paintbrushed another Black Mamba, infuriating the snake before hurling it at Ski Mask, and then another, and then another. Claire screams as she watches helplessly while Ski Mask attempts to toss the snakes aside before being bitten, but they're too fast and angry and she can see that he is taking a lot of damage. Ski Mask reaches the pedestal, but is significantly slowed by the Black Mamba's neurotoxins. Medusa sidesteps him effortlessly, lowers herself, slithers down the steps, and then launches herself at Claire. Claire tries to retreat, but Medusa is too fast for her. While only being of average size, Medusa still towers over the petite Claire, who is tossed toward the center of the room. Medusa crouches down and hisses at Claire. She then reaches down and picks up a nearby black mamba that is attempting to flee. Ski Mask turns. He finally has thrown aside all of the black mambas but has taken countless bites. He looks down at his hands which are swollen and covered in blood and venom. His entire body burns as though he is engulfed in flame. He watches on as Claire scoots back further into the room attempting to keep her distance from Medusa, but the snake woman moves forward picking up snakes as she goes, angering them with slaps and then tossing them toward Claire. Enough snakes have been tossed her way to where Claire is now encircled. The snakes, feeling endangered, hiss at Claire, opening their inky black mouths in an aggressive manner. Ski Mask attempts to move forward toward Claire, but his legs won't budge and he collapses. He looks up to see Medusa with angered snakes in both of her hands. She is holding them high on their necks so they can't strike her. They both hiss, ready to attack. Medusa joins them in hissing and prepares to hurl both prepped and furious snakes at Claire. Ski Mask watches on, using his arms to crawl toward Claire, but suddenly, the room begins to spin, and all goes dark. The End The Nine Lives of Ski Mask continues with Life 6, Insane Asylum. The Nine Lives of Ski Mask, Life 6, Insane Asylum, Chapter 1, Snake Charmer. Ski Mask opens his eyes. He expects to see the death room and the alluring white light calling to him, but he doesn't. And instead of the expected peaceful silence of the death room, all he can hear is a loud pounding noise, a bass and drums. He looks around through blurred vision at the room he is in. The snake room. He isn't dead yet. By squinting his eyes, he cuts through the blur enough to make out Claire, sitting in the middle of a circle of serpents, as Medusa pulls her arms back and flings two more black mambas at her. Ski Mask's feeling of helplessness is replaced by rage. As adrenaline pumps through his venom-filled body, he can feel a surge of life blast through his legs, and he springs forward past the ring of snakes, taking several more bites along the way as he steps in front of Claire and intercepts the two black mambas. He was lucky with the catch. Neither snake is wrapped around him, allowing him to immediately throw them back at Medusa. They both hit her in the face and become entangled in her dreadlocks. Medusa grasps at the snakes, trying to pull them from her head, but is only successful at further traumatizing the snakes, causing them both to strike at her. They bite her multiple times on both of her arms. She cries out as they strike her over and over. Finally, she is able to toss the snakes aside, but it is too late. She has taken innumerable bites, and the heavy dose of venom takes immediate effect. Medusa cries out in pain and then falls to the floor, convulsing violently for several seconds before going still. Though he can't make out the details of Claire's face, it's obvious that she is frozen in fear. Ski Mask bends down, scoops her up, and carries her out of the snake ring. 
Several snakes strike out at his pant legs. He's not sure if any penetrated his skin or not, but at this point, it doesn't matter. He stumbles slightly as he reaches for the door, but manages to open it and set Claire down outside. He thinks he hears Claire say, wait, as he goes back into the snake room, shutting the door behind him in an effort to keep Claire safe. Ski Mask eyes Medusa's green body on the floor and approaches her. The room begins to spin again, but Ski Mask concentrates as he grabs Medusa's bright orange dreadlocks and pulls her out of the room and into the hallway. As he shuts the door, he can see a spinning version of Claire. Her mouth is moving. She must be saying something to him, but he can't hear her anymore. The spinning intensifies and morphs into darkness. The death room. His home away from home. His friend. Ski Mask looks up at the black ceiling, which instantly removes the stress from his eyes. The pureness of the silence is calming. He looks to the right at the glowing white wall of light. It pulsates slightly as if calling to him, and he wonders why he doesn't go to it. Mona was correct at one time. Initially he did fear it, but not anymore. Now the light comforts him, and he knows the essence that dwells beyond will be something unfathomably perfect. He takes a step forward, wondering if he can make it to the light before he is catapulted back to where he came back to Claire. He stops. He turns away from the light and looks through the oval windows. He sees Claire. She's holding his face in her hands and is visibly mournful. Ski Mask opens his eyes. Once again they fill with life. Ski Mask, are you here? Are you back? Ski Mask lets out a groan. He looks at Medusa's dead body on the floor and then back at the snake room door. That was interesting. Ski Mask looks at Claire, who is smiling. He can't help but smile back as she helps him up to his feet, and he realizes that he is genuinely glad to be back. Let's get out of here. He looks down at the deceased snake woman, grabs her by the dreadlocks, and begins to drag her down the hall. As they reach the end of the corridor, Ski Mask thinks he recognizes a familiar face watching him, and then ducking back behind a corner when spotted. Is that Platinum? Is she following him again? Or perhaps he simply mistook some other whore in this place for her. Ski Mask's train of thought is interrupted when he sees a man wearing hospital scrubs and a horse head mask dragging a woman down the corridor past them. Ski Mask recognizes the Ouija board shirt on the woman being dragged and realizes she is the woman he saw earlier in the room full of masturbators. The horse head man stops momentarily when he realizes Ski Mask is watching him. His body language displays nervous panic as he picks up his pace and pulls the Ouija board shirt woman around a corner. Ski Mask continues pulling Medusa down the corridor and shakes his head at the oddity. What a bunch of freaks. Chapter 2 Copacetic Ski Mask pulls his truck next to a side entrance of the Madisonville Psychiatric Hospital per instructions from Dr. Franklin Grimm. Franklin was absolutely giddy when he received the call and still appears to be in that state as he bolts out of the side entrance to Ski Mask's window. Dr. Grimm glimpses in the back and smiles when he notices Medusa's dreadlocks peeking out from behind the wool blanket she is covered with. Did you kill her? Yes. Now come on, let's get moving. Dr. Grimm darts back inside the hospital and emerges pushing a gurney topped with several sheets. Uh, let's, let's get her on this. Dr. Grimm continues talking as Ski Mask, with some assistance from Claire, carries Medusa to the gurney. We'll cover her up and wheel her back up to her room. I gave tasks to several of the employees on the floor that we might have otherwise came in contact with, so this should be smooth sailing. Dr. Grimm is correct. It was easy to get her back to her room unnoticed. They only encountered a few hospital employees, most of whom were more interested in being noticed by Dr. Grimm than they were curious about the man in the ski mask pushing the gurney or what was hidden under the sheets. 
Once in the privacy of the room, they remove the sheets. Before they go further, Ski Mask makes a point to bring something up to Dr. Grimm. I thought I saw Platinum at Club Fun tonight. Is she still working for you? Dr. Grimm looks at him with a confused expression. What the hell are you talking about? Platinum, that whore that you hired to follow me back when we first met. I think I saw her tonight. Ski Mask, I, I never hired anyone to follow you. Now Ski Mask is as confused as Dr. Grimm. After I left your lab that first night, some whore in a platinum blonde wig was following me. She told me I should hear what you had to say. Dr. Grimm shrugs. I, I don't know what to tell you. I, I, I don't know anyone named Platinum. I, I don't know any whores. I, I never hired anyone to follow you. Maybe Alfred? <laughs> no, absolutely not. We have no reason to hire such a person for anything. So you're telling me that you and Alfred never hired a whore in a platinum blonde wig? That is what I'm telling you. Ski Mask lets out a breath and rubs his hand over the chin area of his Ski Mask as he thinks. Ski Mask, uh, is, is this something that we should be concerned about? Ski Mask shakes his head and gets back to the task at hand. No, if it becomes an issue, I'll take care of it. The trio spends a fair amount of time cleaning the paint off of Medusa's body and hair before placing her on the bed and covering her to the neck with a blanket. Dr. Grimm removes a cellophane bag from his jacket pocket, opens it, and dumps the contents on the floor. Ski Mask and Claire move in closer to see an empty syringe. Dr. Grimm smiles and wrings his hand while he speaks mockingly. <laughs> she died of an overdose. How unfortunate. Dr. Grimm is slightly surprised when Dr. Clark enters the room, but not near as surprised as Dr. Clark is that Franklin is there. Oh, uh, Dr. Grimm, I, I didn't know you were here. Well, Dr. Clark, I am here. Ski Mask glares at Dr. Clark. Most would assume the glisten in Dr. Clark's hair to be from hair product, but Ski Mask and Claire know that if anyone got close enough to him, they may detect the distinct scent of vegetable oil. What do you want, Dr. Clark? Oh, I just arrived and was doing my rounds. Well, you're late. She's quite dead. Dead? She overdosed. Not only did that idiot of head of security Mr. Walters allow Jack Winters to escape, he's letting drug trafficking slip by him as well. He is terminated effective immediately, and he has already been replaced. Everything is copacetic. Dr. Clark looks confused as he notices the man in the ski mask standing next to Dr. Grimm and the petite woman behind him. Who are these people? Dr. Grimm stands erect as he proudly makes his announcement. Meet the new head of security. Ski Mask steps forward and stands menacingly in front of Dr. Clark, who shudders as Ski Mask speaks. Call me Ski Mask. Chapter 3 Head of Security As Ski Mask strolls down the corridors of the Madisonville Psychiatric Hospital, he revels in the obvious fright that patients, doctors, and all hospital employees display when they see him coming. Some go to great lengths to avoid eye contact with him as he passes. Some actually turn back and go the opposite direction, while others dash into nearby rooms until he is out of sight. They all fear Ski Mask, and that's exactly what he wants. Since he took over as head of security eight months ago, the changes he implemented have gone smoothly. He kept the majority of the previous security force on staff. He mainly needed bodies. Drones that will do what they are told when they are told. It didn't take Ski Mask long to whip them all into shape. The only significant hire he made was that of a dependable second in command. All of the guards wear standard security guard uniforms. The uniforms are decorated with a unique number on the front and back. Ski Mask addresses them by their individual number. Numbers are all they are to him anyhow. The only guard that doesn't wear a uniform is Ski Mask himself. He normally wears dark pants and boots and a dark solid colored t-shirt covered by a button-up work shirt, usually gray or tan. And of course, he always wears his ski mask. With the exception of Dr. Grimm, no one knows what he looks like. 
Another twist to Ski Mask's hospital attire is a small headset he wears under the Ski Mask that runs a voice disguising amplifier to the front of his mouth which distorts his voice when speaking. The amplification of his breathing and the raspiness of the mechanical voice make him sound like a combination of Darth Vader and Nick Nolte. The purpose of the appearance and the distorted voice is for added intimidation. His goal is for all who see him to be scared as hell without him having to even give them another reason to be. And it works. The Madisonville Psychiatric Hospital is an old building and was built as a medical hospital, not a secure psychiatric institute, so there are weak points for any patient who may want to escape. But Ski Mask simply plugs those weak areas with live bodies his troop of security guards, his drones. The hospital is mainly a medium security facility. The majority of the patients have no desire to leave and wouldn't be a danger to anyone even if they did. Ski Mask transitioned an entire floor of the hospital to be used for the patients who pose more of a threat. He simply refers to it as the secured floor. Security guards are stationed outside the stairwells and the elevator. Rooms line both sides of the corridor of the secured floor. The doors to all the rooms can be shut and locked. Some patients are allowed to come out of their rooms and roam the hallways if they behave, while others spend most of their time confined. While not exactly Alcatraz, locked doors and ample security guards are enough to keep everyone in line, and at this point, Ski Mask has most of the patients on this floor well trained. Ski Mask occasionally unlocks and opens one of the patient's doors. If they exit the room without permission, they receive a beating. Most caught on after the first beating. Some took two beatings. Not many took three. There is one section of the floor that is reserved for the most dangerous patient. This section is called the deadbolt. It has a secure double cell door that leads to a thick glass encased room where the subject can be easily viewed at all times. At least four guards man this section. Ski Mask has been in talks with Dr. Grimm to expand the section into an entire maximum security wing. Construction on the expansion is scheduled to start within a few months. The deadbolt is currently being occupied by a drooling psycho named Chet Cornwell, better known as Scissors, due to his tendency to attack people with the household item. He's an unpredictable man in his 60s who wouldn't hesitate to flee or attack given a chance. He is definitely the correct choice, but there is one other patient on the floor whose ski mask would consider a great candidate for the deadbolt. John Bromley. Ski mask walks down the secured floor corridor to John Bromley's room. The door is locked, of course, and he always has at least one security guard posted outside. Today, there are two. One of the guards outside Bromley's door is ski mask's second in command, Marciano. How is he today? Nice and quiet. Marciano is a fire plug who resembles the pugilistic legend he was named after. His nose is crooked from several scuffles he has obviously encountered in his lifetime, and his smile reveals a missing front tooth. He's a solid, dependable second-in-command that Ski Mask can count on when he's away. Let's give him a little test, shall we? Ski Mask motions to the guards and they both plaster themselves against the wall next to John Bromley's door. Ski Mask unlocks it and pushes the door open as he sneaks out of view on the other side of the doorway. Ski Mask listens. He can hear the shuffle of Bromley's hospital slippers as he slowly moves closer. When Bromley gets so close that Ski Mask can hear him breathing, Ski Mask steps out in front of the doorway. John Bromley is a large bull of a man with white hair. His expression shifts to surprise when he sees Ski Mask, who kicks the behemoth in the chest, rocking him backwards across the room onto his bed. Ski Mask removes a billy club from his belt and advances toward Bromley, who holds his hands up in defeat. I didn't mean to leave the room. I just stepped close to the doorway. Correction. You stepped too close to the doorway. Ski Mask twirls his baton as he moves closer to Bromley. Okay, okay, I, I, I won't get that close to the doorway again. Ski Mask stops and stares at Bromley for a moment before he feints striking him. Bromley flinches, making Ski Mask grin. You're damn right you won't. 
Ski Mask exits the room, locks the door, and turns to Marciano. Be aware that this psycho will try to escape if ever given the chance. Yes, sir. Never give him that chance. I won't. You can count on it. Marciano notices that Ski Mask's eyes have shifted to something behind him, and he turns to see Dr. Clark listening to them, and then quickly walking into a nearby room upon being discovered. I can't stand that Dr. Clark. He's always sniffing around like a dog. Don't insult dogs. Call him what he is, a devious asshole. Don't ever trust that guy. Chapter 4 The Light The dead man's head droops forward. The wall restraints chained to his wrists keep him from plummeting to the ground. Alfred presses the lifeline device to the base of the man's skull and waits. One minute. No change. Two minutes. Nothing. Ten minutes. Not a goddamn thing! He turns to Claire, who is behind him in a lab coat, holding a clipboard. She is jotting down notes, but is now looking up crossly at Alfred for cussing. He holds up his hand before she can scold him. I apologize for the profanity. This is the sixth manual subject in a row who hasn't lasted beyond life three. He turns and looks off as his mind works. The auto renewals aren't faring much better. We haven't had one of them reach their ninth life in over a month. Most are malfunctioning by life five. In the past eight months of working with Alfred, Claire has learned that the project is everything to him. It's his life. He has taken up full-time residence in the apartment adjoining the lab. He works from the moment he wakes up until his head hits the pillow at night. He has a growing case of tunnel vision, and one of Claire's greatest attributes has been making Alfred pull his focus back and see things from different viewpoints. I don't think it's a malfunction at all. How do you mean? To you, these experiments are like parts on a car. They function or they don't, and if they don't work properly, you feel like they need to be repaired. But these aren't components. These are living human subjects. They have choices, and I believe they are exercising them. Don't you think I've reflected upon this prospect? But how can one not choose life? It goes against all animal instincts to survive. These people are being kidnapped, held against their will, tortured. I'm not torturing these people. I am merely experimenting on them for the greater good. To them, it's torture. They didn't sign up for this. Think of everything we know about the light from Ski Mask, and from that Australian man, and that woman Mona. Think of the reactions of so many of our subjects when they return from having just seen the light. Everything about it is positive. It's soothing, it's beautiful, it calls to them. What lies beyond is supposed to be so incredible that we as humans can't begin to comprehend it. So you tell me, if you were poised with choosing before surviving, only to be tortured and killed again, or walk into that fantastic light that makes you feel like everything will be delightful, which would you choose? Alfred is clearly in deep thought and sits down. And the only reason the auto-renewals are lasting a little longer is because those people don't have as long to make a choice before they're brought back here. But eventually they figure it out and are probably running for that light. These are unwilling subjects. That's what the problem is. You need subjects who are willing to take part in this. And where am I supposed to find such people? Offering financial rewards would likely be a good starting point. Alfred nods and sits again. He ponders Claire's suggestion, looks at her, and smiles. You're good at this. I'm confident that you could oversee this entire project on your own. I'm not so sure about that. I am. For the first time since I began this project, I feel like I could take a vacation day if I felt so inclined, and nothing would skip a beat in my absence. He leans back in his chair, and his expression contorts into serious thought. I felt so overwhelmed knowing that I was the only one that was truly committed to this. I don't think I can convey to you how comforting that is to me. I never felt that way with Franklin. 
He's intelligent, his understanding of the project is impressive enough, but ultimately, he lacks passion. Perhaps if his mind weren't so focused elsewhere... An alarm sounds and they both look up at the monitors to see Ski Mask has arrived home. All of the dogs except Madeline and Max have been lying around in the lab in various places. Their ears perk up when they hear the alarm and they simultaneously race out of the room to meet their master. The deep bark of Madeline and chirping bark of Max are heard from Alfred's apartment. They have taken to lying on his bed while Claire is helping in the lab. They do their best to catch up with the rest of the pack as they canter through the lab, out the door, and down the corridor. Claire begins to follow them, but stops when Alfred calls out to her. Claire, which would you choose? She doesn't seem to fully understand his question, so he elaborates. Returning or entering the light? Oh, she thinks for a moment. I honestly don't know. She turns and exits the lab, and Alfred leans back in his chair. Ski Mask enters the main room and is greeted by his furry family. As he usually does, he bends down and lets them jump all over him to the point of knocking him over. This is the only time anyone would ever see Ski Mask laughing. He gets to his feet once he sees Claire exit the East Wing corridor into the main room. She's still wearing her lab coat, thus is obviously coming up from working with Alfred. You have your hands full with the animals all day. Don't feel obligated to help Alfred and his project. He can manage. I find it fascinating. This will change the world once it's perfected. For better or worse? That's a good question, and one that should be asked. Inevitably, there will be consequences to trying to play God. But with an open mind, one can envision beneficial paths stemming from this that Alfred has never even fathomed. But back to your point, I don't mind doing it. Not at all. I love everything I do here. The animals, the lifeline project, you... She starts to stammer, realizing how that sounded. I, I didn't mean it like that. I, I mean, I love helping you. I know what you meant. His eyes lock onto hers, and he realizes he's staring at her longer than he should be. Claire seems to have noticed, but doesn't seem to mind as she is smiling and blushing slightly. Ah, ski mask. There you are. Alfred's interruption causes the duo to break their stare, collect themselves, and turn toward Alfred. Did Claire mention the need for more subjects? Already? Shit, Alfred. There's no shortage of people who piss me off enough to gather for your experiments, but you're using them up faster than I can get them. Language. Ski Mask rolls his eyes and gives her a quick look. Sorry. Alfred steps forward and almost trips over Scarface and Darkness, who have started nuzzling his ankles. Oh, pardon me, cats? He looks up at Ski Mask. Yes, well, Claire and I have discussed a new strategy. Rather than going the current route with non-willing participants, we've concluded that new, eager participants would be more to our benefit at this time. Perhaps subjects who are monetarily compensated? Ski Mask thinks for a moment. Hmm. I'll check with Tamale. Splendid. Ski Mask starts toward the West Wing, which leads to the Parrot Room, and Alfred holds up a finger. Might I ask if you saw Franklin at the hospital today? Of course. The guy's there before I show up and still there after I leave. Would you mind telling him to call me next time he's in your presence? Ski Mask scoffs at Alfred's request. I'm not your message boy. If you want to talk to him, go there and talk to him. Uh, yes, yes, that, that would be most effective. Ski Mask turns and disappears into the West Wing corridor, followed by Madeline and Max. Alfred walks to the main entrance. Ski Mask is right. I haven't been to the hospital to see Franklin in ages. I'm just as much to blame for our lack of communication as he is. Claire gives him a nod and smiles as he exits. She smiles at Slick, who has taken a seat by the door, keeping an eye on everything. She looks down at Dempsey and Floppy, who shadow her every move. They look up at her with a happiness in their eyes, urging her to pet them, and she happily obliges. The moment she bends down, Trip and Snowman rush over and get in on the action. Oh goodness, yes, that's my babies. 
Instinctively, Claire reaches around, trying to find Madeline and Max, who normally join in on this type of affection, but realizes that Ski Mask is in the West Wing, so they'll be down there waiting for him. Claire rises and walks to the start of the West Wing corridor. She grins when she hears Ski Mask baby talking the two dogs. The parrots are spooked by the dog, so Ski Mask never allows them into the room with him. She can hear him explaining to Madeline and Max that they can wait there for him. Claire walks down the West Wing corridor and gives both dogs a pat before entering. Ski Mask is sitting in his lounge chair with Lovebug the cockatoo nibbling at his hair. Sisko and Pancho greet her with a series of Hello and Hi there. It's a pleasant day and the exterior option is open. Normally, most of the birds would be outside, but obviously they all came in to greet Ski Mask. Scarlet, the Scarlet Macaw, and Steel, the Indigo Macaw, both fly to Claire and perch on her shoulders. Claire makes chirpy sounds to them as she approaches Ski Mask. Got room for one more? Well, three more? Ski Mask nods and scoots over as much as he can. It's a wide chair, but just meant for one. However, Claire is petite enough for this to work. Even leaning back, Ski Mask's feet easily reach the floor, whereas Claire is so small, the bend of her knees don't reach the cushion, keeping her legs straight. She smiles as she shakes her feet around a bit to exemplify the situation. Greystoke perches on a limb close to them. He lets out a series of pretty boy and pretty girl. Ski Mask and Claire simultaneously say pretty bird. Claire lets out a laugh and Sisko and Pancho fly back outside. Well... I guess they've had it with us. Ski Mask smiles and leans back further. They both enjoy the sounds of the birds and nature for a few moments until Claire speaks. Tell me about the light. Ski Mask takes in a deep breath and lets it out. I was afraid at first. It was pulling me in. It had power over me and I didn't know what it was. I was too dead set on staying away from it to feel the energy. How does the energy feel? It's hard to explain. The second time I died, I still fought against it, but I could feel something coming from it. An atmosphere surrounding me. I felt like, I don't know, I, I could say comforted, but that wouldn't be doing it justice. It was like all of my concerns were gone. I felt whole. I felt right. Since he put in the autoresponder, I'm not there as long, but the energy grows stronger each time. Do you still fear it? No, not at all. I welcome it. They both stare forward and relax together and enjoy the sights and sounds of the birds. After a long period, Ski Mask turns to Claire. Want to help me make some dog food? Claire smiles cheerfully. Chapter 5 Grim vs. Grim. Marciano stirs a half teaspoon of sugar into his mother's ginger tea. When he turns and steps toward the kitchen table, he's surprised to see that his mother is no longer sitting there. He rushes to the living room to see his mother slowly limping her way toward a recliner. She's a frail, skinny woman in her upper 80s with bluish gray hair. She is wearing a purple flowered nightgown. Ma! He rushes to her side and assists her to the recliner. Ma, what are you doing? You gotta use your walker. I don't need a walker. You're gonna fool around and break your hip. Use your walker, you hear? Fine. Marciano leans in and gives his mother a kiss on the temple. She pats his arm as he does. Is your sister here yet? No, Ma, Tina isn't coming today. It's the nurse's day today. Why do you always call her the nurse? Her name is Becky. Marciano shrugs. I don't know, because she's a nurse? Marciano looks at his watch and begins looking around anxiously. What are you so fidgety about? I, I gotta get back to work. My break is almost over. I'm gonna be late. So go. Go and do a good job. It's just that the nurse won't be here for another hour. I hate leaving you alone. She waves him off. Go on, I'll be fine. I'll watch an episode of Murder, She Wrote. By the time it's over, Becky will be here. Promise me you won't get up and walk around while you're alone, okay? Okay. Okay, Ma. I love you. I love you, too. 
Marciano rushes down the apartment complex stairs to his car, checking his watch the entire time. If he steps on it and rushes once he gets to the Madisonville Psychiatric Hospital, he should be able to make it to his post on time, but it's going to be close. Ski Mask is a stickler for the guards being on time, and as his second-in-command, Marciano feels it's important to set a good example for the other guards. After exceeding the speed limit the entire time and recklessly passing a few other vehicles, he reaches the hospital ahead of schedule. He quickly trots across the parking lot to the main entrance and sees one of the entrance guards laughing heartily with an old bald man. He briskly approaches the guard and the man. What's going on here? You need to be surveying the lobby. You can't be yucking it up when you're on duty. The guard is apologetic. I'm sorry, this is Dr. Grimm. Uh, the other Dr. Grimm. He was the head of the hospital until he retired and our current boss took over. Oh, Dr. Grimm's father. It's a pleasure to meet you, sir. Likewise. I'm just here to see my son. Sure thing. He points to the guard. Let him up, I gotta get to my post. As Marciano hurries past, the guard gives a few pleasant parting words to Alfred and lets him through. Alfred strolls confidently through his old stomping grounds, being greeted by familiar faces. Several doctors and nurses stop what they're doing to catch up with him. Many of the holdover guards leave their post to shake his hand and chat. He is obviously very well liked by his former employees. As he nears his son's office, he rounds a corner and is pleased to see Dr. Lewis. She is one of Franklin's better doctors and runs the hospital when Franklin and Dr. Clark are both away. Alfred, it's been too long. Ah, Dr. Lewis, you are looking as lovely as ever. Oh, stop. Uh, not really. Go on, please. They laugh. How are things with you nowadays? Rough. I quit smoking and I'm not handling it well. I'm one annoyance away from lighting up again. Well, I have faith in you. Dr. Lewis discreetly looks around, moves in closer to Alfred, and speaks in a softened tone. So, do you know if Franklin is seeing anyone? I really don't think so. But you're married. Not happily. Oh, Dr. Lewis, you are incorrigible. He laughs and gives her a playful pat on the shoulder. It was good to see you again. Alfred walks down the hall to his son's office and enters. His secretary, Gloria, finishes up a phone call and beams when she sees Alfred. Dr. Grimm! She gets up, hurries to the front of her desk, and gives him a hug. You look great! You always knew how to brighten my day. Did I mention that you were my favorite secretary of all time? Too many times to count. How is Franklin treating you? Fine. He's not as much fun as you were. He's all business all the time, but I can't complain. Is he in? Yes, go right on in. Alfred gives Gloria one last smile and then enters Franklin's office. Franklin looks up from some papers on his desk. What the hell are you doing here? Alfred walks deeper into the large office and sits in one of the two chairs in front of Franklin's desk. I haven't seen you in quite some time. I've been busy. What can I do for you? You're my son. I haven't seen you in months. Can't I visit you? Franklin lets out a breath. Fine, yes. Alfred notices a picture of Dr. Grimm's ex-wife and daughter on his desk. He picks it up and looks at it. Have you talked to either of them lately? Uh, no, we don't get along. I find it better not to bother them. You're aware of this. Alfred sets the picture down and then picks up the picture of Franklin's mother from his desk. He stares at it longingly. I miss her. Franklin snatches the picture from Alfred's hands, puts it in a drawer, and shuts it. What do you want? We've hit a snag in the experiments. We have determined that unwilling subjects are choosing on their own to- Franklin interrupts him. I don't care. Alfred appears disappointed. I thought you might be interested. Oh, uh, not really. I've got my hands full here. Listen, I need your help, Franklin. I need you back on the Lifeline Project. I'm sure you've been doing just fine on your own. Actually, Claire has been assisting me. She's been doing quite well. G great! Great! You have one assistant, you don't need another. You're not an assistant. Bullshit! 
That's all I ever was. This has been your project from the beginning. You did the research. You did the experiments. You made the prototypes. You didn't even ask me to be part of it until you had the damn thing up and running. I've never been anything but your assistant. This is your passion, not mine. My passion is here, this hospital. It may not be as sexy as the Lifeline Project, but it's mine. Alfred looks around the large but aging office. He notices the watermarks on the ceiling and the cracks in the paint. He shakes his head. This place? This is what you're proud of? This is why you're turning back on something that will change the world as we know it? So you can be the head of a second-rate shabby mental institution? I wouldn't expect you to understand. You're a brilliant man, father, but you lack empathy. It took me years to be judged on my own merits and respected for who I am and not just thought of as the boss's son. But I did it. And when you retired and recommended somebody else for the job, I only recommended somebody else because I assumed you would be joining me full-time on the project. Franklin raises his voice so he can be heard over his father. I crawled out from under your shadow, and I earned my position here because everyone else knew I was the best person for this job, even if you didn't. I earned this position, not because I was Alfred Grimm's son, but because I was the best. I'm here now. I am not about to go back. You're going to have to accept that. This is preposterous. The Lifeline Project will go down as one of the most important discoveries in human history. I don't have long left, Franklin. When I'm gone, it will be yours. Why? Why are you so hell-bent on having me as part of this when you know I don't want to be? Because you are my son. When I'm gone, the entire project will be passed on to you. This is my life's work. The grim name must always be associated with it. Franklin thinks for a moment. What about what I want? Franklin leans back in his chair as he speaks. When I was ten years old and you and mother divorced, you knew how desperately she wanted me to live with her. You knew how badly I wanted that, too. But you wouldn't stand for that. You had to have things your way. So you fought her in court and convinced everyone that she was unstable, even though you and I both knew that was not the case. You tarnished her reputation to the point where I couldn't even visit her unsupervised. Three years later, when she drowned in that pool, in the back of my mind, I've always felt like had I lived with her, I would have been there. I would have done something and she would have lived, and I, and I would have a mother. You took my mother away from me, just to get what you wanted. After a moment, Franklin grins, leans forward, and speaks with smug confidence. You are not getting what you want this time. Chapter 6 Food It was several months ago when Claire and Ski Mask broached the topic of dog food. Ski Mask went on a rant about his distrust of most store-bought dog and cat foods, complaining that many contain unhealthy byproducts and cheap oils known to cause inflammation such as vegetable, canola, soy, and corn. He also criticized their unnecessary use of food dyes, cellulose, and a long list of ingredients that most people can't pronounce. He explained to her how his father was a butcher. Ski Mask assisted him to the point where he became well-skilled at the trade himself. One of the things that his father always lectured was never to let meat go to waste. In the spirit of that, and with as much meat as they had access to, Ski Mask's father always made their dogs and cats food himself. After learning that history, it wasn't a surprise to Claire when she discovered that Ski Mask used many of his victims as food for his animals. It also explained the necessity of the industrial-sized freezer with the handy body chute that was convenient so long as the bodies didn't take odd bounces and rolls that hit the fail-safe lever. Of course, Ski Mask had long since corrected that unforeseen, unlikely issue. Ski Mask explained the process to her in detail the first few times, and then a little less each subsequent lesson, as it began to sink in and explanation no longer became necessary. 
This was likely similar to the way his father taught him, albeit with beef, not humans. The procedure is always the same. Ski Mask hangs the carcass for a short time, quarters them, and then slices those sections into one-inch chunks. As far as butchering goes, the process is simple. Unlike a butcher shop, which would be dealing with an array of cuts, and would also need to be aware of the appearance of the cuts since they will be displayed for the public, Ski Mask doesn't have to be pretty. Most of his cuts will be stew meat. Some cuts will be strips that will be dried into jerky treats. The rest will be ground and mixed with coconut flour, eggs, and spices, and will be baked and cut in squares to make a universal dry treat for dogs and cats. Claire was disgusted during the first course of food making to the point where she had to leave the room and fight against vomiting. Ski Mask assured her that she would grow used to it in time. He was correct. But he is still the one who does all of the butchering. In time, she feels like she'll be able to assist him with that aspect as well, but not yet. For now, she is more helpful as a cooking assistant. The recipe for the main dog food is simple. The ingredients consist of stew meat, water, olive oil, coconut oil, eggs, and vegetables including pumpkin, summer squash, broccoli, cauliflower, carrots, peas, beets, yams, green beans, and sweet potato. He also adds a variety of herbs and spices to round out the recipe with all of the necessary vitamins and minerals his dogs and cats will need. The meat is brown first, and the rest of the ingredients are then introduced and slow cooked. Once cooked, the stew is portioned out, refrigerated, and ready for consumption. As they reach the end of this batch of food, Ski Mask looks at Claire with a sense of pride. You're getting the hang of this. Claire nods. Yeah, not too bad at all, if I do say so myself. Ski Mask looks at a clock on the wall. Do you mind finishing up? I have something at the hospital I've been working on. Sure, you can count on me. I know I can. Ski Mask heads toward the door but stops, turns to Claire, and says something that leaves her with a joyful smile and a twinkle in her eye. We're good together. Chapter 7 John Bromley Ski Mask approaches John Bromley's room. Marciano is on duty. He stands at attention when he sees Ski Mask and nods. Ski Mask puts his finger over his mouth and motions for Marciano to move away from the door. Marciano presses up against the wall to the side of the room as Ski Mask positions himself on the other. Ski Mask reaches over, unlocks the door, pushes it open, and then pulls his arm back in out of sight. Ski Mask waits for several seconds, expecting Bromley to pop his head out of the door, but he doesn't, and all is quiet. Ski Mask slowly leans in and peers inside the room. John Bromley is standing at the far side of the room with his back to the door as he looks out the window. Ski Mask looks at Marciano and gives him a nod. Marciano relaxes and steps in front of the door and watches as Ski Mask enters the room. Ski Mask stands inside the room entrance and focuses on Bromley as Bromley speaks to him. Hello, Ski Mask. It's a lovely day. Reminds me of family. You killed your family. Bromley looks over his shoulder and sneers at Ski Mask and then looks back out the window. Not them. My perfect family. They're out there somewhere. I must find them. The door's right there. Ski Mask steps to the side and points to the open door. He gives Marciano a quick nod and Marciano steps to the side out of sight, making the notion of walking out even more appealing to Bromley. John Bromley stares at the open door, and then at Ski Mask, and then back at the open door. The wheels in his mind are churning. His eyes start to dart back and forth rapidly from Ski Mask to the open doorway. His breathing begins to accelerate and suddenly he bursts forward toward the door. Ski Mask grips his billy club and smacks Bromley across the shin as he reaches the doorway. Bromley collapses to the floor and grasps his lower leg. Ski Mask immediately strikes Bromley several more times in the upper arms and thighs. The goal is to inflict pain not damage. 
Marciano positions himself to assist if need be, but Ski Mask is in full control. As Bromley rolls around the floor in pain, he continues to cry out, My family! I must find my perfect family! Ski Mask looks up at Marciano. This psycho is never going to learn. I'll tell Dr. Grimm that we need to make the expansion of the deadbolt section a priority. Chapter 8 Hell Hole as Ski Mask enters Tamale Jones' office, he is overwhelmed by the exotic aroma of spiced pork, steaming corn mesa, and robust peppery spices. Ski Mask shuts the door behind him and watches as Tamale takes a shark-sized bite out of one of the five heaping tamales on his desk. I had these babies shipped in from Tijuana. How are they? Tamale shrugs. Ah, they're okay. He wipes off his mouth with a napkin. And what can I do for you today, my friend? I need to find some people who would be willing subjects for some medical experiments. They would be paid. Any idea where I can find anyone like that? Tamale Jones doesn't hesitate. There's a little known red light district down by the river. They call it the Hell Hole. Lots of bug-eyed Bettys and dewdroppers out there getting bent on dope. Most of them will do anything for enough cabbage to get their next fix. Perfect. How do I get there? Ski Mask pulls into the area known as the Hell Hole. What Tamale referred to as the Red Light District is merely an old abandoned port warehouse crawling with undesirables. There are a half dozen people milling about outside the entrance as Ski Mask approaches. One of them, a grimy husky man in his 40s, brandishes a knife and makes the mistake of attempting to rob Ski Mask. Give me your cash, asshole. In a blur of movement, Ski Mask kicks the man in the balls, extracts the knife from his hand, and sticks it deep into the grimy man's eye. Ski Mask twirls the knife around until the grimy man goes limp and drops to the ground. Ski Mask glares around at the others. Two of them run away, fearing for their lives. The other three are so loaded they can barely stand and didn't even notice the altercation. Ski Mask enters the hellhole and is met with a thick wave of odor that smells like a combination of musty sweat, urine, excrement, dead fish, and smoke. The entire dwelling is lit with candles. Hard puddles of cooled wax top most of the industrial-sized wooden spools that are scattered amongst the interior being used as tables. Several of the occupants inside the hellhole are passed out. Others are openly shooting up or snorting powder. Most of the corners are inhabited by people dealing drugs. Hellhole is a fitting name for this scum-encrusted structure. A filthy blonde throws herself in front of Ski Mask. You got any money, man? I need some money. Come on, I'll suck your dick. Ski Mask shoves her out of the way and continues deeper into the dimly lit hellhole. He wasn't expecting this many dwellers within. This is good. It allows him his pick of the dregs. He scans around, eyeing the dealer areas first, trying to pinpoint some users who are less likely to have soiled themselves. He notices a few of the less grubby types heading out a rear door. He decides these will be the types he targets first. He follows them out. As he steps outside, he is met with a blast of refreshing air and the calming sight of the rippling river. Ski Mask notices a wooded area where most of the scum seem to have gathered. As Ski Mask makes his way toward the wooded area, a flash of lightning fills the sky, followed by a whiplash crack of thunder. He feels someone bump against him from behind and a swift scratch across his throat. When he instinctively covers his throat with his hand, he can feel a hard pulsation of blood slapping against his palm. When he lowers his hand, he can see a jettison of crimson spurting out in front of him from his throat. The rapid loss of blood weakens him immediately and he drops to his knees. The world around him is beginning to fade, but he is intent on discovering the cause of this before he expires. Ski Mask manages to turn around and view his assailant. 
For some reason, he isn't entirely surprised to see Platinum standing in front of him with a grin on her face and bloody scalpel in her hand. What shocks him is the petite figure standing next to Platinum looking down at him. As the figure comes into focus, Ski Mask's heart drops to the ground. Claire. For his final few seconds before falling dead, Ski Mask stares into Claire's eyes. Those beautiful, liquid blue eyes. The end. The Nine Lives of Ski Mask continues with Life 7, Horror. The Nine Lives of Ski Mask, Life 7, Horror. Chapter 1, My Specialty. Tamale Jones sits in his office, reassuring his client on the phone. Don't fret, Mrs. Saunders. I got the best bruiser in the world on the case. Don't worry, your ex-husband don't stand a chance. I'll call you when the deed is done. Tamale hangs up the phone, looks at his Dunhill wristwatch, and contemplates whether or not he has enough time to make it to Juan's Tamale Shack and back before Ski Mask returns from putting the screws on Mrs. Saunders' ex-husband. You can do it. He hustles out from behind his desk and hurries to the door. He nearly knocks over the petite Claire, who was just about to enter. Oh, pardon me, lady. Tamale doesn't even look at Claire as he fumbles for his keys and begins locking the door. Uh, hi. Do you know a private detective they call Tamale Jones? You're looking at him. He locks the door and quickly moves down the hallway to the main entrance of the building. Claire does her best to keep up. Can I hire you? I'm afraid my slate is full at the moment, sweetheart. Do you know when you'll be available? No telling. You're better off going elsewhere. He rushes out the door and down the sidewalk, keeping his gaze forward as Claire breaks into a jog to keep pace with him. Well, can you recommend someone? What kind of job you looking for? I'd like to have someone followed. Anyone can do a simple tail job. I need someone good. Oh, there's a pro skirt named Platinum. She's real good when it comes to tailing. Pro skirt? Tamale stops, lets out a sigh of aggravation, and looks Claire's way for the first time. A whore. He takes out a small slip of paper and starts scribbling on it. She hangs out at a crazy joint called Club Fun. It's over on High Point. Good luck. He hands her the card, looks at his watch again, and darts across the street. Claire gets into her car. She looks down at the address on the card and wonders what kind of a place Club Fun is. When she arrives to the address, she is surprised to see that the building appears to be an abandoned elementary school. She would suspect it was empty if it weren't for the rather full parking lot. Upon closer inspection, she can see a strobe light behind the main entrance door and a dim red light coming from another room. The strobe light she spotted from the parking lot is a lot farther down the corridor than she expected, leaving the foyer dark. She can see the silhouette of a person next to a nearby wall, but cannot make out any details. Claire leans in toward the figure. I'm looking for someone named Platinum? The silhouette lets out a loud, shrieking cackle, steps back and disappears into the shadows. Claire startles, crinkles her brow, and turns down the corridor. Immediately, she encounters a lanky woman in full gothic attire walking toward her. Excuse me, do you know a woman named Platinum? The gothic woman completely ignores Claire and walks past her. Claire turns, watches the gothic woman walk down the hall, and whispers to herself. Rude! The hall gets brighter as Claire continues on. She can see pastel colors zooming down the wall. They probably had a more pleasant effect back when this was a functioning school. In the building's current form, it's unsettlingly out of place. Claire slows as she passes a room and notices movement coming from within. Upon stopping and moving close to the doorway, she can see a man with flowing blonde hair standing in front of a locker. He unbuttons his white dress shirt and removes it, leaving him only wearing black pants and black boots. 
She is growing uncomfortable with his lack of clothing, but tolerates it, hoping that he can help her find platinum. Shortly after pulling a black latex outfit out of the locker, the long-haired man notices Claire watching him. A subtle grin comes over his face as he sets the black latex one-piece back in the locker and struts casually toward Claire. When he reaches the doorway, he stops and methodically looks Claire up and down, making Claire extremely uneasy, to the point where she takes a couple steps back. She begins to open her mouth to ask her question when an elegant woman in her 50s wearing a sparkling evening gown steps in front of her and addresses the long-haired man. Hello, long hair. Are you performing tonight? Long hair nods. Marvelous. Absolutely marvelous. When the elegant woman turns to walk away, Claire quickly speaks to her. Do you know where I can find a woman named Platinum? The elegant woman steps back and smiles fully as she observes Claire. Look at you. So tiny. So adorable. The elegant woman doesn't address Claire's question. She simply walks away. Claire looks back at Longhair, who continues to grin confidently while he gawks at Claire. Sorry to bother you, but do you know someone here named Platinum? Longhair completely disregards Claire's question, reaches his hand out, and caresses her chin with his thumb. Claire instantly recoils from his advance, which Longhair finds insulting. His grin transforms into a grimace, and he slams the door in her face. Discouraged, yet determined, Claire continues down the corridor until she reaches an adjoining corridor. She stops, contemplating whether to continue forward or turn down the new corridor, when she notices two people standing by a nearby room. One is a woman in her 30s with light blonde frizzy hair. She's wearing a red corset, black skirt, and boots. She eyes Claire in a seductive manner while running her finger around a gold necklace. She is flanked by a short man wearing hospital scrubs, a furry rubber wolf mask, and wolfman gloves. The blonde woman leans closer to the wolfman and speaks discreetly to him, but Claire can make out that she said, Bring her to me. The woman enters the room and closes the door behind her as the wolfman approaches Claire. The mistress has requested your presence in her chambers. Claire looks past the wolfman to the room the mistress entered. In there? The wolfman holds up a finger. Do not keep the mistress waiting. The wolfman turns, enters the room, and shuts the door behind him. Claire stands pondering whether or not to open the door and ask if they know who Platinum is, or just leave. This has turned out to be a lot more trouble and way too weird for her. Before she decides, she hears a cat call whistle behind her, followed by a feminine voice. I wouldn't go in there if I were you. You might never be seen again. Claire turns to see a woman in her 40s, wearing a platinum blonde wig. She is sporting a tight black cotton top, short black skirt, fishnet stockings, and over-the-knee boots. I hear you're looking for me. Are you Platinum? In the flesh. Platinum steps closer to Claire, eyeing her up and down. You are scrumptious. I just want to eat you up. Claire disregards her comment and gets straight to business. I understand you're good at following people and gathering information about them. That's my specialty. Now why would a sweet petite thing like you need someone followed? It's nothing nefarious. I just want to know more about someone. Ah, curiosity. It killed the cat, you know. And who, may I ask, do you need followed? Your husband? Boyfriend? Girlfriend? Platinum smiles seductively. What? No. My boss. Your boss? I'm intrigued. What is it you want to know about your boss? Claire seems unsure and takes a moment to answer the question. I guess where he goes, what he does, that sort of thing. That's easy. 
What's your boss's name? Ski Mask. Ski Mask. The meter just moved from intrigue to fascination. I need a picture and information as to where I can initially find him. Platinum offers up her email information as Claire takes out her phone and sends her a rare picture of Ski Mask. Along with that, she sends the name of the closest main crossroads to his residence. Thanks for the info, beautiful. I'll expect payment after the job is complete. Of course. Platinum non-discreetly looks Claire over again. You are positively mouth-watering. Claire, extremely uncomfortable by Platinum's advances, prepares to leave when she notices a man donning a skin-tight black outfit walk by them. He's wearing a matching black mask with a zipper over the mouth. Long blonde hair flows out from under the mask, making Claire realize it's the rude man known as Long Hair. As he passes them, he catches the eye of Platinum, who watches his ass wiggle as he struts toward a room. I'm going to catch Long Hair's performance. Would you like to join me? Absolutely not, but thank you. Aw, that makes Platinum sad. Claire searches for a way to end the conversation on a cordial note. Uh, sorry. Platinum grins. You are luscious. She quickly caresses Claire's cheek, but before Claire can back away, Platinum turns and follows in the direction of long hair. Claire lets out a deep breath and whispers to herself. I hope this wasn't a mistake. Chapter 2 Not Your Average Joe When Claire gives her the heads up that Ski Mask would be leaving his residence soon, Platinum positioned her maroon 1978 Buick Electra in a discreet location near the main crossroads Claire had pointed out. Once identifying Ski Mask, tailing him was rather easy. His first stop was to the office of Tamale Jones. While having never met him personally, Platinum is well aware of Tamale's reputation for being an old-style gumshoe detective. She knows that he's the guy to go to for underground services. Apparently, he is aware of her as well. More than one of her past clients mentioned that they heard of her from him. Ski Mask wasn't in his office for long. When she sees him cross the street and begin walking down the sidewalk, she gets out of her car and begins to follow. Her tight pink sweater, short black skirt, and over-the-knee boots makes a clear impression as to what her profession is. Although in reality, Platinum is not a prostitute, it's merely a front. While one might think blending in with the average woman might make her less noticeable, Platinum finds that most people don't give a whore a second glance. And if she's spotted multiple times on a job, the assumption is that she's simply walking the streets turning tricks. She keeps a respectable distance from Ski Mask, following him several blocks before he turns and walks through a well-lit parking lot. He stops by the entrance of a short alley. She knows it well. At the other end is a neighborhood pub called the Tap Room Tavern. It's of moderate size with a small dance floor. It's the kind of a place that during the week has a neighborhood pub feel where one can relax, have a beer, and watch a ball game. But on the weekends it transforms into more of a small nightclub where patrons can let their hair down, dance, and mingle. Platinum's intrigue grows when she witnesses Ski Mask remove a black Ski Mask from his back pocket pull it over his head, and step into the darkness of the alley. Normally she would think him to be the run-of-a-mill mugger, but having seen him come from Tamale Jones' office, she puts it together quickly that he's one of Tamale's thugs. Curious to see him fulfill his assignment, Platinum turns the corner and walks another block to the street that houses the other side of the alley. As she strolls down the street close to the alley entrance, a cool breeze picks up and she pauses under a streetlight to assess the area. The activity associated with the street comes in waves. At times, it's very quiet. 
The only other person she sees is a huge tattooed bodybuilder type standing outside of the taproom tavern, having difficulty lighting his cigarette. She can see his growing frustration with the task and observes him as he steps into the alley for shelter against the wind. As Platinum slowly moves closer to the alley entrance, she can hear the bodybuilder barking at someone. She carefully sneaks her head into the alley just enough to watch without being noticed, and she immediately sees who the bodybuilder is shouting at. It's Ski Mask. He stands menacingly at the other entrance, and when the two men start racing toward each other, it's Ski Mask, not the larger man, who moves with utter confidence. Platinum is slightly disappointed when the two men meet. She was expecting a somewhat competitive affair, but this is nothing of the sort. Ski Mask toys with the big man and in no time has him in some sort of wrist lock, turning him into a whining baby. She can't hear everything Ski Mask is saying, but she chuckles to herself as she gets the gist of it. Something about the big man leaving his ex-wife alone and ordering him to move to Mexico. Platinum holds back a gasp as she witnesses Ski Mask cut one of the bodybuilder's fingers off with a pair of pruners. She watches on as Ski Mask belittles the big man before walking away. The bodybuilder feels around for his lopped off finger. He picks it up and is bawling when he rushes out of the alley past her. Platinum watches on as Ski Mask disappears out of the back alley. She raises her eyebrows and whispers to herself, Wow, this guy is not your average Joe. Chapter 3 The Killer Platinum stands in the shadows as she stakes out the entrance to Tamale Jones' building. Ski Mask entered moments ago, likely to pick up his pay. She expects his night is done. He'll probably head home after this, but she'll complete the job by tailing him until it's official. It appears it will be an easy night. She was mistaken when she thought of Ski Mask as one of Tamale's thugs. This guy is something else altogether. He's a specialist. Clearly this is the man Tamale calls in for his most important and no doubt most expensive assignments. This explains why his identity would remain a mystery to Claire. This isn't the type of employment one would share with just anybody. But who is Claire to him? Is she just anybody? She referred to Ski Mask as her boss. Boss of what? What does she do? These are questions that Platinum never asks of her clients. It's none of her business, and frankly she doesn't care. But something is different when it comes to Claire. That scrumptious little frame, those breathtaking eyes, the way she oozes innocence, and those lips, those soft, kissable lips. She's not just anybody. Platinum's lack of focus as she thinks about Claire causes her to be startled when a small, short-haired dachshund runs by her, scampers out into the middle of the street, and stops. At the same time, Ski Mask exits Tamale's office. Ski Mask immediately takes interest in the dog, calling to him, urging him to get out of the street as a car rushes toward the dog. Platinum watches as the spectacle unfolds and is in shock when she sees Ski Mask dive in front of the car to save the dog from death. The car that struck Ski Mask is partially obstructing her vantage point, but she can see that he is laying still and that the driver, who is now out in the street, is frantic as he looks around. Platinum ducks for cover to ensure not to be seen. When she looks back up, she sees the frantic man. Is he pulling Ski Mask into his car? Her eyes did not deceive her. She stands shocked for a moment as the man drives off, leaving no evidence of what just took place. Platinum hightails it to her Buick and steps on the gas. She was afraid she lost the man, but fortunately, due to his erratic driving, she is able to spot him and begins tailing. It isn't long before the car reaches a desolate part of town full of abandoned two-story houses. The car pulls down a drive leading to one of said houses. She parks around the corner and observes as the frantic man rushes to the house and returns with an old bald man. 
Their short conversation results in the frantic man running inside and returning with a gurney, which they promptly place Ski Mask on and push him inside. What the hell? All kinds of thoughts race through Platinum's mind as she continues watching the house. Is Ski Mask dead? What are they doing to him? Cutting him up? Hiding the body? Harvesting the organs? Who are these people? Can I blackmail them? When some activity finally resumes, she wasn't expecting it to be Ski Mask walking out of the house holding the dachshund, both seemingly fine. The surprise of the sight causes Platinum a mental lapse and she stands in plain sight long enough for Ski Mask to spot her. When she realizes this, she quickly gets into her car and drives down the road. What an idiot I am. It's one thing to be spotted, it's another thing to be caught gawking. After a few moments, she slowly drives back to the street and can see Ski Mask, who has walked a distance from the house, talking to someone in a car and then opening the door and getting in. She tails the car for a short while and then they pull over next to a nondescript business. The man driving the car, who happens to be tuxedo clad, hurries into the building leaving Ski Mask behind. It's not long before Ski Mask exits the car and enters the building, leaving Platinum perplexed. Normally Platinum wouldn't even consider getting out and taking a closer look at the building. She'd merely wait for the person she is tailing to return and continue to follow from there. But this has been an unusual night and her curiosity is getting the better of her. Platinum exits her Buick and casually strolls up the street next to the building. She nonchalantly peers into the lobby to see what they are doing and stops when she notices that the lobby is void of any people. Shit, did I lose him? She moves closer to the glass entrance, shields the glare with her cupped hands and looks in. She's slightly taken aback by the unusual castle-like wooden door with the words In Eternum written next to it, and jumps when Ski Mask steps out of the lobby bathroom, still holding the dog. He is looking directly at her. <sighs> Shit! She can see Ski Mask lunge forward toward her and she immediately turns and runs. Platinum is not much of a runner to begin with, but her clunky boots slow her top speed even more. She knows she's done for, there's no way she can outrun him. As she runs, she starts thinking of excuses as to what she can tell him when he catches her. She'll try to just brush it off as a coincidence, and that she's walking the streets like she always does. Maybe he'll buy it. Most people do. When she turns to see how close he is, she is surprised to see that he never exited the building. Chalking it up to good luck, Platinum hurries back to her car and decides to wait on them to exit the building. It's not long before they're back in the vehicle and driving again. This time back to the downtown area, not far from Tamale's office. As they get out of the car and walk to Ski Mask's truck, Platinum decides that the information they share may be pertinent to the information she is gathering for her sweet client. In order to hear what they're saying, she'll need to get close. Normally this would be easy, but she already has two strikes against her in the being spotted department, so she must proceed with caution. Ski Mask's truck isn't far from the entrance to a dive bar. She figures she can take cover in their entryway and still be close enough to overhear the conversation, and she's right, for the most part. Their conversation is brief and garbled, but she got the gist of it. Apparently Ski Mask was not aware of what the building was, and the man in the tuxedo was offering an explanation, but Ski Mask denied the need. Platinum's head turns from Ski Mask's truck when she hears a voice at her side. The man addressing her is very drunk, and has a baby face that makes him look like he's still in high school. Hey baby, how much to swim in your fish tank? Platinum smiles. I'm off the clock, sweetie. Maybe another time. <laughs> Bitchin'. The drunk man walks away, and Platinum turns her attention back to Ski Mask, but freezes when she sees that he is locking eyes with her through his side mirror. Strike three. Oh shit. She turns and runs through the bar. She notices a back exit and immediately heads for it. It exits into a long alley. If she tries running down it either way, he'll definitely spot her and race her down. 
she looks around frantically and notices a small nook leading to the establishment next door. It's tiny, but she squeezes herself into it the best she can. Within seconds, she can hear the back door to the dive bar open and someone step out. She knows it's him when she hears him let out a breath of disappointment. Her hopes are high that he'll give up and go back into the dive bar when she feels a strong hand wrap around her throat, heave her out into the alley, and then bang her up against the brick wall. Who are you? Platinum tries to speak, but can't due to the pressure around her throat. Ski Mask notices this and loosens his grip just enough for her to speak. Platinum has been around long enough to know that it's obvious she is dealing with a murderer, and his wicked eyes tell her that he has no qualms about killing her. She knows that she may be dead whether she explains who she really is or not, so she opts not to blow her cover just yet. She attempts to explain that she's nothing but a meaningless whore. It would normally get her out of a jam like this, but Ski Mask isn't buying it. The reason? She doesn't smell like a whore. Doesn't smell like a whore? Seriously? This guy knows his stuff. Who do you work for? The killer in front of her is intelligent. He knows she's been tracking him and she's not going to be able to get out of this. Perhaps spilling the beans on Claire will save her. Perhaps not, but it's the only card she has left and she's damn well going to play all of her cards before she dies. Fortunately, the intelligent killer is also impatient and provides an out for her. You work for them, don't you? Them? She's not sure what he's talking about and she doesn't care. She knows that if she plays this correctly, she may live to see tomorrow. By playing dumb, she's hoping he may elaborate. Them? And it works. The old man and the guy with the long face and wild hair. The description fits the men who hit him with the car, and then carted him into the house. This is a total shot in the dark, but Platinum feels that she needs to take the initiative. She can't just answer yes and hope for the best. If he begins questioning her, she'll likely fall off the rails quickly. So she presents him with an option, hoping this may let her off the hook. You should talk to them. You might be interested in what they have to say. Ski Mask is studying her. She should find out whether she lives or dies within a few seconds. His evil stare is hard to read, but if she had to bet money on it, she'd bet on death. The dachshund barking causes Ski Mask to look down at him, breaking the cold stare from Platinum. With his hands still around her throat, Platinum can feel a shift in his energy. Within seconds, he lets her go and disappears inside the bar. Platinum stands, gasping for a moment, and then lets out a wail of a breath. She doubles over, thinking she is going to vomit, but the nausea clears quickly. She stands back up and rubs her throat. That was close, you lucky bitch. Chapter 4 Terminated Claire brings the knife down to her forearm and runs it across her flesh. She winces as blood rounds her arm and drips into the stainless steel sink in the kitchen. The slice stings, but it eases her stress. I should have never done it. Claire's curiosity had reached a crossroads. She was either going to be content with the situation and continue with the status quo, or make a bold move to satisfy her nosiness. She would have had no problem standing by her decision had this been a moral stand of refusing to carry on if her employer was committing atrocious acts. But that's not the case, and it never was. Over the years, her assumptions were that Ski Mask's life revolved around something abominable in nature, but Claire had told herself that as long as he wasn't abusive toward animals, she wasn't going to stick her nose in it. His genuine love for his animals over the years, a side of Ski Mask she came to realize most others had never seen, made her confident that any malice being doled out was certainly not involving the creatures for whom her life revolves, and that was enough for her. And it still is. 
Her need to know more stems from a selfish need. Her growing care for him has manifested into a need to be a larger part of his life, to be something important to him. And everything appears to be moving in that direction, but her impatience led her to this mistake. A tear rolls down her cheek at the thought of having possibly ruined everything. Another cut across her arm restrains her emotion. Keep it together. Does he know? If he knew, he would probably have said something, or worse. Claire lets out a groan and she puts another slice in her forearm. She turns her head when she hears whimpering behind her. All seven dogs are watching her. They are aware that she is in pain and seem concerned. Madeline is whining and tilting her head in confusion. Floppy and Dempsey both let out anxious yelps. It's okay. Claire wraps a dish towel around her arm, steps off the apple crate, and begins rubbing the dogs, who instantly relax. I'm all right. You don't have to worry, but thank you. Dempsey aggressively kisses Claire, knocking her backwards and causing her to giggle heartily as she pushes Dempsey away. Okay, okay, I love you too. Claire's happy moment instantly changes to concern as the perimeter alarm goes off. Ski Mask definitely shouldn't be back yet. Who can it be? Claire hurries to the main room and checks the monitors. She is exasperated to see Platinum getting out of her old car and looking around. Claire presses the intercom button. What are you doing here? Hello, sweet one. Wait right there. Claire pulls her shirt sleeve down over her freshly cut arm and storms out the door into the courtyard while huffing to herself. I can't believe this doggone nonsense. Claire makes her way through the underground passage, opens the bulkhead door, and emerges onto the road next to Platinum. Are you crazy? I think I'm a little crazy about you, yeah. What do you think you're doing here? You could have just messaged me and I would have met you in town. I thought this would be easier on you. I'm all about making life easier on you. Platinum grins seductively. How did you even find this place? I told you, following is my specialty. I tailed your boss here last night. Seemed like the kind of place that would have motion detectors galore, so I couldn't get close until he left. If Ski Mask comes back, we're both dead. I know, but I watched him leave. I'm confident that we have some time. Platinum strolls closer to the bulkhead doors that Claire emerged from. Where does this lead to? Claire puts herself in between the bulkhead door and Platinum. Her perturbed level is reaching its maximum. None of your business. You need to leave. Oh, don't you want to know what I found out? Claire stops and thinks for a brief time before answering. No. No? I'm sorry I hired you. I shouldn't have spied on him. This whole thing was a mistake. Claire takes some cash out of her pants pocket. How much do I owe you? Platinum moves closer to Claire. If you don't want the info, there's no charge. She leans her face in uncomfortably close to Claire's. I want my customers to be thoroughly satisfied, baby. Claire backs away from Platinum. Well, then good day, ma'am. Ma'am? Oh, you are the sweetest thing I've ever seen. The way you look, the way you talk, I can only imagine the way you taste. Ew! That was uncalled for and that is enough. Please leave. Platinum licks her lips and smiles. Your boss is a killer. What? I wouldn't feel right without letting you know that much. Claire doesn't respond. Her eyes dart around slightly as she takes in the information. Platinum studies Claire's face and comes to a realization. I just confirmed what you already suspected. Platinum's face takes on a concerned expression. Is he abusing you, darling? Of course not. Because if he is, I can help you. He is not harming me in any way. The only one who did any harm was me. I let my curiosity get the better of me and acted on it when I should have minded my own flipping business. I wonder if a good little girl like you would stick with this maniac if you knew more about him. 
I can find those things out if you'd like. No, no, no! You are not hired anymore. That, that, that's right. You are fired. Terminated. Effective immediately. Now, for the last time, please leave these premises. Platinum pauses, looks Claire up and down, and grins as she gets into her car. After starting the engine and rolling down the window, Platinum sticks her head out and offers some parting words before motoring away. I hope to see you soon, my petite cutie pie. Claire just wants this all to go away. Her plan is to go back inside, settle in with a nice book, and do her best to forget. It won't be easy, but she'll try. She watches as Platinum drives off, hoping this will be the last she sees of her. But she has the sinking feeling that it won't be. Chapter 5 Stalker Something drives everyone. That thought drums through Platinum's mind as she follows Ski Mask. Stalks him. What was it about that cute, diminutive girl? She was attractive, but not stunning. Platinum had sexual encounters with much more beautiful women than this one. Most people would describe Claire as plain, even though they would have to admit that her blue eyes are striking. Her minuscule size puts her in the adorable range of the scale, and her squeaky voice is fitting. But it's the way she exudes innocence that has driven Platinum over the edge. A purity so rare in this world that Platinum gets weak in the knees at the thought of corrupting it. Her competition for this delicate flower is formidable. Ski Mask Claire described him as an employer, but it's clear he's more than that. Platinum has been around the block more than once. She knows what Ski Mask is. A cold-blooded killer. Surely a sweet thing like Claire would object to being part of his life once she learns the truth. And where would she go from there? Certainly she would need someone to comfort her, and surely that person would be welcomed into her life. Platinum took a patient path, gathering evidence over time that would prove to Claire what a monster she is sharing her life with. And the evidence piled up quickly, culminating in the destruction of the deadly Medusa at Club Fun. But Claire was with him. Discovering them that night was unexpected. Platinum was there looking for someone new to allow inside of her. Someone unassuming and innocent, not unlike Claire. She thought she found her target, a nerdy man with black-rimmed glasses, a comb-over, and unkempt shirt. He was out of place, likely his first time in club fun. Platinum approached the man and could feel his hampered breath as she rubbed his chest. She moved toward the corridor to observe which room he entered. This would give her an idea as to what this meek man was seeking. And that's when she saw them. Ski Mask and Claire. Together. She followed them to the snake room. She waited and watched as Ski Mask carried Claire out of the room like a scene off of some damn romance novel cover. Claire is getting closer to him. They are becoming a larger part of each other's lives. The stakes have been raised. Chapter 6 Love at First Sight in the back of her mind, Claire always feared that Platinum would rear her head again. But that fear had dissipated considerably because she hadn't seen any evidence of Platinum since the day she terminated her. When Ski Mask mentioned to Franklin that he saw her in Club Fun, her fear returned. Claire knew there was a chance they may run into Platinum since she is known to frequent the place. Claire was reluctant to enter, but Ski Mask expected her to come with him. He didn't even ask, he just spoke as though it was a given. She couldn't pass up this opportunity. Refusal was not an option. Claire just hoped that if Platinum was there, she wouldn't see them. And until Ski Mask said otherwise, she had assumed that was the case. 
After Ski Mask had left for the day, Claire found herself looking out the window, wondering what the best way to correct the Platinum mistake would be. Sure, if Platinum continued to stay away, all would be fine, but the guilt had been weighing on Claire, and she had come to a decision. When Ski Mask returns home, she'll come clean and let the chips fall as they may. Hopefully he'll understand. Hopefully he'll forgive her. A sharp stress pain echoes through her abdomen, and she begins to make her way to the kitchen to cut her arm when the alarms go off. Claire rushes to the monitors, and her fears are confirmed. Platinum is standing confidently next to the bulkhead doors. Oh, shoot. The bulkhead doors swing open with force as Claire stomps out toward Platinum. What in the world are you doing here? Did you think I forgot about you? Platinum, it's time for you to go. I'll go when I'm good and ready. I saw your boyfriend carrying you out of the snake room. So heroic. He's not my boyfriend. Before Claire can continue, Platinum shoves a cell phone in front of her face and scrolls through the series of pictures she had gathered during her stalking. The pictures show Ski Mask in various stages of kidnapping or killing people. Your boyfriend is a psychopathic serial killer. He'll kill you too, Claire. It's only a matter of time. He would never. Not even if I told him that you hired me to follow him. Claire stands confidently. You're too late. I already told him everything. Platinum grins. You lie like a champ. Claire's body loosens. Well, I'm going to tell him. And when you do, he'll kill you. But it doesn't have to be that way, Claire. I can take you away from all of this. I can protect you. I'll be your mother, your companion, and your lover. We can be as one. Claire cringes as she comes to a realization. Oh my goodness. You are completely insane. Platinum scowls and loses her temper. I'll tell you who is insane. Your fucking lover. First of all, he's not my lover. Second of all, watch your language. And third of all, maybe he is insane, but we're all insane in some respect. Platinum, her mouth agape, is astonished as she finally realizes. You love him. That's none of your business. It is my business, because I love you. What? You don't even know me. Don't you believe in love at first sight? I loved you from the second I put my eyes on you. And you'll love me, too. Let me make this perfectly clear so there is no misunderstanding. I despise you. I will never love you. And when Ski Mask gets home, I'm going to tell him everything. If I were you, I'd go far away, because he may be mad at me, but he'll kill you. Platinum smirks. Not if I kill him first. Platinum slaps Claire, sending her to the ground, and quickly hops into her Buick and peels away. Claire picks herself up off the ground and rubs her cheek. Her rage at Platinum quickly transforms into fear for Ski Mask. Chapter 7 Crime Scene Tamale Jones jumps up from his desk when Claire bursts into the room in a panic. Do you know where Ski Mask is? Claire can see that Tamale is struggling to recall who she is. I was with Ski Mask, remember? Oh yeah, you're that little tootsie with the nice peepers. And you looked familiar to me. I could have sworn we had met before. We did! Claire moves swiftly to Tamale and grabs him by the tweed vest. You referred me to that psycho Platinum. I did? For what? I needed someone followed. Ah, well, she is nifty at following folks, but she's a little nutty. She shakes Tamale and yells. You didn't tell me about the nutty part, you son of a bacon bit? Easy, easy, I'm sorry. I must have been in a rush. Where is Ski Mask? He went to the hellhole. It's that seedy place down by the river. Claire lets him go and rushes out of the office. 
Seedy was an understatement. The smell almost knocks her over. She stands out like a diamond against the scummy people frequenting the building. Some of the dregs begin walking toward her. She hurries inside, assuming their intentions are not wholesome. The smell inside is worse. Claire immediately holds her nose. Ew, that is gross. She can feel the eyes of the room spotlight on her. She clearly doesn't belong there. She can almost see the bubbles of thought above the occupants' heads as they dream of ways they can take advantage of her. She scans the room quickly and doesn't see Ski Mask, who would be easy to spot amongst the grubby clientele. She determines that it will be best for her to get out of here before any of the inhabitants can act on their impulses. Claire moves rapidly through the sea of people and rushes out the back exit. She looks to the right and sees nothing. As she looks to her left, a blinding flash of lightning makes her wince. A slap of thunder roars overhead as she witnesses Platinum rush at Ski Mask from behind, bringing her hand to the front of his throat and slicing. Claire tries to let out a scream, but nothing emits except for breath. From her view, she can see Ski Mask clutching at his throat and drop to his knees from weakness. Claire moves in closer until she is standing next to Platinum. As Ski Mask turns to view his assailant, his eyes lock with Claire's. Claire gasps at the fury in his eyes when he sees her. He thinks I was in on this! Before Claire can utter a word, the life remaining in Ski Mask's eyes clouds over and he falls forward. No! Claire turns to Platinum. What have you done? I just eliminated my competition. As Platinum turns and grins at Claire, she sees Claire's face begin to boil red with anger. Platinum doesn't drop her grin as she pulls a small blackjack out from under her skirt and hits Claire in the head with it, dropping her like a bag of sand. Chapter 8 Rage Lightning explodes overhead. Thunder rolls. Ski Mask awakens. In the death room, Ski Mask didn't even acknowledge his friend, the Light. He stood waiting to be catapulted back into the world so he can take his revenge on that bitch Platinum and Claire. It was Claire. As much as he'd like to think otherwise, it was her, standing next to Platinum, watching as he faded away. How long had they been plotting this? How long had she been a complete fraud? Did the woman he knew never exist? Was she nothing more than a facade? It doesn't matter. All that matters is that she dies at my hands, soon. As he jumps up from the ground, another flash of lightning brightens the area, and buckets of rain begin to pour down. He begins marching forward as druggies scatter from the woods like cockroaches as they attempt to find shelter. A permanent snarl affixes itself to Ski Mask's face, and his eyebrows furrow. Even through the sheets of rain, the riffraff of people can't miss the rage proceeding toward them and give him plenty of clearance with the exception of one disoriented man who stumbles into Ski Mask. Ski Mask growls and unleashes his fury on the hapless man. Ski Mask grabs him by the shirt and pounds him against the side of the building at least a dozen times before spinning him around and smashing his face into the wall. He finishes him off by quickly snapping his neck and tossing him to the ground. Ski Mask turns and sneers at the crowd like a hungry wolf standing over fresh prey. Wisely, they run, for everyone who slows him down will feel his wrath. Why? Recently the highlight of Ski Mask's day was coming home to see Claire. While at the hospital, he often found himself looking forward to sharing a seat with her in the parrot room relaxing with her, enjoying her company. Why? Ski Mask gnashes his teeth together as rain cascades down the windshield. The wipers can only clear it enough to create a blur, but that is all Ski Mask needs to make his way home. Why? He never trusted anyone enough to consider having them assist him in any way, 
until Claire. Why? He turns down off the main road to the long, quiet road. The muscles in his jaw begin to twitch from the constant contraction of his snarl. Why? She didn't judge him. She wasn't repulsed when she discovered who he was. She cared for him. He could genuinely feel it. And he cared for her. They were a team. And those eyes. Those lovely eyes. Why? Schemas turns onto his road. His breathing increases, forcing strands of saliva through his exposed teeth and pushing out growls with each exhale. How could she do this to me? To us? His heart pounds against his chest as he skids to a stop outside the bulkhead doors. He is a volcano about to erupt. The Reaper has arrived. Schemas gets out of his truck and notices that the bulkhead doors are open. He sees the old Buick parked outside that doesn't belong there. Schemas flies down the stairs and through the underground corridor. He doesn't slow as he reaches the courtyard and storms toward the door. He can make out Platinum and Claire standing in the main room through the bay window. Schemas's pace does not slow as he picks up a metal patio chair and hurls it through the window. Chapter 9 Eruption A clap of thunder erupts and Claire opens her eyes. The Buick's red dashboard detailed with faw wood grain is the first thing she notices. She turns to see Platinum struggling to see through the waterfall of rain, rushing down the windshield, but glances quickly at Claire and shoots her a smile. Claire rises up and looks around as she gets her bearings and notices that Platinum is holding a 9mm compact pistol and pointing it in her direction. Where are we going? Platinum's smile grows as she clues Claire in. Home. Platinum pulls up next to the bulkhead doors and stops. Let's go. Claire reluctantly follows Platinum's orders and they both rush to the bulkhead doors. Claire quickly enters the code on the keypad and swings open the heavy door. Platinum urges Claire along by shoving the muzzle of the gun against the middle of her back. Claire moves as ordered and they quickly move through the underground corridor. The rain pelts their skin as they hurry to the main entrance. Claire enters, followed closely by Platinum who shuts the door behind them. The clicking of paws echo throughout the room as all seven dogs rush in to greet Claire and slow when they notice the stranger behind her. The greyhound Slick bares his fangs and growls. He races toward Platinum with the other six in support behind him. Platinum raises her gun toward the dog and pulls the trigger. Claire pushes her arm to the side, sending the bullet astray. Before Platinum can aim again, Claire shouts, Sit! All seven dogs come to a halt and sit. Stay. The dogs stay put and keep their eyes locked on Platinum. Some of them whine slightly, others suppress their growls. Claire steps in front of Platinum, blocking her from taking an easy shot at any of the dogs. Please don't shoot them. They'll stay there as long as I tell them to. I hate dogs. We'll have to get rid of them all eventually anyhow. May as well be now. Claire holds up her hands. No, please. Platinum holds her arms out momentarily, motioning to the room. This is all mine now. You're mine, too. And so are these mutts. And I say they die. As she begins to raise her pistol, she is distracted by footsteps running down the east wing corridor. Platinum turns her gun on Alfred as he rushes into the main room. Claire, is everything okay? He freezes when he sees the gun pointing at him. Who is this old fool? That's Alfred. Don't shoot him. It's getting crowded in here with mongrels and old men. It's time to make more room for us. No! Platinum puts her finger on the trigger and jumps when she hears the crash behind her. She quickly turns to see the metal chair bursting through the window with ski mask behind it. Shit! Platinum looks at Ski Mask with shock. 
I killed you! She wildly fires at Ski Mask, but misses badly as he marches forward. Her hands begin to shake with fear as she sees the rage in Ski Mask's eyes. They almost have a red glow about them. His face is wrinkled up into a wolf-like snarl as he bares his teeth like a wild animal. She tries to line up another shot and fires again, but her hands are shaking to the point where this bullet also misses the mark. Platinum has never fired a gun at someone bearing down on her like this. She's heard stories that even the most experienced gunmen can lose their accuracy in the pressure of a gunfight. The infamous gunfight at the OK Corral saw 30 shots fired in 30 seconds. Even with the participants occasionally no less than 6 feet away from each other, fewer than half of the shots hit their mark. In her panicked state, Platinum opts to focus on a closer target. She needs to do something to slow Ski Mask long enough to gain her composure. Platinum grabs Claire by the hair, pulls her close, and puts the gun to her head. She can't miss from this range. Stop, or I'll blow her brains out. Ski Mask does not slow. Platinum whirls around, steps backward, and points the gun at Alfred. I'll shoot him! Stop! Ski Mask does not slow. Platinum pushes Claire to the ground and points her gun at Madeline's big St. Bernard head. Stop! Ski Mask stops in his tracks. He holds the expression of rage, but Platinum can see a hint of concern break through the fury in his eyes. Platinum takes several breaths, composes herself, and regains confidence in her aim. Still holding Madeline in her sights, Platinum flashes a spiteful grin at Ski Mask and pulls the trigger. The shot hits Madeline between the eyes. She falls in a heap without a whimper. Platinum continues to fire down the line, Slick, Dempsey, Floppy, Trip, and Snowman. They all take direct hits in the head or chest. Some let out one last cry before dropping over, others fall without a sound. Max is the lone remaining dog. He looks to Ski Mask for help just as the shots hit him, pushing him backwards and twisting him to his side. Platinum turns the gun onto Ski Mask. His face is red. His spiked hair silhouetted against the light appear like flames. The white of his eyes have turned red, giving him a monstrous appearance. She would be most fearful if not for the gun she has aimed at him and the knowledge that the trigger is about to be pulled. Adios, Ski Mask. As Platinum's finger touches the trigger, she is surprised to hear a growl. She turns her head to see the massive St. Bernard sitting up. Saliva drips from her formidable fangs as she stands and positions herself to leap. Platinum's jaw drops as Slick rises into standing position, snarling and enraged. In succession, Dempsey, Floppy, Trip, Snowman, and Max all open their eyes and stand. All begin to growl and fix their stares on Platinum, with the exception of Max, who stares at Ski Mask and yelps happily as his stick tail beats the floor. The shock of the sight distracts Platinum to the point where Ski Mask is able to launch himself forward and is on Platinum before she can react. He grabs the gun, rips it from her hand, and tosses it to the floor while grabbing Platinum by the throat and raising her up off the ground. While still holding her high in the air, he tosses her against the wall. The room fills with a symphony of barks as the pack of dogs seem to cheer Ski Mask on. Ski Mask races to Platinum, lifts her up, wraps his hands around both sides of her head, and places his thumbs over her eyes. Her blood-curdling scream can be heard over the dogs barking as Ski Mask shoves his thumbs in until he feels a pop deep within her skull. In one quick motion, he hurls her to the floor face first and flips open the knife from his belt. He is a blur as he positions his knee against the middle of her spine. He attempts to pull her head up, but her wig comes off in his hand, unveiling her stringy natural black hair. He tosses the platinum wig aside and pulls her head back, revealing her throat. In a frenzy, he brings the knife down into her throat again and again, cutting through flesh, tendons, and muscles. He pulls up on her hair as the barrage of stabbing continues. 
Platinum screams turn into a slurp, like that of a straw sucking up the last bit of a milkshake. The remaining flesh strands of her neck break free from her shoulders, and Ski Mask flings her head across the room. Alfred watches on in shock. My god! A blood-spattered Ski Mask fixes his penetrating stare onto Claire and screams at her. You bitch! Claire holds up her hands as Ski Mask advances. No, no, it's not what you think. You lying, conniving tramp. Please, no. You whore. No, please, listen to me. Why should I believe anything you say? You're probably a filthy little slut, too. I am not a slut. I am a virgin. I've never even been kissed in my entire life. I'm as pure as it gets. You're a liar. You're a traitor. He grasps her by the throat and pins her against the fireplace. Claire tries to plead for her life, but his vice-like grip tightens so quickly she can't even get a breath out. Ski Mask, please, don't kill her! Ski Mask glares at Alfred before he can finish his sentence. Alfred quakes in fear and winces slightly, as Ski Mask's expression clearly conveyed a message. Shut up or die. Ski Mask continues to squeeze and can feel Claire's throat about to collapse in on her. She flails away at her throat with her hands and kicks her legs helplessly as her eyes roll back into her head and her skin begins to turn blue. All of the dogs have moved closer to the fracas and encircled the two. Their barks have turned defensive and choppy growling barks ensue. Ski Mask hears none of it as he watches Claire begin to die in his clutch. Madeline bares her teeth and gets closer to Ski Mask, pleading with him to stop. With the exception of Max, who cries sadly from afar, the entire pack of dogs move closer in aggressive fashion, but it's Madeline who makes the decisive move. The giant St. Bernard leaps through the air, snapping her jaws in objection as her body slams against Ski Mask. The force of the blow causes Ski Mask to drop Claire and crash to the floor. Claire immediately begins coughing and clasps her throat in pain as Madeline takes a protective posture between her and Ski Mask. Ski Mask, still enraged, begins to rise up, but pauses when he notices a pulsating stream of blood splashing against the wall. Confused, he paws at his throat and feels his blood gushing from the corroded artery that Madeline inadvertently severed with her fang. Madeline's eyes droop sadly, and she begins to whimper as Ski Mask eyes her curiously. Madeline! Ski Mask can say no more as his strength vanishes and he slumps backward onto the floor. The End The Nine Lives of Ski Mask continues with Life 8 Maniac. The Nine Lives of Ski Mask, Life 8, Maniac. Chapter 1, Sabotage. Marciano stands at attention in front of John Bromley's room. The floor is extremely quiet this morning, not an unusual occurrence before the first shift arrives. To his left, the corridor is empty. To his right, he sees guard number 14 sitting at his station outside the stairwell door. Number 14 is reading a magazine. Normally, Marciano would reprimand the guard for not being fully focused, but due to the stillness of this particular morning, Marciano opts for leniency. Marciano closes his eyes to enhance his sense of hearing. Most mornings, he can hear John Bromley pacing behind the door, but today, he is silent. The only sounds he can make out are the occasional magazine page being turned by number 14, and surprisingly, the faint singing of birds outside. Marciano smiles and takes in a deep relaxing breath, but the pleasant melody of the feathered creatures is disrupted by the fast-paced hammering of boots colliding with the cold, tiled floor. Marciano? Marciano remains steady in his stoic stance as he turns his head to see guard number 18 racing toward him in a panic. What is it? Your mother! Marciano's professional demeanor immediately melts away as he is overcome by anxiety. He grabs number 18 by the shirt, pulling him closer. 
What about her? Dispatch said she called asking for you. She said she needed help, and then the phone went dead. Marciano tosses number 18 to the side, pulls out his cell phone, and dials his mother's number. As it rings, he starts moving briskly toward the elevator. When there is no answer, he breaks into a full run. Guard number 25 sits at his station next to a rarely used side entrance. He has earphones on and is swaying his head back and forth as he listens to Iron Maiden's Fear of the Dark. He is startled when someone begins to shake him. Get those headphones off! I was yelling for you from all the way down the hall! Guard number 25 sheepishly removes the headphones. Sorry. Guard number 3 shakes his head. If Ski Mask saw you with those headphones on, it would be your ass. I know, it just gets so boring at this station. Well, come on, you're not supposed to be here today anyhow. What do you mean? The deadbolt expansion is set to begin construction today. They'll be using this entrance to haul in equipment. I thought that was next week. Guard number three holds up a clipboard. It was, but according to this itinerary, it begins today. It must have been moved up again. Come with me, I need you to help me at the main entrance. The two guards move up the corridor together, leaving the side entrance unguarded. Marciano peels into the apartment complex and skids onto the grass near the stairwell. He jumps out of the still-running vehicle, not bothering to shut the door, and races up the stairs, down a corridor, and rushes into the apartment. Ma? Ma? Where are ya? He darts in and out of the bedroom, the bathroom, and the kitchen before stopping in the living room and freezing. His mother is sitting stiffly in her recliner, with her open eyes affixed on the television screen. Marciano's voice cracks as he screams out. Ma! The old woman slowly turns her head and smiles when she sees her boy. Marciano, what are you doing home? Marciano's panicked state is instantly replaced with relief. Ma? He rushes to her side, grabs both of her arms, and looks into her weathered eyes. You're okay! Of course I'm okay. Marciano wraps his frail mother in a bear hug. Okay, boy, you can let me go now. You're suffocating me. He lets her go. Sorry, Ma. I, I was just worried about you. What for? They said you called, that you called for help. Called for help? I didn't call anyone for help. I've been sitting here watching Murder, She Wrote. You didn't call? Are you deaf, boy? No. Now bring me some juice, please. Marciano stands up and looks around as he thinks and begins whispering to himself. If you didn't call, then who did? Guard number 14 closes his magazine and looks at his watch. He appears impatient and he gazes about the empty corridor and runs his hand through his bushy blonde hair. He turns when he hears a familiar voice. You look restless. Oh, hi Dr. Clark. Yeah, my replacement was supposed to be here by now. He looks at his watch again. I guess he's running late. Oh yes, I suppose someone forgot to tell you. He's been delayed. He should be here soon. Guard number 14 lets out a frustrated sigh and sits down. Dr. Clark stares at the young guard for a moment, sympathetically. Listen, I have some paperwork to finish up. I can do it here. Go on home. I'll man your station until he gets here. Number 14 is visibly pleased by the offer, but then appears dejected. Oh, thanks, Dr. Clark. I really appreciate that, but Ski Mask would be furious if he found out I left before the next shift arrived. Dr. Clark leans in and smiles. I won't tell him if you don't. Number 14 smiles. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Clark. Guard number 14 walks down the corridor toward the elevators. Once number 14 is out of sight, Dr. Clark opens up the stairwell door a few inches, bends down, and uses a thin block of wood as a doorstop, just barely keeping it propped open enough to keep it from latching. This is exactly what he did with the door on the first floor, which opens next to the side entrance that is currently unmanned. Dr. Clark looks around to make sure no one is watching, and swiftly moves to John Bromley's room. He unlocks the door, jiggling the keys loudly, and then hurries into an empty room across the hall. 
Dr. Clark stealthily peeps out of the room and watches as John Bromley cautiously opens his door and scans the area. Dr. Clark is surprised at how fast a man of Bromley's size moves as he watches him scurry to the stairwell door. Bromley pushes the unlatched stairwell door open and rushes through. Dr. Clark lets out a breath of relief and smiles. Chapter 2 Betrayal Ski Mask opens his eyes and looks down at Madeline. Her giant head is on his thigh. She is staring at him with the saddest eyes Ski Mask has ever seen. She whimpers glumly. Ski Mask takes in a breath and pats the big dog on top of her head. It's okay, girl, don't you worry. I'm fine. Madeline's eyes brighten and her mammoth tail begins to wag, beating against Max who had fallen asleep by her hind end. Max gives a frisky bark when he sees that Ski Mask is alive and well, and Madeline rises and begins licking Ski Mask's face aggressively, causing him to chuckle. His animals are the only thing that could put a smile on his face right now. Okay, okay girl, it's okay. I know you didn't mean to hurt me. You were just protecting... Ski Mask can't bring himself to say Claire's name. Her. He gives the big dog a hug as the rest of the pack join in and crowd around Ski Mask, jumping on him, licking him, and playfully barking. Ski Mask smiles, pets them all thoroughly, and rises. He notices Alfred sitting in a nearby chair watching him. Ski Mask is seething when he asks the question, but suppresses it for the dog's sake. Where is she? She left. Where did she go? I don't know. She got up, started to cry, and ran out. Ski Mask scans around and thinks for a moment before turning his attention back to Alfred. You okay? Yes. I think so. Ski Mask nods as he walks across the room and kicks Platinum's head out of his way. Is there something I can do? Ski Mask shakes his head and exits the room via the North Wing Corridor. He stops when he is halfway down the hall. He focuses in on Claire's pink bedroom, a color associated with peace, kindness, love, not fitting of the traitor it belongs to. Ski Mask steps into the room and looks around. It's always tidy, not unlike his room or the rest of the house. He sits down onto the plush bed and sinks into her mattress cover. It's softer and more comfortable than his bed. He lies back and looks up at the wood-planked ceiling. One by one, all seven dogs jump up on the bed with him. He takes turns rubbing them equally. Madeline and Max nuzzle up with each other, as do Dempsey and Floppy. Trip and Snowman lay their heads on Ski Mask's chest. Slick positions himself at the foot of the bed and watches the doorway, guarding. Ski Mask focuses in on two ladybugs walking on the wood planks above him. They give the appearance of moving knots. Normally this kind of sight would relax Ski Mask, but the wheels in his mind are spinning with rage as he thinks about Claire and the myriad of ways he's going to make her pay for her betrayal. Ski Mask opens his eyes as the phone rings. He looks around the room. The dogs are all asleep, and rays of sunlight are piercing through the pink bedroom curtains. I must have dozed off. He picks up his phone and places it to his ear. Yeah. He is greeted by the frantic voice of Dr. Grimm. Ski Mask, I need you here now. There's been another escape. Chapter 3 Missing Person As Dr. Grimm walks down the fourth floor corridor, he grows bewildered by the lack of activity. He stops in his tracks when he realizes there is no guard at the stairwell post or in front of John Bromley's room. This is concerning. Dr. Grimm steps to Bromley's room and feels the blood rush from his head when he notices the door is slightly ajar. He cautiously pushes the door open to reveal the empty room. 
A panicked Dr. Grimm immediately shuts the door and locks it. He whirls around startled when he hears a voice behind him. Good morning, Dr. Grimm. Dr. Grimm watches as guard number 11 takes his position by the stairwell door. Wait a minute, why haven't you been at your post? I just got here. Where is the guard you're relieving? Guard number 11 shrugs. I don't know. Dr. Grimm is about to continue the interrogation, but is interrupted by the footsteps rushing down the corridor. He turns to see Marciano racing toward him. Where have you been? Why aren't you at your post? Sweat is dripping off of Marciano's face. He leans over, puts his hands on his thighs for support, and takes several deep breaths before responding to Dr. Grimm's question. I'm sorry, Dr. Grimm. I got called away on an emergency. Have you seen John Bromley today? Marciano and guard number 11 glance at each other and seem troubled by this question. He's in his room, isn't he? Marciano moves toward John Bromley's room, but Dr. Grimm quickly blocks his progress and speaks with a frantic tone. Well, well yes, of, of course he's in his room. I'm just asking if you've seen him yet today. Uh, no. They both look at number 11, who shakes his head. They don't know that he's gone. H has anyone else been up here to see him? Any doctors? Anybody? No, not while I was here, and I wasn't gone long, I promise. Dr. Grimm seems to go into an anxious trance and begins running his hands through his hair as he begins to pace and whisper to himself. Okay. Okay. Marciano crinkles his brow in confusion. Are you all right, Dr. Grimm? Marciano's voice shakes Dr. Grimm from his daze. Uh, what? Y yes, 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 I'm, 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 I'm fine. He moves toward Marciano and speaks with purpose. Listen to me. No one is to go into John Bromley's room. Do you hear me? No one. No doctors, no security, no maintenance, no one. Am I clear? Marciano nods. Yes, sir. Dr. Grimm thinks quickly. He's, uh, uh, we're experimenting with some medications, and he may be more aggressive than usual for the next few days. So no one is allowed in that room other than me and Ski Mask. Understand? Yes, sir. You have nothing to worry about. Nobody will get past me. Dr. Grimm walks casually away from the guards, and the moment he turns the corner, he dashes to his office. He hollers at his secretary as he runs past her. Hold all of my calls. He shuts the office door behind him and takes out his phone. Ski Mask, I need you here now. There's been another escape. Chapter 4 A Plan Dr. Grimm paces around his office nervously as he explains to Ski Mask what transpired. So you're telling me nobody was at the stairwell station and Marciano wasn't guarding Bromley's door? Y yes, that's what I'm saying. Son of a bitch. Ski Mask storms to Dr. Grimm's office door, opens it, and is about to march out to deal with his guards when Dr. Grimm grabs him from behind while pleading against this measure. No, 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 please, wait. Ski Mask stops and barks at him. Someone sabotaged us and managed to manipulate my guard somehow. Unacceptable. And I plan on getting to the bottom of this right now. <laughs> please, just listen to me for a minute. They don't know. They don't know that Bromley escaped. I don't think anybody does, yet. If you go to them now to find out what happened, word will leak out. Let's just focus on capturing John Bromley first, and then you can conduct your investigation as to what happened. Ski Mask takes in a deep, restraining breath as he ponders the suggestion. Fine. Dr. Grimm is visibly relieved. Oh, good. Good. Okay, so what's the plan? How do we catch him? You mean, how do I catch him? Ski Mask only has to think for a few seconds before he gathers a plan. He'll go back to his old house. I'll be waiting for him. Back to his old house? Dr. Grimm clearly doesn't share Ski Mask's certainty. That would be a dumb move, and John Bromley isn't dumb. No, he's not, but he's insane. He's a pathetic serial killer with daddy issues. I can read him like a book. Dr. Grimm lets out a breath. 
Okay, well, good luck. This won't be easy. Ski Mask is insulted by this. Yes, it will. Bromley is no match for me. This is a stroll in the park. Ski Mask begins walking out the open door accompanied by Dr. Grimm, and they both stop when they notice his secretary Gloria staring at them. Her initial expression is one of shock, but she quickly flashes them a fake smile. Dr. Grimm hastily ushers Ski Mask back into his office, shuts the door behind them, and locks it. Shit. The door was open, she heard everything. Dr. Grimm's eyes dart around like a crazed man as he ponders how to handle this. How to keep Gloria silent. He eyes Ski Mask as the quick idea of eliminating her rushes through his mind. Ski Mask reads this thought by the way of Dr. Grimm's expression. What? You don't want me to kill her, do you? Dr. Grimm immediately pushes that prospect from his mind. No, 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 no. Good secretaries are too hard to find. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll handle Gloria, and you handle Bromley, Th then we'll get to the bottom of all of this. Ski Mask nods, opens the door, and exits. Dr. Grimm follows him, but as Ski Mask continues and exits the secretary's room, Dr. Grimm stops and smiles at Gloria. Um, you didn't hear what we were just talking about, did you? Gloria reluctantly nods. You heard... Everything? Again, she reluctantly nods. I won't say anything, though, if you don't want me to. Dr. Grimm grows excited. Yes, yes, a good girl. Don't say a word. Pretend like you never heard a thing. Gloria nods as Dr. Grimm lets out a relieved breath. Oh, okay, that was easy. Um, Ski Mask will be gone for a few days. If anyone asks, just tell them that he's on vacation this week. After a few seconds... Gloria starts to giggle. What? what? What's so funny? <laughs> Where does a guy like Ski Mask go on vacation? You think he goes to the beach? Think he kicks back in Bermuda shorts and sips tropical drinks through a straw, all while wearing his Ski Mask? She lets out a loud laugh. Dr. Grimm ponders this image and lets out a genuine chuckle before regaining a serious expression. Okay, hold all my calls. Yes, Dr. Grimm. He nods and gives her a courtesy smile before retreating back into the comfort of his office. Chapter 5 Preoccupied Ski Mask parks down the road from the old Bromley house. It's a large white Victorian structure with green trim. Whoever currently lives there has kept it up nicely. It's well maintained and fancily decorated. Ski Mask exits his vehicle, strolls up to the house, and looks in through the side window. He can see the front room of the house. The antique furnishings fit well in this dwelling. The room is quite colorful, but void of people. Thus he moves along to a window toward the back of the house. The copper pots and pans hanging above a counter instantly give away that this is the kitchen. Before he can take in more of the decor, he notices movement. An average-sized balding man in his fifties sits down at the kitchen table with a bottle of Vaseline and a magazine. As the man holds up the magazine, a centerfold of a naked woman drops out and the man begins to masturbate enthusiastically. Ski Mask whispers to himself, Pervert. Ski Mask begins walking back to the car. Obviously, John Bromley hasn't arrived yet, or this degenerate wouldn't be alive. As he approaches his vehicle, he notices a young boy of about seven years old with a Dutch boy haircut stomping on the ground. Ski Mask stops next to him. What are you doing? I'm stepping on ants. Ski Mask bends down, grabs the boy by the shirt, pulls him close, and snarls at him. How would you like it if I stepped on you? The moment he lets the boy loose, the boy runs away crying. Punk. Ski Mask gets into his truck and waits. John Bromley should arrive soon. He'll likely kill the masturbator and take refuge in the residence. Whether he intercepts Bromley before he enters the house or waits until he is settled in is something Ski Mask will decide as the situation unfolds. But either way, this should be over with quickly. And it can't be soon enough, 
For it's not John Bromley he's motivated to find right now. It's Claire, the treacherous tramp who deceived him. Schemask takes out his phone, hits a few buttons, and his home security screens open up. Everything appears normal on the home front. Perhaps Claire has bolted completely, but if there's a chance she comes back to retrieve a few things, she would most likely do it within a day or two. And while Schemask would be alerted to her presence by his alarm system, he'd currently be too far away to get there in time to catch her. And he'll likely only get one shot at it. Once she's gone, she's gone for good. I can't miss my chance. Ski Mask starts his truck and heads for home. Had Ski Mask waited another five minutes, he would have seen John Bromley arrive, walk up to the house, knock on the door, have a brief conversation with the current occupant, grab a shovel, and chase the fleeing man into the house. Chapter 6 The Cottage As Ski Mask speeds down the road toward home, he slows and then stops when he reaches the driveway to the cottage. Claire's cottage. Ski Mask drives up to the cottage, gets out, and walks to the front door. The door is locked, but he has a key. He unlocks it and steps in. The living room is rather plain and is furnished with wicker furniture. There was a time when she spent most of her free time here, but lately, Claire has been making use of her bedroom at Ski Mask's homestead. Ski Mask was aware of the recent sense of comfort he would have knowing Claire would be sleeping just down the hall from him. But had she really been sleeping all that time? Or was she scheming? Had she always been contemplating the right moment to cut his throat? Had she considered doing it herself before she hired some other slut to fulfill her cowardly act? Ski Mask steps into the bedroom. The bed is made. He opens a few of her drawers. They are still full of clothes. She hasn't been here. Ski Mask is about to leave when he notices a picture frame on her bedstand. He walks to it, picks it up, and studies it. It's a picture of him. He didn't know she had this picture didn't know such a picture even existed. He had sensed the gradual growing closeness between them, and seeing this picture would have confirmed this, but now it's just confusing. Did she lie in bed at night looking at this picture, wondering where he was and what he was doing? Was she looking forward to seeing him again? Or was she just plotting to kill him the entire time? Bitch. Ski Mask's teeth gnash together, his body temperature rises, his breath becomes short and accelerated. He lets out a bellow of fury as he hurls the picture against the wall, shattering it to pieces. Chapter 7 the Bromley House Ski Mask spots Claire in a sea of elephant nose fish and neon tetras. He picks up a nearby machete, swims to her, and buries the machete into her skull. She laughs at him as blood streams down her face. Suddenly, she disappears and all goes dark. A disco ball drops from the sky as funky music begins to play. Ski Mask opens his eyes. He is sitting on his sofa in front of the fish tank with his dogs laid out around him. The light peeking through the curtains indicates a new day has dawned. It takes him a moment to fully wake up from the dream and realizes the funky music is in fact his cell phone ringing. He answers. Yeah. W where are you? What is going on? Have, have you found Bromley yet? Calm down. Well, did you find him? No, not yet, but I will. When? I mean, what if he doesn't go back to the house? What if you're wrong? I'm not. Ski Mask hangs up and begins to doubt himself slightly. What if Dr. Grimm was right? What if Bromley doesn't go back to the house? 
The more time that goes by, the harder he will be to find, like Claire. With each second that passes, the odds increase that he'll never find her. Ski Mask dials to Molly Jones. Ski Mask, my chum, how are you this fine day? I need you to put some feelers out. I'm looking for somebody. You got it. Who's the target? Claire. Claire? You mean that little doll that hangs with you? What happened? She run out on you? Just keep your eyes open. If she's spotted, call me right away. Ski Mask hangs up, and within seconds, his disco ringtone is chiming again. He looks at the caller. It's Franklin Grimm. He lets it go to voicemail. As Ski Mask begins to move around in his seat, his dogs awaken from their slumber and vie for his attention. He pets them, looks into their happy eyes, and feels the need to address them. I'm sorry you all got shot. Ski Mask looks off in the distance and starts to stew as he speaks. That bitch Claire brought a threat into our home and put us all in danger. I'll make her pay. The dogs begin to whine as they sense his brewing rage. He recognizes this and immediately calms himself. He coddles the hounds and they instantly relax. They don't realize that he is envisioning himself strangling Claire as he speaks. It's okay. Everything will be just fine. Ski Mask arrives back at the Bromley house and parks a short distance away. He casually walks to the house, onto the porch, and knocks on the front door. If the homeowner answers, he'll know Bromley still hasn't returned. And if Bromley answers, he can subdue him, bring him back to Dr. Grimm, and be able to put his full focus on finding Claire. Ski Mask waits impatiently for someone to open the door, but they don't. He hears no creaks or steps indicating that someone is making their way toward the door. All is quiet. He cups his hand on the window to shield the sun and tries to get a look inside. The glare makes it difficult. He turns and looks around the neighborhood. No one is giving him a second glance, so he goes to the door and tries the knob. To his surprise, it turns and he pushes the door open. The house is unusually quiet and even more colorful than he gathered when he peeped through the windows yesterday. He walks into the kitchen where he observed the disturbing masturbation session the day before. Scanning around, nothing looks out of the ordinary, but something catches his eye. An open laptop computer. Ski Mask gets closer and can see a chat box to a dating website. He observes an ongoing conversation between Alex and Melissa. He quickly glosses over the dialogue, but at first glance it's ordinary chit-chat. He takes a closer look at the latest timestamp, which indicates the last message of the conversation was less than an hour ago. Alex must be the homeowner. If he's still alive, Bromley hasn't arrived yet. He was certain John Bromley would have come straight here when he escaped. Where the hell is he? He's missing something, something obvious. But his mind is elsewhere. If Claire is coming home, it will be soon, and he wants to be there to greet her. Her suffering will be colossal. Ski Mask gets into his truck and drives away, never knowing that John Bromley was in the backyard, scrubbing blood, brain matter, and hair from the head of the shovel he bludgeoned the homeowner Alex with. Chapter 8 Anonymous Dr. Clark sits in his office, drumming his fingers against his desk. It's now Friday morning. The escape took place two days ago, but not a word from the media. No stirring among the hospital staff. Everything is normal. Somehow Dr. Grimm has managed to keep this quiet, again, just like with Medusa. Not this time, Dr. Grimm. Dr. Clark picks up his office phone, dials the number to a local media outlet, and covers the speaker of the phone with a cloth as he speaks hoarsely. I'm an anonymous source with inside information. An extremely dangerous patient has escaped from the Madisonville Psychiatric Institute two days ago and is still on the loose.
Chapter 9 Maniac on the Loose Ski Mask sits in a lavish grass field under a clear blue sky. He is encircled by all seven of his dogs. Their tails wag and their tongues hang out of their mouths as they pant happily. Above him flying freely are his parrots. Ski Mask closes his eyes and feels as though he is floating on air. A crack of thunder destroys the calming scene. He opens his eyes to a black sky and a large bird-like creature flying above them. It's Claire, with wings and a parrot beak. Pretty boy, pretty boy. She opens her beak and a burst of flame emits from her mouth, burning his dogs alive. Ski Mask screams out, trapped by the ring of fire. Suddenly, Claire and the burning dogs disappear, and a disco ball-shaped UFO breaks through the darkness while deafening funky music blasts through his head. Ski Mask opens his eyes. Greystoke, the African Grey, is close to him, calling out, Pretty boy! Pretty boy! The rest of the parrots all seem relaxed in their atrium. Lovebug the cockatoo is perched on the arm of the chair, staring up at Ski Mask gleefully. Ski Mask's mind clears and he realizes he fell asleep while seeking solace in the parrot room. He looks down at his cell phone, which is vibrating while ringing in its disco way. He quickly answers it. Tamale? Did you find her? Uh, th this isn't Tamale, it's Franklin Grimm. Where the hell are you? Did you find Bromley yet? A frustrated Ski Mask barks at Dr. Grimm. No! Now stop calling me! Ski Mask hangs up. Within seconds, the phone is ringing again. He looks at the caller ID and lets out an aggravated sigh when he sees it's Franklin again. He lets it go to voicemail and then calls Tamale. Tamale, get over to my place right away. He hangs up and exits the parrot room. All seven of the dogs are waiting outside the room for him. He bends down and starts petting them. He pauses when he looks into the eyes of Dempsey and Floppy. They are both so fond of Claire. He worries about how the loss of Claire will affect them. Claire will either be on the run or Ski Mask will find her and kill her. Either way, they'll never see her again. He feels sad for the dogs and intensifies the rubbing before he stands and walks down the corridor. As he enters the main room, he notices Alfred leaving. Where are you going? Oh, Ski Mask. I have something I must attend to. Me too. Did you want me to stay and entertain the animals? I know you disapprove of leaving them alone. Thanks, Alfred, but Tamale will be here soon. Very well. Alfred begins to exit and then pauses. Ski Mask, I know you're feeling indignant toward Claire at the moment, but I feel the need to enlighten you. Claire was being held captive against her will. I do not believe that she was allied with that obscene woman. Ski Mask begins to fume. Oh, you don't think they were allied, do you? Well, answer me something, Alfred. Were you there when that platinum skank slit my throat? Did you see Claire standing by her side when it happened? No, I was not, and I apologize if I have offended you. But that type of calamity is not a proper portrayal of the Claire that I... that... we... know. If I were you, I'd investigate further before you do something rash that I expect you will regret. Excuse me. A seething ski mask watches as Alfred walks through the courtyard and exits into the tunnel. What the hell does he know anyhow? Ski mask begins to pace back and forth as he rants. Not the Claire you know. Well, obviously you don't know her at all. None of us ever did. She conspired with that tramp. She's a slutty, backstabbing whore, and she will get what's coming to her. He takes in a few deep breaths to bring himself down, and is alerted by the camera system that Tamale is now on the premises. Ski Mask collects himself by the time Tamale enters the room. Hello, friend. Tamale takes in the overwhelming magnitude of the room. It's been some time since I've been out to your joint. I forgot about the size. Elephants could mate here. Any news on Claire? Nah, but I got word out to every plug, punk, and snitch I know. Someone will get the slant on her soon enough. Good. Ski Mask heads for the door. I have something to take care of. I want you to stay here and keep an eye out for her. Tamale shudders at Ski Mask's incensed expression when he expels his next words. 
If that little Judas shows up, call me right away so I can take care of her. Tamale nods hesitantly. And keep an eye on my gang while I'm gone. Gang? Tamale looks around at the seven dogs that are eyeing him curiously, and down at the two cats who have practically wrapped themselves around his legs. Listen, I'm just a gumshoe. The only hounds I know anything about are booze hounds. I'm in the dark here. Just be nice to them. This shouldn't take long. Ski Mask hurries out of the house, leaving Tamale and the band of animals slightly perplexed. Ski Mask parks down the street from the Bromley house. He scowls as he walks briskly down the sidewalk, turns down the walkway, steps onto the front porch, and quickly knocks on the front door. He has to be here by now. If the homeowner answers the door, Ski Mask will have to admit that he made a mistake about Bromley coming back to his old home. As Ski Mask steps away from the door, leans down, and attempts to look through the window, he hears footsteps approaching, the squeak of the front door opening, and a friendly voice greet him, saying, Yes? May I help you, sir? Ski Mask turns to find himself face to face with John Bromley. Chapter 10 Buzz A patient described as extremely dangerous may have escaped from the Madisonville Psychiatric Hospital two days ago, according to an anonymous tip. Hospital officials have released no information, and WMAD is still trying to confirm details. So far, we have had no luck reaching Dr. Franklin Grimm, the director of the hospital, for comment. Dr. Clark turns the radio off and sits down behind his desk. So far, the tip is not creating the frenzy that the Jack Frost escape caused, but that escape was confirmed. This escape is currently nothing more than a rumor. At this stage, the media is simply trying to gain confirmation. But the buzz is growing. Dr. Clark leans back in his chair, puts his feet up on his desk, and smiles. Chapter 11 Time to Kill Piece of cake. Ski Mask binds Bromley's hands behind his back with duct tape and flips him over onto his back. He's still unconscious. When he awakens, Ski Mask will provoke him, for starters. He could be home right now waiting for Claire, but Bromley's unwillingness to play by the rules has him here instead. You will suffer for my inconvenience. Subduing him was a breeze. Bromley had no idea who Ski Mask was, since he'd never seen him without the mask on. Ski Mask played upon Bromley's daddy issues and made up a story about having lived in this house as a child. He explained that he was back in town for his father's funeral and wanted to come by his former house for some closure. Bromley practically begged him to come in and look at his old room. The fly in the spider's web. John Bromley introduced himself as Alex, which made Ski Mask realize it was he who was chatting on the dating website he observed the previous day. That should have been obvious to him. Such a mistake. Claire has clouded his mind. Once inside, Ski Mask lured Bromley to a bedroom. Bromley rambled on and on the entire time about the perfect family this and the perfect family that. He explained his demented idea of how one can pick and choose who their family is and theoretically could construct the perfect family. The man would not shut up. Silencing him by knocking him unconscious with a vase was a pleasure. Ski Mask exits the bedroom and takes out his phone. He had temporarily turned it off due to Dr. Grimm's excessive calling. He powers it on and dials to Molly, who answers quickly. Yeah. Any sign of Claire? Negative. Call me the second she gets there. Yeah, will do. Oh, hey, uh, I think these critters may be hungry. Got any grub for them? Take the south wing to the kitchen, look in the cabinets, you'll find some jerky treats. Ski Mask hangs up and looks out the window. The afternoon sun is high in the sky. 
The plan is to bring Bromley back to the hospital. This task will be easier to accomplish under the veil of night. Thus, Ski Mask has some time to kill. Ski Mask sits down in a posh chair in a small room which has been heavily decorated with a variety of extravagant antiques. The room even seems to have an ancient scent, likely from the polish on some of the copper antiques. He picks up a remote control from the arm of the chair and flicks on the television. A paranormal investigation show called Spirit Stalkers manifests on the screen. Before Ski Mask can decide whether or not to invest some time in the show, he is distracted by a distant flapping sound. Ski Mask stands and follows the inconsistent sound to the main sitting room. Once in the room, he stops and listens. Within seconds, the flapping sound continues, followed by a thud. He turns his attention to the modest wood-burning fireplace and sees that a small bird has made its way down the chimney. The bird seems confused and is obviously stressed by the strange environment. Ski Mask approaches carefully for the bird's benefit. The bird seems to relax as Ski Mask scoops it up in his hands. While bent down, he gauges the situation with the fireplace. There's no damper and no chimney cap, which allowed this bird to fly directly into the house. Ski Mask gently rubs the bird's head as he walks to the front door and opens it. The bird isn't injured, just stressed, so Ski Mask sets him down on the porch. Within seconds, the bird takes flight, disappearing into the air. Ski Mask watches on, wondering if Claire feels free like a bird right now, or is she constantly looking over her shoulder, feeling the shadow of her approaching doom? I will find you. Almost immediately after shutting the front doors, Ski Mask hears a car pull into the driveway and a horn honking. He gazes through the window and observes a woman getting out of her car. She is in her late 20s with dark straight hair ending just before her shoulders. She approaches the porch and knocks on the front door. The woman is wearing a tight red shirt that displays her ample rack. She's a slut, just like Platinum, who did not suffer enough. He can choose not to answer the door. The woman will go away, and Ski Mask will sit around until nightfall. Or he can choose to let her in and blow off a little steam. Ski Mask smirks as he moves forward and opens the door. Chapter 12 Ultimatum Dr. Clark sits behind Dr. Grimm's desk, dangling Dr. Grimm's keys out in front of him. Lose something? Earlier in the day when Dr. Clark decided to give Dr. Grimm an ultimatum, Dr. Grimm shooed him away, but dropped several files and his car keys while trying to rush off. Dr. Clark stealthily pocketed the car keys, assuring that Dr. Grimm was going nowhere. What the hell are you doing in my office? It's all laid out so perfectly. Dr. Clark goes back and forth with Dr. Grimm for several minutes before unveiling the ultimatum. Resign immediately on your own terms, or I'll let the media in on who it is that's running around out there, and I'll let them know about your attempt to cover the whole thing up. Dr. Clark knows he's a shoo in to take over the head position once Dr. Grimm resigns, but it hasn't gone unnoticed to him that lately, Dr. Grimm has been giving Dr. Lewis more opportunities. He's probably screwing her. Dr. Clark chuckles when he hears Dr. Grimm play his last card. Well, I'll tell them you were behind the whole thing. His grin transforms into a snare as he barks at Dr. Grimm. Prove it! Dr. Clark turns away knowing that Dr. Grimm has no other choice. He must resign and hand the reins over to him. He's grinning as he approaches the office door to exit and hears Dr. Grimm grumble, This job means everything to me. Before he can react, Dr. Clark feels something wrapping around his throat and tightening. Is Dr. Grimm trying to kill me? 
Dr. Clark paws at the tie around his neck. He can feel Dr. Grimm's body pressing up against him as he pulls tighter. His first thought is that Dr. Grimm is much stronger than he looks. Dr. Clark attempts to free himself by powering forward, but crashes into Dr. Grimm's desk and loses his leverage. It's at this time that he recognizes that he is still moving throughout the room, but realizes that it is not he who is forcing the movement. It is Dr. Grimm, and he is in full control. Dr. Clark feels his knees buckle, and he slowly falls to the floor as he clutches at the tie around his neck. This can't be happening, he thinks. But it is. Chapter 13 Blowing Off Steam Claire Ski Mask is a whirlwind of raging fury completely out of control. It's Melissa and John Bromley who he is taking his frustrations out on, but all he sees is Claire. This is not a normal session of blowing off steam for Ski Mask. This is a shotgun blast of intensified wrath. He is not satisfied. His frustrations have not diminished. At this point, he's nothing more than a raving maniac. John Bromley and Melissa are both on their backs on the bed with their arms tied behind them. They are both exhausted and thoroughly traumatized. At this stage, one of Melissa's fingers has been lopped off with pruners and one of John Bromley's thumbs has been broken with a pair of pliers. Ski Mask's voice is hoarse from screaming at them. He can't remember what he has said or everything he has done. This torture session has been a ferocious and uninhibited blur. Ski Mask is a relentless monster who has never been so out of control. Ski Mask looks down at his bandaged forearm. When Melissa first entered the house, he simply toyed with her. They had a lengthy conversation while he attempted to make her feel as uncomfortable as possible. Completely controlling the scene, Ski Mask pushed her as close as he could to turning and running in fear without her actually reaching that point. It was both amazing and tantalizing and was helping him kill time. Surprisingly, she tolerated the situation longer than most normal people would have. And then she mentioned having heard a report that a patient had escaped from the Madisonville Psychiatric Institution. That was when Ski Mask went off the rails. Obviously this was an inside job and that dolt Dr. Clark has to be behind the whole thing. This is just another thing to keep him from fully focusing on what he wants. Claire. Ski Mask remembers shouting at Melissa much like he will at Claire once he has her tied up. He was pacing in the kitchen trying to keep control of himself when he had a vision of Claire in front of the sink, dealing with stress by cutting her arm. He then decided to try it for himself, but all it did was remind him even more of Claire and sent him into a rage. Claire. Ski Mask scowls at Bromley and Melissa as they whine. The fun is over. It's time to bring this to a close. Ski Mask looks Melissa up and down and displays a mischievous grin. I want some of that. And what I want, I get. This comment is meant to disturb Bromley, who has been eyeing Melissa to be the wife piece of his perfect family. Ski Mask removes his blue-gray overshirt, leaving him in a tan t-shirt. He smiles malevolently as he begins unfastening his belt. This action achieves the response he was hoping for. John Bromley pleads for him to stop while Melissa screams hopelessly, knowing the inevitable is coming and there's nothing she can do to stop it. Her scream is satisfying to him, but it's nothing compared to what Claire's scream will be. Ski Mask's plan isn't to rape Melissa. This is just to bring their fear to a boil. The plan is to climb on top of Melissa and watch Bromley's expression as he slits her throat. He'll then knock Bromley unconscious again and wait. This plan is interrupted by his cell phone ringing in the attached bathroom. Is this the call he's been waiting for?
Chapter 14 Courtship Do you have a girl in there? When Dr. Kate Lewis entered Dr. Grimm's office, she thought it was strange that his secretary wasn't there, even stranger that his main office door was locked, and strangest yet that she could hear him panicking behind the door after she knocked. Dr. Lewis was fine that her husband left her earlier in the week. The marriage hadn't been good in years. At this point, it wasn't a matter of if they got divorced, but when. And now is just as fine as any time. The best news for Dr. Lewis is that according to Dr. Grimm's father, Alfred, Franklin Grimm is available. As far as she can tell, the only competition for Dr. Grimm is a bleached blonde bimbo in accounting who has oversized fake tits. She has noticed Dr. Grimm gawking at them on multiple occasions, and she fears he may be in his office right now bonking her. That would explain his panicked state. When Dr. Grimm finally exits the office, he is completely frazzled and obviously trying his damnedest to get her away from the office. Let, let's go somewhere. Let's go get some coffee, okay? Normally, this suggestion would have thrilled Kate. The reason she came to see him today was to inquire about them starting a relationship, and possibly to even seduce him right there in his office. But he's not sincere. He's luring her away. He's hiding something. She breaks away from Dr. Grimm's grasp, rushes through his door, and lo and behold, there is indeed someone in his office. But it's not that bleached blonde from accounting. Is that? It's Dr. Clark. Dr. Lewis rushes to Dr. Clark's side and immediately begins checking him for signs of life. But it's obvious he is deceased. She can hear Dr. Grimm behind her claiming that Dr. Clark fell and hit his head. But she doesn't notice any sign of head trauma. What she does notice are the significant scuffs, abrasions, and bruising around his throat. Has he been strangled? The thought can't fully process in her mind before she feels her head being pulled back. She hears a loud pop as a long syringe needle pierces through her ear. She quickly loses control of her body and begins convulsing. A sarcastic thought is the last thing that runs through her mind before her world goes dark. I have terrible taste in men. Chapter 15 Dead Man Ski Mask is both disappointed and angry when he hears Dr. Franklin Grimm's voice on the other end of the phone. What do you want? I'm busy. Dr. Grimm is downright gleeful when Ski Mask informs him that he has captured John Bromley. I think it'll be best if we just sedate him, bring him back to the institution, and I'll hang him in his room, make it look like suicide. You can come up with some creative bullshit as to why you didn't inform the media. I'm sure you'll come up with something plausible. Ski Mask instructs Dr. Grimm to come to the Bromley house as soon as possible to help him move Bromley. Dr. Grimm doesn't sound too thrilled about the idea, but agrees. Toward the end of the conversation with Dr. Grimm, Ski Mask can swear he heard Melissa scream. This wouldn't be unexpected. At this point, they must realize they have nothing to lose. Screaming for help wouldn't be a bad idea, but it wasn't that type of scream. It sounded muffled. Ski Mask hangs up and re-enters the room. At first, everything seems fine. Both of his victims are lying side by side on the bed, just as he left them. But then he realizes Melissa is unusually still. He moves in for a closer look, and her eyes are open and lifeless. He had put them both through a lot. Either of them going into shock and dying wouldn't be out of the question. Ski Mask catches John Bromley staring sharply at him and can't help but to give him one last jab. She's still warm, though. Ski Mask undoes the buckle on his belt, which results in the wince of disgust he was hoping from Bromley. Enough with the games. It's time to render John Bromley unconscious once again. After Dr. Grimm arrives, they can quickly move him back to the hospital and finally Ski Mask can get to his priority, catching Claire. A bump from the hall makes Ski Mask pause. What the hell was that? Ski Mask cautiously makes his way into the hall to investigate. He hears another bump. It is unquestionably coming from the closet. 
he reaches out and turns the knob. A disgusting emission of decaying flesh explodes from the closet, followed by a carcass that tumbles onto the floor. At first, Ski Mask is confused. What the hell? He then recognizes the corpse in front of him as the masturbating homeowner he had spotted when he initially checked out the house. Ski Mask was never sure if the homeowner had simply gotten lucky and left the premises before John Bromley arrived, or if Bromley killed him. The answer to that question is rotting in front of him. Ski Mask is about to return to the bedroom when he feels a sharp pain in his kidney area, followed by his arms going numb. He turns to see the snarling face of John Bromley. A second stab in the back causes blood to rush into Ski Mask's lungs. Blood explodes from his mouth as he coughs and drops forward onto the corpse of the homeowner. Ski Mask awakens in the death room. That pathetic loon John Bromley got the drop on him. How embarrassing. This would never have happened had his mind not been so heavily clouded by Claire. Anger brews within. Ski Mask turns his back to the wall of light before he can even see it. He doesn't want to feel comforted or soothed. He wants to spring forward and finish this. Finish all of it. To hell with sedating Bromley and bringing him back to the hospital. No. Instead, Ski Mask is going to carve Bromley up real good right now. And then he'll find Claire. Her time is up. Revenge is on the menu tonight, and it will be served. Ski Mask stands and prepares to be launched back into a new life. He looks forward to seeing the shock and fear in Bromley's eyes as he rises from the dead. It will almost be worth the shame of falling at his hands. Ski Mask's patience is tested as he waits. And waits. And waits. What the hell? Ski Mask's eagerness to return is replaced by a sinking feeling as he faces a realization. The lifeline renewal chip has reached its limit. He does a quick count in his head and confirms that he still has one life left. But with the expiration of the auto renewal chip, the renewal process must be administered by someone else manually. Shit. The end. The Nine Lives of Ski Mask concludes with Life Nine, The Perfect Family. The Nine Lives of Ski Mask, Life Nine, The Perfect Family. Chapter One. The Long Wait Hello, my friend. Ski Mask stands in the death room facing the light. He can feel it pulsating ever so slightly as it beckons to him. The urge to give in and finally become one with the light grows stronger. Ski Mask knows if he doesn't turn away, the impulse will be insurmountable and the inevitable will be of this day. Ski Mask closes his eyes and reluctantly turns from the light. When he opens his eyes again, he sees his windows. Currently, the position of his body only allows for him to see the faded tan carpet of the hallway. The very hallway where his previous life ended, from the swift swing of a blade held by John Bromley. Shameful. John Bromley, a pitiful psycho with daddy issues, whom Ski Mask had toyed with the entire day, much like a cat stringing along a helpless mouse before ultimately taking its life. And the cat was so careless that the mouse became the conqueror. It's all Claire's fault. If he weren't so preoccupied with her, this would have been a breeze. He should have just focused on catching Bromley. It would have been quick and easy. Then he could have shifted his absolute attention to finding Claire. In hindsight, he made a lot of stupid errors and probably deserves this. But if all goes well, he'll have the chance to correct it. In the distance, Ski Mask can hear John Bromley speaking. 
He doesn't have to see him to know that he is speaking to Melissa's corpse. I now pronounce us man and wife. The perfect couple for a perfect family. Dr. Grimm should be here soon. He can revive Ski Mask, and then this humiliating nightmare will be over. Hurry up, Dr. Grimm! Chapter 2 Father and Son Dr. Grimm takes a gun from his desk drawer and places it in his front pants pocket. He hastily covers the stacked bodies of Dr. Clark and Dr. Lewis with a quilt and locks the door after exiting his office. He takes several breaths and runs both of his hands through his hair, calming himself before entering the corridor. Once in the corridor, he stops, surprised to see a familiar figure standing before him. Father? Alfred walks to him and speaks casually. Hello, Franklin. Listen, I can't talk now. I have something to take care of. I'll, I'll call you later. Franklin quickly runs past his father and begins to turn the corner when he hears a door open behind him. He stops and turns in time to see his father entering his office. Oh, oh shit, don't go in there! Franklin runs in full sprint and enters the secretary's portion of his office just in time to see his father unlocking his office door and beginning to open it. No, 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 no! Franklin scurries to the door and pulls it shut before Alfred can enter. Franklin, what are you doing? What do you want in my office? And why the hell do you still have keys? I never discarded them from my keychain. And to answer your first question, we need to talk. Uh, not now. I have critical business to attend to. Alfred studies Franklin closely. Why don't you want me in your office? Uh, it's not that I don't want you to go in, it's that I'm in a rush. Now, if you don't mind, can we please leave? Franklin attempts to usher Alfred away from the door, but Alfred is having none of it. Where is Dr. Clark? He wasn't in his office. I asked around, no one has seen him. Franklin's eyes begin to dart around the room, and he stammers as he tries to answer the question. I, uh, um, he's, he's, he's not here. Uh, I, I sent him home. That, I, I sent him home. He's, he's gone. It's impossible not to notice Franklin's anxiety. You seem nervous. What's bothering you, son? Oh, well, like I said earlier, I have something important that needs my attention. Whatever needs your attention obviously has you quite stressed. Would you like to discuss it? There isn't any time. I, I, I have to go. Please, can we talk later? Alfred nods slightly. As you wish. Franklin lets out a breath of relief as the two of them begin walking away from the door, but is caught off guard by the sudden move made by his father, who abruptly stops and hurries back to the office door. He opens it before Franklin can stop him. No! No! Alfred stops and his keys fall from his hands as he is frozen by the sight before him. My God, Franklin! Stunned, he steps into the office and makes his way forward toward the heap of bodies. He removes the quilt that was shoddily covering the bodies to reveal the corpses of Dr. Clark and Dr. Lewis. Dear Lord. It's the bolt of the office door latching that shakes Alfred from his temporary stupor. He turns to see his son standing in the office with him, his hand still on the door after having locked it. What have you done? Uh, it's, it's not what it looks like. It's not? Because it looks like you murdered Dr. Clark and Dr. Lewis. Well, I wouldn't put it in those terms. A flabbergasted Alfred cuts his son off. Rather than just retire and hand your job over to Dr. Clark, you killed him? Uh, well, that's not exactly, uh... Franklin feels his jaw begin to drop as his brow creases in confusion. How... how... How did you know? Did you really think that imbecile Dr. Clark had the intelligence to pull this off on his own? Franklin tries to speak, but no words come out. It was me, Franklin. I was behind all of it. Releasing Jack Winters through a paperwork error was simple enough. 
When it was clear you were going to get off the hook on that one, I concocted the plan for a second escape on the same day with Medusa. Surely that would do the trick. I did not realize Ski Mask would be willing to help you get out of that quandary. I hope you appreciate him. I must admit it was much more difficult to administer this latest scheme with Ski Mask running security, but fortunately, he hasn't been here long enough to plug all of the holes in this dam. And I know each and every one of those weak points. Dr. Clark was a simple puppet following my orders, knowing he'd benefit by taking over once you were removed. Even a dimwit like Clark could run this place. It's beneath you. It's beneath a grim. Franklin finally manages a word. Why? You know damn well why. A Grimm will always be at the helm of the Lifeline Project. It's time to put this childish institution behind you and move on. The first shot caused Alfred confusion more than anything else. He noticed Franklin moving his hand around in his front pants pocket. He assumed he was fidgeting with his keys as the stress of the situation grew within him. When Franklin removed his hand and seemed to point at Alfred, he thought it was just a gesture. He hadn't even noticed the gun until after Franklin had fired it. Franklin! Uh... Alfred's words trail off quickly. He isn't sure where the shot hit, perhaps the chest as he feels pressure welling up within. But that's not his focus. His full attention is directed at the cold, stoic expression on his son's face as Franklin pulls the trigger again. Chapter 3 TikTok. Ski Mask's view is suddenly altered. Instead of a close-up view of the carpet, he's now staring at the ceiling, and it's moving. He's dragging me. Ski Mask can hear the heavy breathing of John Bromley, and recognizes the pictures lining the staircase as he is pulled past them. The sound of his legs thumping against each step echoes through the stairwell as Bromley pulls him down to the main level of the house. As his view starts to level out, he hears Bromley speaking to him. There you go. You can sit right here on the steps and relax while I get the others. Ski Mask can tell that Bromley has propped him up in a sitting position on one of the bottom steps of the staircase. He can distinctly make out the kitchen to his left, the dining room ahead of him, and a portion of the living room to the right. He hears John Bromley speaking upstairs. Yes, we're going downstairs. Ski Mask isn't sure which corpse Bromley is bringing down, but he can hear him holding a conversation with it as the lifeless legs bounce off of the steps during the descent. Yes, it has been a tiring day, hasn't it? What's that? You're hungry? You'll have to forgive me. With all the commotion of the day, food has slipped my mind. Let me get you into the kitchen. The thudding sound of the body being pulled down the stairs grows louder as Bromley drags the body of Alex past Ski Mask and into the kitchen. Ski Mask can no longer view him as he rounds the corner, but the conversation he's having with the cadaver paints the pitiful picture of what's going on in there. There's plenty of food in the pantry. I'll just leave you here for now. Feel free to help yourself to anything. What a pathetic, psychotic freak. Bromley comes back into view and walks past Ski Mask. Bromley's footsteps grow fainter as he rushes up the stairs and down the hall. Come on, Grim, get your ass here. It isn't long before Ski Mask can hear Bromley returning. The soft push of his footsteps against the carpeted second-floor hallway abruptly transforms into hollow thuds as he moves on to the staircase. As he nears Ski Mask, the sound of his footsteps intensifies, as does his cheerful humming of the song, Here Comes the Bride. Bromley comes into view as he walks past Ski Mask and into the dining room. 
He is holding Melissa in his arms, bridal style, but stops suddenly. Oh, you're tired? Of course you are. It's been such a long day. Bromley returns and walks back toward the stairs, and then turns into the living room. I'll let you sit in this nice, comfortable chair. You can rest a while while I get dinner started. Bromley returns from the living room and disappears from Ski Mask's sight into the kitchen. Weirdo. As Ski Mask impatiently waits for Dr. Grimm to save the day, he is confused when he hears a loud creaking sound from within the death room. He begins looking around for the source of the strange sound. The awareness of what is happening dawns on him once he feels his balance shift toward the light. Ski Mask looks down at the floor. He's been in limbo too long. The floor has begun the process of tilting toward the light. His time to be renewed is running short. Come on, Grim. Chapter 4 Coming Home This will likely be the death of me. Claire pulls up to the bulkhead doors, gets out of her car, and lets out a deep, nervous breath. She looks out beyond the facade of the weathered shack and ragged fence. She knows what lies beyond. Home. And probably death. She lifts up the doors, punches in the code, and descends into the musty corridor that will lead her to the courtyard. As she makes her way through, she looks around at the damp walls and modern overhead lighting, wondering if this will be the last time she sees them. Probably. Ski Mask intends to kill her. She knows this. She'd be dead already if it weren't for Madeline's heroic stand against her beloved master. Claire's hope is that Ski Mask will give her a chance to explain. Everything. No secrets. Once that's all out on the table, let the chips fall as they may. Perhaps the loyal year she gave him, the times they've shared together, the feelings. Perhaps it will all be enough for him to reconsider the death sentence. Perhaps. She opens the bulkhead door and ascends up the stairs into the courtyard. The sweet scent of a nearby honeysuckle cluster fills the air as she begins walking toward the entrance of the home to face her destiny. Before she even makes it to the midway point of the courtyard, her face lights up with delight at the sight of Dempsey and Floppy racing toward her. She bends down to greet them and they knock her over. She chuckles, having seen the dogs do this to Ski Mask countless times over the years. Ski Mask. If the dogs are out here, he must be too. Before she can rise to look for him, she is pleased to be greeted by the other five dogs. They appear as joyful as she's ever seen them. Hi guys! She hugs and pets them with vigor. I was afraid I'd never see you again. Her face is now wet from the countless dog licks. For a moment, this is all she knows, and she's at peace, laughing. She looks up when she hears a familiar voice. Claire? Claire lets out a boisterous giggle when she sees the dapper-dressed Tamale Jones looking like he just stepped out of the Great Gatsby. His plaid, three-piece, tweed, herringbone suit with matching fedora is accented with both cats, Darkness, and Scarface perched upon his shoulders like parrots to a pirate. Now that's a sight. They obviously have taken to you. And you to them. Far be it from me to turn down some puss. He halts his words. Ah, uh, sorry, toots. I was gonna make a joke pertaining to a dame's anatomy, but I have a hunch it wouldn't hit on all eights with you. Your hunch was correct. Listen, I'm supposed to alert Ski Mask if I see you, but I get the feeling he's none too happy with you, and may be aiming to bump you off. Since I was the one who turned you on to that nutty platinum broad, I feel I owe you one. If I was you, I'd scram. Thanks, Tamale. But I have to see him. Do you know where he is? Nah, he didn't say. I'll try the hospital. Be careful, you hear? Don't take any wooden dimes. Thanks, Tamale. Claire smiles, knowing that if this is the last time she sees Tamale, it will be a good image. Him flashing a grin while simultaneously petting both cats as they balance on his shoulders.
Chapter Five: Punishment. Schemas can hear Bromley speaking to him as he is dragged through the dining room into an office. You were mean to me and Melissa today. I can't let that behavior go unpunished. The desk in the room is stained dark and covered with neat stacks of antique books. Bromley drags him past the desk to the corner of the room. Bromley lifts him up and plops him down in a red velvet chair that sits in front of a small television. You will sit in this room and think about what you did. I will, and I'll think about what I'm going to do to you if Grim ever gets his ass out here. I have to prepare dinner now. It's a special day. Once I feel as though you've been punished enough, you can be part of the perfect family. What a complete nut job! Schemas can hear the door close and Bromley's footsteps shuffle away into the distance. At first, he is annoyed that Bromley faced him toward the television as opposed to turning him around so he can see the entire room. But the annoyance quickly subsides when he realizes he can see the entire room in the television screen's reflection, including himself. He sits and stares at his own reflection. His eyes are open and lifeless, like a doll. His mouth is agape. His goatee is encrusted with dried blood. Within the death room, the floor creaks as it tilts further toward the light. Schemask leans his body forward in an attempt to balance against the incline, but it is becoming too steep, and he begins to slide toward the light. He has to grab onto the handrail to stop himself. Where are you, Grim? Chapter Six: Gunshot. As Claire approaches the entrance to the Madisonville Psychiatric Hospital, she notices a bit of activity at the security guard station. At a glance, she can tell that there are two or three different media outlets waiting in the lobby. She sees a heavily made-up reporter that she recognizes from the local news sitting down, looking into a compact mirror while touching up her makeup. The reporter is occasionally chatting to a man sitting next to her, who is holding a video camera in his lap. His eyelids appear heavy. They've obviously been waiting for some time. Another reporter, this one more likely of the journalistic variety, is chatting with the security guard while holding a digital tape recorder in front of her. Do you know when Dr. Grimm will be available for comment? No, I don't. The reporter, a woman in her mid forties, is obviously frustrated as she runs her hand through her wiry hair. Does he even know we're here? We sent the word up. That's all I know. The reporter lets out an aggravated breath. This is ridiculous. I've been waiting here for three hours. Oh,、well, that's your prerogative. But nobody is forcing you to stay here. Perhaps you should come back tomorrow. The journalist begins to lose it. Come back tomorrow? D- did you just tell me to come back tomorrow? I am a reporter. I break the news. I don't wait around until the next day to feed on the scraps of a story that has already been reported. Calm down, lady. As the journalist's ire escalates, the man with the video camera stands and readies his equipment. He seems happy to finally see some form of action and begins to film the scene. I want to see Dr. Grimm right now. Get him down here. The guard holds up his hands in a passive manner. You need to relax. Don't you tell me what I need. She looks past the guard and begins to scream. Doctor Grimm, I need to talk to Doctor Grimm. Doctor Grimm, get your ass down here now. The reporter attempts to push by the guard who restrains her. Get your hands off me! Let me go! Several guards run to assist as the wild journalist attempts to fight her way through security. Claire watches on and notices the television reporter eyeing an open area next to the commotion. She motions to her cameraman and darts through the opening, but they don't go unnoticed. One of the guards restraining the journalist yells out for assistance. Somebody stop them! Claire can see another guard running down the hallway toward the television reporter while shouting into his walkie-talkie. There's no way she's getting in through the main entrance, so Claire scurries to the side entrance that they brought Medusa through. 
She notices a guard on duty at the post and begins going over the best way to approach him. Based on what happened at the main entrance, Dr. Grimm is not easily reached at the moment. Ski Mask likely won't be either if he's even here. As she nears the entrance, she hears the guard's walkie-talkie make a buzzing alert sound, followed by a frantic message requesting for assistance at the main entrance. The guard doesn't hesitate and bolts down the hallway out of sight, leaving his station unmanned. Claire casually strolls through the entrance. She can see two nurses talking in the middle of the corridor in front of her. A balding doctor in his 40s exits from the stairwell next to Claire and bumps into her. Oh, excuse me. The doctor holds a goofy expression on his face as he looks Claire up and down. He's about to say something to her but is interrupted by one of the other nurses. Dr. Bloomfield, have you seen Dr. Grimm recently? The balding doctor's focus shifts to the nurses, and he walks toward them and speaks. Not since earlier in the day. I can't find Dr. Clark or Dr. Lewis either. Their conversation trails off as the doctor and nurses walk further down the hall. Claire, currently unnoticed by anyone, enters the stairwell. On the night when they dropped off Medusa, they stop by Dr. Grimm's office for a moment. Claire can remember the floor and the approximate location of his office. As she ascends the staircase, she occasionally sees a guard stationed on the other side of the doors to certain floors. But not all of them, and fortunately, not Dr. Grimm's floor. When she steps onto the floor that houses Dr. Grimm's office, she is slightly taken aback by how deserted the floor feels. Not a soul in sight. If it weren't for the distant sound of the occasional phone ringing, she would think it to be an abandoned floor. Claire's sneakers squeak against the polished tile as she approaches Dr. Grimm's office. She reaches out to turn the knob and jumps when she hears a loud crack of a gunshot, and then another. Claire gasps and takes cover in a nearby room. After a few seconds, she sneaks her head out just enough to gauge the situation. Within a few moments, the door to Dr. Grimm's office opens, and he emerges. He appears stressed as she witnesses him tuck a small gun into his front pants pocket, hurry down the hall, and disappear into a stairwell. Claire quickly reasons as to why Dr. Grimm would fire a gun in his office. Did he shoot someone? And if so, who? Could it be Ski Mask? Worry washes over Claire and she stealthily moves from the cover of the room to Dr. Grimm's office door and opens it. She steps into the secretary section of the office. Everything is quiet there so she swiftly moves to Dr. Grimm's office. She attempts to open the door, but it's locked. Doggone it! Frustrated, Claire turns. Her mind shuffles between rummaging through the secretary's desk in hopes of finding a key that fits the door, or chasing down Dr. Grimm to find out what happened. Neither option is considered when she spots a set of keys lying on the floor next to the office door. She recognizes the bland bronze-colored keyring. Alfred? She bends down, picks up the keys, and begins trying them in the door. On her third attempt, the door unlocks. She swings the door open and gasps. Claire rushes into the room. She recognizes Dr. Clark as one of the two bodies stacked and chaotically covered by quilts, but it's Alfred Grimm that she is rushing to. He is lifeless on the cold office floor. His eyes are shut and his complexion pale. Alfred! Alfred! She shakes him gently, but there is no sign of life. She places her fingers on his jugular vein. There is no pulse. She slumps. Oh, Alfred. After a second, Claire's eyes spark. She quickly rises, reaches into her backpack, and removes the small, flash drive-like, lifeline device. Claire bends down, lifts Alfred's head up, places the device at the base of his skull, activates it, and waits. Nothing. She rechecks to ensure that the procedure was done properly, and concludes that it was. And he's gone. She gently sets his head back down on the floor. You chose the light. Claire is aware that Alfred had always desired Franklin to take interest in the Lifeline project. Claire smiles, knowing that this is a decision he would have never made if he didn't trust that the Lifeline project were in capable hands. Her hands. Thank you for your faith in me. Farewell, my friend. Farewell.
Chapter 7 Abandon Hope, All Ye Who Enter Here Ski-Mask can hear Dr. Grimm's voice. Ski-Mask! Finally, he's here! Ski-Mask! The floor of the death room has continued to gradually slant more and more. At this point, it requires both of Ski Mask's hands to grip the rail on the wall to keep from sliding into the light. Come on, Grim, get in here! Ski Mask can hear Dr. Grim's footsteps echoing as he makes his way through the house. Apparently every room in the house except for this one. Finally, the door to the office creaks open. Ski Mask can see Dr. Grim emerge in the reflection of the television. He slowly creeps towards Ski Mask. Move it! Get over here! Finally, Dr. Grimm reaches Ski Mask and touches the dead body's shoulder, disrupting the balance just enough for Ski Mask's head to fall back. Ski Mask watches as Dr. Grimm stares down at him. Come on, get on with it! Ski Mask waits impatiently, expecting at any moment to see some type of motion from Dr. Grimm to indicate that he is removing a lifeline device from his person. But instead, he witnesses Dr. Grimm's gaze shoot up at the ceiling in response to the rapid sound of footsteps on the floor above. It's Bromley, you idiot! Revive me so I can pummel him and we can salvage this terrible day! Ski Mask expects Dr. Grimm to panic and start fumbling around in a race to revive him before Bromley can get there. But instead, Ski Mask watches on furiously as Dr. Grimm walks away from him, following the sound of the footsteps above him. Within seconds, Dr. Grimm has exited the room. What in the hell is he thinking? Stop or I'll shoot! Dr. Grimm, what are you doing here? Ski Mask is bubbling with fury as he listens in on Dr. Grimm and Bromley. They are both speaking loud enough where he can make out most of it. Dr. Grimm is trying to subdue Bromley himself. Fool. Not surprisingly, Ski Mask can hear a scuffle ensue. If Bromley gains the upper hand, that's it. It's over. I may as well just let go of the rail. He hears Dr. Grimm shout. Get. Off. Me. The scuffle has stopped. Turn around. It sounds as though somehow, Dr. Grimm has gathered control of the situation. Ski Mask continues to listen on as Dr. Grimm convincingly assures Bromley that if he moves, his brains will be sprayed out all over the hardwood floor. Good. Once he's secured, get in here and let's finish this. I'm your doctor, John. You can't outsmart me. Ski Mask listens on as Dr. Grimm laughs and basically begins congratulating himself as he makes a short speech about doing things yourself if you want them done right. Ski Mask begins to wonder whether or not he'll be able to control his temper once the reckless, overconfident Grimm revives him. But those thoughts quickly dissipate as he hears something peculiar. What is that? It's not a confrontation of any kind. It sounds like gagging. Coughing, wheezing, spitting, choking noises emit from the other room. The cacophony of agonizing commotion combine to make one last gaudy gargle before concluding with the loud bang of someone falling to the floor. Silence. What the hell? Chapter 8 Something Strange Claire runs top speed through the Madisonville Psychiatric Hospital corridor, her tiny legs a blur. She bursts into the first stairwell she comes to, the same one she saw Franklin Grimm exit into. As she flies down the stairs, she catches the attention of a few hospital employees as she zooms by them. She's far out of sight before any of them can react. Regardless, she doesn't care about that. Her focus is on catching up to Dr. Grimm. What possibly could have driven Franklin to kill his father? Did he kill the other two people in his office? Probably. But why? Does Ski Mask have some role in all of this? At the very least, Dr. Grimm will seek him out to clean up this mess. Ski Mask likely awaits him at his final destination, 
And while Claire is curious as to her ponderings, her objective is to find Ski Mask. Following Dr. Grimm will likely lead her to him. Claire barrels out of the stairwell. She blows by a security guard, causing him to call out as she dashes out the nearby exit. She ignores him and sprints to the street near the parking lot just in time to see Dr. Grimm's car turning a corner. That's him! Claire drove like a complete maniac for several miles in order to catch up with Dr. Grimm. Once doing so, she calmed herself and maintained a respectable distance behind him. Claire slows and shuts off her headlights as she watches Dr. Grimm come to a stop next to a large white Victorian house. From its appearance, Claire assumes the house holds a charming appearance during the day, but as it is now, with night having swallowed the sky, it holds an ominous presence. She watches on as Dr. Grimm exits his car, rolls up his sleeves, and approaches the house. It's quite obvious from his cautious, unfamiliar approach to the front door that he has never been there before. He appears nervous as he turns the knob and enters the house. Claire exits her vehicle and warily moves closer. She takes cover in the boundary of bushes at the edge of the yard and eyes the house intently. Lights are on in several of the rooms. Most of the curtains appear to be light color. Some of them are chiffon fabric. Perhaps she can get an idea as to the happenings within if any action takes place near one of the windows. Claire doesn't have to wait long to see some movement. In one of the upstairs windows, she occasionally sees the shadow of a burly man roaming back and forth. She's not sure if he is pacing or doing something with more purpose. Eventually, the husky shadow moves to a location further from the windows and all seems calm. Minutes later, another shadow emerges from one of the main level floors. She can distinctly make the shadow out as Dr. Grimm. He is moving with caution, much like he was when he entered the house, and then suddenly, his shadow freezes. She can see his head tilt upward, and at the same time she sees the shadow of the burly man tear past the windows. Dr. Grimm's shadow then darts out of view. She is confident that she heard a muffled shout at one time. There was a long period of silence followed by a thud, and again, all is calm. She whispers to herself, What on earth is happening in there? Claire's patience is tested as she looks on for at least ten minutes. No more shadows, no voices, muffled or otherwise. No indication that anyone is even in there anymore. Not a peep. Claire lets out a breath of annoyance as her patience wears thin. What do I do now? After a few moments of deliberating, Claire decides it's time to move forward and get a closer look. As she shifts her body slightly, she is startled by another man wandering down the walkway. Still concealed by the bushes, Claire freezes and observes the man. He's of average height in his 40s with dark hair, sideburns, mustache, and a slight beer belly. He's wearing a dark worker's shirt that is completely unbuttoned, revealing his white undershirt. He has the appearance of a mechanic or perhaps a gas station attendant. Claire observes the cautious manner in which the man proceeds to the porch. Once there, he stops and gazes around the neighborhood as if he's hoping not to be spotted. Finally, he slowly enters. As was the case with Dr. Grimm, it's clear this man hasn't been here before. What is this place? Claire waits and monitors the house. She can detect no movement, but within a few minutes, she hears a faint metallic clang, followed by a distant thud, and then calm. She whispers to herself, What in the world? Something is going on in that house. Something strange. Chapter 9 Perfect Family The floor of the death room has slanted to a point where it has become a metallic slide. Ski Mask's double-handed grip on the rail is all that keeps him from the light. The light, his friend, his laughing place awaits him. Why resist? 
It has only been minutes since hearing the strange gagging sounds followed by the thud of someone falling to the floor. In those few minutes, the house has been relatively quiet, save for some heavy breathing and light creaking of the floor, indicating that someone is still moving around in the other room. If it were grim, he'd have likely entered Ski Mask's room by now to revive him. He may have been congratulating himself on a job well done, but he'll need Ski Mask's help to clean up the mess, and time is wasting. Before Ski Mask can try to calculate further what just happened, based on sound alone, he hears the creak of a door open, followed by the voice of a man that does not sound familiar. What the hell? The next voice he hears is that of John Bromley, confirming that something has happened to Dr. Grimm. Oh, uh, thank God you're here! Uh, quick, untie me! What the hell happened here? Uh, this, this crazy guy just burst in and started killing people. Melissa? Do you know her? She's my wife. Ski Mask continues to listen. Some of the conversation is muffled, but it sounds as though John Bromley has convinced Melissa's husband to untie him. Their chatter thereafter is too soft for him to make out until Melissa's husband finally speaks up. Well, what the hell happened here? Oh, th this lunatic came in here and started killing people. He was going to kill me too until he took a drink out of that glass and died. That confirms it. Dr. Grimm is obviously the so-called lunatic that Bromley is claiming killed his victims. Dr. Grimm is dead. How the hell am I going to get out of this now? I guess I'm not. The fact that Dr. Grimm drank from a glass and died is not lost on Ski Mask. He shuffles through his memory to think of what Dr. Grimm would have drunk. Ski Mask clearly remembers serving Melissa a glass of water earlier in the day, before the festivities. He fixed himself one, too. That sneaky bitch. Ski Mask thinks back to how close he was to taking a drink from that glass. She poisoned my water. No wonder she hung around as long as she did after he had gone well across the boundary of what a normal woman would take. Ski Mask's thoughts are interrupted by a loud, metallic clang. Obviously, John Bromley has claimed another victim. Ski Mask stares ahead at his reflection in the television screen. He can hear objects being moved around in the other room along with various sounds of chairs squeaking and things being dragged about. Bodies, most likely. Ski Mask's hands have gone numb, and his once firm grip on the rail has grown unstable. He feels his hands start to slide, and quickly readjusts his grip, stopping the slide. For now. He knows he won't be able to hang on much longer, and is beginning to wonder why he's even bothering at this point. His thought process is interrupted by the door opening behind him. In the television screen, he can see John Bromley enter the room. He's smiling. I think you've learned your lesson. It's time for you to join the perfect family. Bromley begins dragging Ski Mask into the dining room. Ski Mask is positioned in a way where he can see that the table is decked out quite elegantly, much like a Thanksgiving dinner. Turkey, dressing, various vegetables, rolls, and a bottle of wine adorn the table. In the chairs around the table, the morbid guests await. Ski Mask is placed between the dead bodies of Dr. Grimm and the masturbating homeowner, Alex. Across the table, he can see the slumped bodies of Melissa and her husband. If the name label on his work shirt is accurate, his name is Ryan. Out of the corner of his eye, Ski Mask can see John Bromley enter the room holding a cake. Thank you, everyone, for being present during the happiest day of my life. For it is today that I have finally realized my lifelong dream. And I couldn't have done it without all of you. The perfect family. This is an embarrassing way to go, but it is what it is. Time to move on. Time to let go. Time to embrace the light. Ski Mask is about to release his grip from the rail and plunge into the light when the unmistakable squeaky voice makes him reconsider. 
Hello? Chapter 10 Jezebel Nothing. No sound, no movement. After hearing a metallic clang followed by a thud, everything had been still for quite some time. Until now. The shadow of the burly man crosses past a window. It's the same window on the main floor that she recognized Dr. Grimm in earlier. The burly man seems to pick something, or someone, up, and then walks back out of sight. Claire's brow crinkles in confusion as she wonders what is going on within this mysterious house. She waits, but after another long stretch of time with no activity, Claire's patience officially depletes and she steps out of the bushes. She approaches the walkway with caution and realizes that she likely has the appearance of Dr. Grimm and the unfamiliar man as they approach the house before her. Once on the porch of the house, she approaches the door, stops, and listens. Nothing. She presses her ear against the door. Nothing. Claire takes in a nervous breath, turns the doorknob, and gently pushes the door open. The front room of the house appears undisturbed. The fancy decor is proper for this house, but the dim lighting in the room coupled with the shadow of night gives it an eerie feeling. Claire steps in and slowly shuts the door behind her. Ahead, she can see a staircase. Past that appears to be a kitchen area. She stands still and listens attently and hears the creak of weight shifting in a room ahead. Hello? There is a long moment of silence and Claire cautiously begins to advance further into the house, but startles to a stop when a burly man with white hair steps out of the room across from the staircase. He seems cheerful as he speaks. Well, hello. Welcome to my home. Please come in and meet my family. The man steps back and motions to the room from which he came. Claire carefully progresses forward toward the smiling man. He is beaming with pride as he presents whatever lies within the room. Claire cranes her neck as she reaches the room and then freezes in terror. Blood runs from her face as she sees the ghastly sight of corpses positioned around the dining room table. She gasps as she recognizes Franklin Grimm, and she lets out a scream when she sees Ski Mask positioned next to him. Ski Mask! She bolts to Ski Mask's side and looks into his dead eyes as Bromley enters the room behind her. Aren't they perfect? The perfect family. Claire looks up at John Bromley, whose jovial appearance has quickly transformed into one of befuddlement. What's that, Melissa? Claire notices that Bromley's eyes are focused past her. She follows his gaze to the dead woman at the other side of the table, and then back at Bromley. She listens to his one-sided conversation with the corpse. No, Melissa. I don't know who she is. Bromley's eyes shift down to Claire and cloud with confusion as he looks back at Melissa's corpse. My mistress? No, Melissa. She's not my mistress. I would never betray you. Concern wells within Claire. The large man is blocking the room's entrance. Getting around him into the front door will likely be a daunting task. As she tries to concoct a plan to get out of the house, Claire notices a rage beginning to swirl within the husky man's eyes as his gaze locks onto her. I know who you are. You're a Jezebel. You have come here to seduce me. You want to ruin my perfect family. Bromley darts forward. Claire attempts to escape his grasp, but he's too fast as he clutches her by the arms and hurls her out of the room like a rag doll. Claire lets out a cry of pain as her back lands against the lower steps of the staircase. She shifts her weight forward and begins to crawl rapidly toward the front door, but Bromley grabs her by the hair, pulls her back to him, and throws her again, this time into the main room. Claire lands on the end table. It shatters, but not from her light weight, but rather from the force of the throw. Shards of wood scrape against Claire's forehead, causing a stream of blood to flow down the side of her face. 
You're a home wrecker. You want to destroy my family. I will never let that happen. Never. Determination washes over John Bromley's face as he advances on Claire and scowls as he bends down and reaches for her throat. Claire regains her composure enough to cock her leg back and thrust it forward with all of her might into his knee. The force of the blow doesn't have much effect on the massive Bromley, but it slows him down just enough for Claire to scramble away from him and get close to the front door. Jezebel! Lying on her back, Claire watches on as John Bromley rushes toward her with his gargantuan hands outstretched. If he gets them around her petite throat, he'll snap her neck like a dead twig. You will not destroy my perfect family. Claire cannot escape. This much is clear. Bromley is upon her. The end is near. The only thing she could do is reach up and turn the doorknob. The door bursts open and John Bromley rises in shock as the gigantic St. Bernard bursts through the door and launches herself into him. He falls backward and grabs hold of her furry head with his hands to keep her off, but she has already latched her enormous jaws around his throat and is shaking him vigorously. A symphony of barks and howls echo throughout the house as the other six dogs barrel past Claire and assist Madeline. Slick and Trip grip onto Bromley's wrists as Dempsey and Floppy attack his legs. Max stops short of the fracas and barks on in support as Snowman cuddles up against Claire. Bromley attempts to kick and fight, but the frenzied attack of the dogs is far too much. A blur of snapping jaws tears chunks of his flesh from his arms and legs. His boisterous screams of pain are silenced as Madeline shakes her huge head, ripping John Bromley's throat out. Chapter 11 Moonlight Claire, what is she doing here? Ski Mask tightens his grip on the handrail. He wants to hang on long enough to understand what is happening. Ski Mask! She runs to Ski Mask's side and looks into his eyes. She is clearly distraught at the sight of his dead body. But why? If she was in cahoots with Platinum, why should she care? Alfred Grimm had made a point to suggest that he didn't think Claire was teamed up with Platinum, but Ski Mask was in too much of a furious mode to accept that. Perhaps Alfred was right. From the caring expression on Claire's face, it is him that she came here for. And she must have gone to great lengths to find him. Is it possible all wasn't as it seemed? At this point, it doesn't appear to matter. John Bromley is becoming enraged and means to harm Claire. To kill her. Poor Claire doesn't stand a chance. Ski Mask tightens his grip on the handrail and begins pulling himself closer to the eyes of the death room. He cries out when Bromley tosses Claire across the room like a child's toy. But within the death room, Ski Mask is the only one who can hear his own anguish. They are out of his sight now, and at this point, Ski Mask just hopes that Bromley doesn't make Claire suffer. Doesn't make Claire suffer? He had thought of nothing else the past several days, but now realizes that that is not what he wants. Not at John Bromley's hands. Not at his hands. If only he could be revived this one last time, he'd rectify the situation by ripping John Bromley's throat out. His thoughts of despair turn to hope when he hears the unmistakable bark. <coughs> Madeline. And she isn't alone. He can hear the entire pack of dogs going to work on John Bromley. Ski Mask doesn't need to see what is happening. John Bromley's pain-wrenching screams paint that picture quite beautifully. After John Bromley's screaming stops, the sound of the ravaging dogs dissipates and the clicking of their paws on the floor grows closer until Ski Mask can see Madeline enter the dining room. She stops and cocks her head at the grisly sight of her dead master. After a few seconds, she advances towards Ski Mask, jumps up on him, and proceeds to lick him energetically. Come here, Madeline. 
Madeline gives Ski Mask one last lick and then retreats behind Claire. Claire. She stands at the entrance of the dining room with all seven dogs behind her. Ski Mask's hands have gone numb. He should be sliding toward the light, but he's not. Every ounce of energy he has left is going toward maintaining his grip. There's no way he's letting go until he hears what Claire has to say. Claire steps up to Ski Mask's body. She takes his face into her hands, stares into his lifeless eyes, and speaks to him sincerely. I hired Platinum to follow you because I wanted to know what you did. It was stupid. The reason I wanted to know what you did wasn't just dumb curiosity. It was also because I was starting to worry about you. I care about you. I should have just asked you, but I didn't. Instead, I made a mistake that almost cost all of us everything. I'll regret that for the rest of my life, no matter how long or short it is. I had no idea she was crazy. I tried to stop her from killing you, but I was too late. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I would never do anything like that again. You can trust me. You can fully trust me with anything, with everything. I promise. I promise you that I am the person you thought I was. Claire removes a revival device from her pocket and holds it up. I'm going to revive you now. You can kill me if you want to, but I want you to know one thing before you do. A tear runs down her cheek before she says her next words. I love you. Claire activates the device and places it at the base of Ski Mask's skull. She watches as his dead eyes gradually fill with life. Ski Mask emits a gasp as his lungs fill with oxygen and he lets out a hacking cough. Finally, his breathing becomes steady. He stares intensely at Claire. Her heart rate accelerates and her breath becomes choppy as she awaits her fate. Finally, Ski Mask blinks and then reaches his hand out and wipes the tears and blood from her cheek. You brought the dogs. Claire smiles. Honestly, I thought if I had them with me, you'd be less likely to kill me. Ski Mask grins and then gingerly stands from the chair. The dogs surround him. Their tails blur with wagging action as Ski Mask bends down and begins hugging and petting them. As Ski Mask reunites with his dogs, he watches as Claire moves to Franklin Grimm and places the revival device to the base of his skull. She waits a good amount of time before looking at Ski Mask and shaking her head. Ski Mask nods with understanding. I can't say I'm surprised. He killed Alfred. Ski Mask lets out a disappointed breath. That's too bad. Alfred was one of the few people in this world I liked. Ski Mask stands and walks to the living room. He pauses briefly to look at John Bromley's mangled body, which is unrecognizable. He then walks through the front door, onto the porch, sits down, and stares out at the moonlit sky. Claire steps out and sits next to him. She takes his hand into hers and gives it a light squeeze. She caresses it with her thumb and looks up at him lovingly. Ski Mask looks at her hauntingly beautiful eyes and the moonlight reflecting off of her raven hair. Her pale complexion amplifies the rest of her features, which are perfect. She's perfect in every way. Claire's face cracks into a giant smile when she feels Ski Mask's hand gently squeeze hers back. She leans over and lays her head on his shoulder as they both look out into the night. Ski Mask? Yeah? Don't you think it's weird that everyone calls you Ski Mask? Ski Mask shrugs. Not really. It's just a nickname. Claire is quiet for a bit and then speaks. I like it. They stare off into the moonlit night for a few more moments with all seven dogs nuzzled up against them. Finally, Ski Mask turns, 
looks into Claire's eyes, and he smiles. Let's go home. The End